Hey, hey, what's happening, everybody? Sorry about the stress. We had some audio issues at the, the uh, outset of trying to get things sorted out, and it was on my end again. I have weird ports in the back of my uh, laptop that keep uh, screwing me up. So uh, we're running a little bit late, but we're going to get into it here now. And I appreciate those of you that are here. Uh, welcome to Gas Mass and Hand Grenades. I am Jeff. And you guys know that I kind of tend to use the terms legend and legendary far too often when I write up these interview announcements or on my intros for Instagram and things of that nature for my guests. And, you know, to some point, it's an easy and kind of cheap way to hype a band or a guest. However, no hype here at all. When I use the terms legend and legendary, this guy and this band are legends and fucking legendary. It's that simple. Um, of course, I'm speaking, and they're 100% accurate. I'm speaking of Luke LeMay and his band Gorguts. These two names are synonymous with greatness in death metal music, period, full stop. Since 1989, he and his band, while not exceptionally prolific, have written and released five albums and one EP of often genre-defying or, at minimum, goalpost-moving death and technical metal music that has been exceptional in quality as well as highly influential. Last month, the behemoth that is Gorguts reared its dark tendrils from a long hibernation and played a skull-crushing set of considered dead and obscure songs at the Decibel Fest down in Philadelphia. How do I know that? Well, it was all over the internet, number one. But number two, this kid was there. I was there. And I got to fucking feel it, like right here in my skull. And it was awesome. It was so good to see Luke and the guys back. Of course... If you follow me a little bit, you know that Kevin and I have done a, an interview and we've done a Fates Warning deep dive and we're going to be doing a death deep dive that I'm going to plead with uh, Mr. LeMay to join us for, but he's probably too busy for that. But here's the deal. This guy is the real fucking deal. They are back. Let's hope that's not a one-off show. I'm hearing it's not. I'm hearing there's more. So we're going to get into it. Let's get Luke in here to enlighten us on the, on the Gorguts history and mythos. And by the way, did I happen to mention he's seriously one of the nicest dudes in metal? Because he really is. Seriously, no joke. Here he is, Luke LeMay. Hey, Jeff. Sir, sir, so good to have you. Oh. We, had some, we had some initial stress. My my, you know, my nerves are like this. My blood pressure is probably about 200 over 200. But uh, <laughs> thank you, first of all, for joining me so much. And, Thanks for having um, me. It's just so awesome to have you here. I'm so psyched about this. Listen. Before we get super into this, I got to tell this story, okay? I have to tell the story the first time that I met you because I decided to play a slight little trick. So I, I you were out on the Pleiades Dust Tour. Uh, you played a little club called Club Metro in Baltimore. It was packed. It was July. It was sweltering hot in there. And you, unlike a lot of bands, you travel pretty lean. You guys generally are your own roadies and... You generally, you are the merch guy, okay? And so I was over looking at merch with my kid, and we're looking at shirts, and I happened to wear a Porcupine Tree Signify shirt for the express purpose of showing off to you, because I'm a huge Porcupine Tree fan. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and everybody knows that that knows my channel. But what I decided to do is I, of course, knew who you were. But when you came up behind the the the, the, uh, the merch table, I'm like, you said, hey, great shirt, great band. And I'm like, yeah, I wore this for Luke. Is he here? And you looked at me for a second and like, the fuck is wrong with this guy? Like, and you go, it's me. Now I'm going to do your little bit of French Canadian here. I'll, I'll, I'm going to try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is me. It, it is I. I am Luke. And I'm like. No, 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 no. I'm looking for Luke LeMay, the, the main guy in Gorguts. And you're like, you just seriously looked at me like, this guy's mental as fuck right here. There's something wrong with this guy, right? And I and and, I'm, and you're like, no, I am Luke LeMay. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm just kidding, man. <laughs> and you cracked up and we had a good laugh but, about it and we got some But pictures. that's all good. I'm all about dry humor. Uh, I kind I kind of like this, you know. It's like I was with Kev in a, in a coffee shop once and there's this new girl working there, kind of kind of young, maybe 16, 17. And uh I asked her to 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 pour a, a glass of hot water for tea. And I'm like, dude, the, the glass is fucking burning. 
and steaming like fucking. I'm like, sorry, miss. Uh, can you put down the microwave for me? And she's kind of looking at me <laughs> like the fuck. So I kind of like this. No worries. Yeah, yeah. So that was how you and I first met on the, the that tour. And what was really cool about that tour is, too, you had the band Exist open for you, which has Max from yeah. Death to All, and yeah. he's in Cynic as well. Great guy. He oh, yeah. him back in February. And before I get off of that, I have to do two quick things. Number one, I was talking to an old buddy of yours, Mr. Kelly Schaefer from Atheist, and he oh. said, make sure you tell Luke I said hello, man. Oh. They're coming to Montreal. I know you're not super near Montreal. but no, I'm like two there. hours away. Yeah, they're coming July 7th up oh. there. And July 9th, they're coming to Baltimore. I'm hoping I'm going to be able to make that because Kelly's just the greatest guy. What yeah, we did our first tour together in 92. We're going to talk about that. So. Yeah. First of all, how are you doing, and how's the weather up there? I mean, is it getting warm for you? Because it's got, got oh, warm from here. This week has been amazing, beautiful, way warmer. We're kind of behind schedule, you know, for weather. Uh, me, I'm in the middle of the, uh, of the country here. I'm on the farmland. I'm at one of my buddy's place. Very good friend. And uh, we started working outside. I mean, this is spring duties here. Uh, first thing first, we work at the sawmill. There's many trees fell in the forest during winter. So I give my buddy a hand and I really enjoy, you know, it's good time working at the sawmill. So we, we cut a lot of lumber, you know, cause he's going to build a new deck for the lake here. So we're doing that. And, uh, now I'm helping him, uh, tomorrow we are going to plant all the seeds. He's got many acres of fields for soya and stuff like that. Soy, soy, soya. I don't know what you call uh, it. Anyway. Soy, right, right. Yeah, yeah soy. So, so I'm going to help. I, I kind of like the farming uh, life here. He used to have a, a lot of cows as well. So for a, a good summer, they were kind of exhausted with all the work, you know. So I kind of gave them a, da a hand for, uh, for chores. He's like, dude, if you can kind of help us like a day or two a week just to give uh, 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 food, you know, on lunchtime. And first thing, first thing first, I was like, I was there every day with my farming suit, you know, taking care of cows and feeding them with, with the hay and everything. I really like this. He's very generous with me. So I, I, I happened to make my music studio. I wrote Pleiades here in the middle of the country, you know. I'm like a good mile away from the root. I was going to ask, do you, do you mind saying roughly where you're at? Are you, you say Oh, it's in, it's in Melbourne, Quebec. So you're west or east or north? Or? Uh, I'm very close to. I'm like 45 minutes from uh, Vermont border. Oh, okay. So okay. it's pretty south. So you're south of Montreal, yeah. southwest of Montreal. Yeah, I guess, right? exactly. Uh, south uh, east. Southeast. Okay. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. 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 Nice. So nice. Yeah, they, they call beautiful, it beautiful country up there. I've never been into Canada there. Yeah. Actually, I've only been into Canada once at Montreal uh, at. Um, Niagara, of course, but yeah, yeah, yeah. my ex-wife's uh, sister has a place in Lake Winnip Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire, New Hampshire. So beautiful, beautiful around the White Mountains and all that stuff. Ah, uh, so so here, I, I, I mean, we have the Appalachian pretty close. Uh, I mean, middle of the country. I mean, they call it the Eastern Townships here. So it's really New England kind of look. You know, you go to Maine or you're in Quebec, it's pretty. The same rural uh, uh, country life, so to speak. It, it really looks alike, you know, so to give you an idea. I'm going to real quick say hi to a couple of my cool people that are in here. Nate's here. Uh, Phil's here. We got um, Cosmic Paul Bear. God damn it. I'm Ryan, is it? Ryan? I, I probably screwed that up. I'm sorry, man. We got um, Psychic Vacuum, my buddy Eric. And, and I'm going to bring up Eric in a few minutes because I'm going to show you something really cool that he did for me. And it ties in with you and canadian guitar players and oh, my yeah. love for canadian guitar players uh we've got uh yeah so tim hey tim so listen let's kind of get into this here and the way i kind of want to do it and, and I, don't, I don't want to mirror the cali death pod guys they did a great job with you they did a fantastic job um but i do have some similar questions so i apologize if you're kind of regurgitating some of the no, old no worry history. that but that's what interviews are, are yeah. for i mean uh, let's say when we release a new album and i get many interviews you ended up there's some copy paste in there but the story of the band is the story of the band yes. i'm not going to tell a different story and that's also. where we want to go so exactly before we get to the story of the band though i want to get the story of luke lemay so 
that story I want to hear about. Tell me about your first memories of music and how that early exposure kind of affected you. And do you have any like special memories? Like for me, Luke, as I said, I'm how old are you? 51, 50, 51. Okay. So I'm 57. I just turned 57. And I very much have very significant memories of my mom playing things like Simon and Garfunkel bridge over a troubled water and Carol King tapestry and James Taylor and Brahm, uh, not Brahms, uh, Beethoven's fifth symphony that dun, 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 dun. You know, I just remember those things as a very little kid and they were very formative. I just felt the power of music. So I kind of want to hear you talk about what you remember and what hits you not necessarily. And then as you go, Maybe give me your more formative stuff that gets you to your teen years and your your metal and, and the heavier stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Me, the, the first music memories in the house, in the family house, I, uh, I mean, dad, uh, my dad, uh, big country music fan. But not because you have here in Quebec, we're, you know, as you know, we're French speaking Canadian. So you have like this Western country scene, but French singing. You, you never really like this. And me growing older never liked that so country music was the very first music i was exposed to uh, as a very young kid i mean great uh, grade school here you know uh anyway so uh remember uh buscar willie will a lot of willie nelson johnny cash elvis yeah. no beatles in the house it wasn't a beatles house okay it was more you know uh american country music uh uh, Ricky Skaggs. So you see this, it's like 70s, 80s generation uh, of yeah. uh, Western singer. And uh, pretty much every Sunday, my dad would take his, uh, like, a, like a milk crate or box or whatever of music uh, books, music sheets. He didn't really knew how to read music, but he played guitar, acoustic guitar, and he sang, you know, those you know, uh, yeah, Willie Nelson songs and uh, Johnny Cash's song and uh, Buscar Willie's song. I remember he had this eight-track cassette player in his pickup truck, and we had this Buscar Willie uh, uh, album. You know that we would play a lot when we yeah. we head to the, the 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 country house or whatever. So anyway, so uh, pretty much every Sunday, my dad uh, would, would uh, relax and take out the music sheets. And you know those kind of sheet that you have the melody lines, pretty much like a, like a jazz lead sheet. You have the melodies, and you have all those chords yep. shapes there. The chords, yeah. So he, he, yeah, he was he was more of the chord guy, you know, looking at at this little yeah, you got the little, little the little bars they tell you exactly a G a little box there with dots. So we so we would learn the song this way. So it was my first, let's say. Uh, uh, can I say exposition or uh, 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 my composition? And uh, no, my first encounter. Oh, wait, the, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I got so, you. So, so uh, with uh, so it was country music. My mom was more about uh, 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 French. Uh, how can I say that? Because uh, 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 we have an ex uh, we have a way of saying chanson française. She was more into uh, French singing artists, but French from from France, oh, you know. So yeah. we had those two. Uh, so so in the vinyl, so the, the like little Serge Gainsbourg and Gainsbourg and yeah, yeah exactly those uh, those those type of singers. Gotcha. And uh, so the very little vinyl collection that we would have in the house would be French singing artists and country music. So these were the the two, and then uh, grade four, five, no, grade the uh, grade two. Started playing acoustic guitar, jamming with dad, and I remember did my first solo concert playing like a song like I think it was Abilene or something like little country song, at my grade school. It like let's say we had like a Christmas show or something. So play the little song there. So it was kind of like the stage thing, you know, where I was really, wow. really gave me a uh, good confidence. And, uh, and then grade, I remember grade five, because we have a different way of, of, of counting grades in Quebec uh, and England. I was, so, was going to say, because second grade, you're probably only about 
seven, eight years. Yeah, old. I was about seven. So okay. let's say, let's say uh, the fifth year of grade school. So would you call it junior high or grade, junior high? How is the yeah. way? Junior high for us usually starts at six, seven, and eight. Okay, so, so it's six, before the year sixth grade. Six, you're probably twelve or third. So, so Jeff, it would be the year before junior high. Okay, fifth grade. So, yeah, fifth grade. Right. So I remember uh, we had uh, we had uh, an, uh, a kind of uh, activity to do uh, with the class. We went to the the Helder home. Can we call that like this? The local Helder home where, El oh, where Elder home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Like a yeah. care facility for older care people. facility exactly yeah. where you had older people. And I brought my guitar nice. and I perform maybe two, three songs from uh, Felix Leclerc, which was a Quebec, but like a French singing poet, you know, very, very important in the Quebec culture, a uh, poet and, uh, and, 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 and songwriter. So I performed two or three songs uh, from by him at the, L, uh, at the, at the care facility. What and those elder, what was the name those, again of him? I'm sorry. What was his name again? Uh, Felix, Felix, Felix Leclerc, 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 Leclerc okay. like the creator bass player. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah no, that's not one I'm familiar with. Strangely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but it's very, very common to Quebec. You know, right. he, he he had a, a short career in France, I think. But I'm not much. I don't want to. I don't want to say things that I'm not sure. You know about his career or whatever. But we had a vinyl of his work home and uh and i picked up the song by ear and i transcribed the lyrics because I, I could get every word he was saying anyway so it was uh it was one like a second time that i would perform in front of an audience so to speak and i was really really confident about doing this and it was a uh, so that was this and maybe sixth grade four five sixth grade starting taking a piano lesson in the next town let's say 10 minutes driving from where i grew up because i grew up in danville very small okay. uh, a lot of big english community there uh very victorian houses to uh three thousand people uh community very small town you know? right so, so very rural very very small. very yeah exactly so that's where i grew up i'm still in the area i'm like uh, 15 minutes away now you came back in the area where i grew up so during those years, so I started to go next town, which was called asbestos back in the days, because there was like one of the biggest asbestos mine. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was called asbestos. And my piano teacher, which who was a German lady called Mrs. Uh, Lazda. And dude, I loved going there. There was a lot of Baroque flutes on the walls. She was from Germany and she knew her, her fucking shit, you know, all about Bach and all those Baroque music. She had a very tiny harpsichord. And I remember being more fascinated oh, wow. about seeing the little instrument all made yeah. by wood and those clinky sound oh, more than sound. doing my actual fucking piano lesson, you know. <laughs> nice, nice. I'm reminded, so, of, I'm reminded of a porcupine tree song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so she was a very important person, you know, for my music culture, Great. teaching me how to read music and, but I, I kind of already knew how to read music, but I was kind of cheating a lot. I was kind of too lazy yeah. to do the actual thing, but I, I would the understand sight the sight reading you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was for the piano thing. Yeah. Not on the, mm -hmm. never learned my notes on guitar. I never learned. I, I never did either. It's hard as fuck. I can't no, but me, my point, I, I can tell later when I wrote uh, when I wrote uh, music for Gorguts, just just to do little parentheses here, it's because I don't want to be bothered to do uh, theory, the or, theory or or academic yeah. relation yeah. within my train of thought when I write music. I like sound for the sake of sound for what it is. Linear, linear. I don't want. I gotta do. I don't want to connect any dots. Oh, this is F sharp here. I, I don't care. Yes, I got you. When I write riffs, I couldn't care less. Yeah. When I write chamber music, it's a different story, you know? But that's two different train of thoughts. Two different how, worlds, how, really. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So so anyway, so took piano lesson with Mrs. Lazda for a couple years. 
and then uh, started the first year of high school during the the fall semester i kept the piano lesson because i was going to high school in the same town same city in asbestos and then kind of quit the, the piano thing there but uh but all the the learning thing kind of kind of stayed with me you know i kind of i didn't it's not because i quit the lesson that i for, forgot everything that i learned from her you know but right. uh but it, it was very inspirational inspirational to go there like i said i i always like those uh, ancient uh, baroque music instrument even today you know like how a, long how long did you continue with piano lessons and you're now you're you're not only just doing piano but you're still playing around the guitar quite a bit i would assume right yeah but i play guitar for the band but me when I don't have anything to write, I'm not like Kev. No, no, no. I mean, Luke, I mean, like when you're doing the piano lessons as a young person. Oh, okay, you're okay. Kind of doing dual, you're doing dual duty here. You're you're working on I, both of them. That's a good question. I don't recall kept playing guitar back then while okay. I was playing the piano. I kind of, nah. but, but we had guitars in the house, you know? Yeah. So I kind of went back to guitar more when i decided that i wanted to play death metal i didn't even have a, an electric guitar when i started i i was using my dad's ovation guitar and i now, was, real quick now so the timeline here a little bit you're in the middle school age when you start doing early middle school or late late elementary school you're doing the piano lesson thing right yeah but you, you but guitar was the first thing you picked up yes okay so yes. you put the guitar down you start doing the piano. How long are you doing the piano lessons? How long are you getting serious about piano? Yeah, piano was about uh, not too long, maybe grade uh, five, six, seven. But seven for us is first year of high school. Okay. So my first year of high school, it was about like a three year ish. Oh, that's thing. pretty. That's a pretty extensive time to be doing that. Most people when they do piano lessons they're out after the first two or three months you know what i mean no uh, like, yeah you know, yeah no no me i really enjoyed it because i i you know i really like going there she she would educate me for like mozart music and all this so it she really she really opened my mind to get curious about this type of of art right so when when i got to grade uh, second grade of high school uh no first thing first but i'll get to second grade of high school but but I, i'm still into the music important moment here mm -hmm. just so we don't run away uh i had a cousin that lived like one street down from uh where i grew up in in denville he was older than me uh let's say uh three three years four years and I would hang out every now and then to his place because he had like those planes and I was really uh, passionate about planes. I would build pl miniature planes all the time, you know, anyway, models, that's, yeah, that's, models, right, that, right. that's my love for tools, which came back with the workshop today. But that's, I was already drawing a lot, building things. I was really artistic uh, with my hands as well. I always drew, even before going to school, I was drawing all the time. Okay. so i got pretty good at drawing doing portraits and cartoon of people you know wow so so that's why i kind i drew my my own logo you know people would make fun of me in high school they say man he's drawing all those demo covers and he doesn't have a band who's <laughs> laughing now and they were kind of say they would kind of find find it silly and it's like yeah right you know oh, dude we do that's what we did i i'm glad you brought that up because that that that's funny ninth grade which should be your seventh right is that what you're saying first first year of high school okay first year of high school is seven for us yeah for us it's nine so i can tell you right now dude i had a band name didn't have a band but i had a band name Same it, was here. Called, it was called sorcerer's song i can see the logo i had the big fancy s's it was all influenced by rush and kiss and Me? you know ufo and thin lizzie and all that yeah shit. yeah, yeah. And, and in my fantasy world, when I would pick up my Stella acoustic back then, I had a Stella, I would stand there in the mirror, man, and I would be fucking jamming, kiss, you know, Love Gun and, you know, Rush, Farewell to Kings. And, you know, so we 
We're right here. We got it. We got exactly. It. Me, me. I remember uh, drawing this this demo cover. It was called Pentagram. So you had the, got it. Did had to have the inverted cross there with the fire. Like I didn't possession. Get there. I wasn't in the uh, I wasn't in the satanic stuff until far later. But I yeah. get where you're coming from. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, so co coming back to my cousin when I, I would visit him, you know, I would hang out there uh, pretty often, and going back to a musical moment. He honed uh, a 45 RPM. Uh, how do you call that? It's like a small vinyl. How do you call those in English? Is it a 45? It's like a, a 45. Yeah, the 45. Yeah, yeah. A smaller one. Something like this. There you go. This is a blast from the past. Exactly. One of my, one of my very first 45s I ever bought. I bought that. Exactly. And check this out, Luke. Check this out. Closer to the heart. My first wow. single from 1977. First 45 I bought was a uh, uh, Village People one and the Kiss one. The uh, YMCA? The YMCA, and I had the Kiss I Was Made For Loving You on 45. Oh, fuck, yes, yes. Now we're first talking. Tour I, first show I ever saw was Kiss That Tour for uh, yeah. Dynasty. Yeah. So I, I don't want to I don't because I don't want to spread out too far for now. But anyway, go ahead, go ahead. So, you're, you're at your cousin's. Yeah, yeah. And he had this 45 of iron maiden which is a kind of rare thing you see heady with you know the devil on number of the beast is mm -hmm. and kind of cartoon he, no 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 it's a painting like the album cover and, oh. and, he's, and he hold and you have heady holding the devil's head in his hand yes yep and yep. i think there was oh no that's made in japan so he had this and he had made in japan and he gave me those vinyl and dude the Made in Japan with Diano running free. I was, you know, with the drum fills, I was spinning that record all the... That's oh, an yeah, EP, yeah, is yeah. that right? Yeah. 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 That so was, uh, I was, yeah, I guess that was an EP, I think. Yeah. Made in Japan is, is a live EP or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, so I would listen to that all the time. And that little, I think it was Number of the Beast, one track 45 or something. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. So that had an influence for the imagery of metal. And and then when I got to grade six, it was Van Halen, uh, 1984. Would, would play that all the time, yeah. all the time. Yeah. So yeah. those were very important records, you know. So those were the kind of the, the gateway drugs into the heavier stuff for you. Exactly. Because... I was still in grade school with those records. Right. So all the, the, the my myself and my buddies, uh, we, we, we would move, we would travel to asbestos to go to, to high school. Right. And then we got to meet new uh, youngsters our age. And one of them, uh, he was a, a fucking metalhead. He had, he already had a band with his brother. So he had a huge influence on me by meeting this guy. He was drawing a lot as well. So we connected with the drawing thing. We would draw, we would draw Power Slave. We would draw, we would draw band logo all the time. All right. the time. Right. And he was playing electric guitar, and his 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 brother was playing bass. And I would visit him hitchhiking to his house on the weekends, and they would they would play Seek and Destroy blah 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 so and and dude i was like man i want a band too i really want a band but now are you back to the guitar yet or that's coming no but so that that's what got that's me the, back the trigger so yeah so my dad had his ovation but i wasn't already playing i never played metallica song and i i don't recall learning any metallica song i remember learning uh uh uh, uh sod uh march of the sod yeah, but in third year of high school, that's when I bought my electric guitar. Okay, and that was because uh, of the 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 Scream Bloody Gore and Possessed Seven Churches. So, but just We're before that, 1987, 80. Yeah, what, what year? What year is uh, Seven Churches? Is it eighty five? Eighty five. But so around eighty five. Totally possessed fan. I even made the logo big in my room with red cardboard and black cardboard all cut out, you know. Yeah. 
on my uh, bedroom wall. It was like, dude, listening to cr Pleasure to Kill, Creator, yep. Destruction, Eternal Devastation. Yep, yep. So, I mean, there was no going back to Van Halen and all that stuff. Yeah, let me ask so you that. So, do you have a local? You're living kind of rurally. Do you have a? Do you have any kind of access to a good record shop back then? There was, there was one, only one independent record store guy in Sherbrooke, which was about thirty minutes from here. Okay, but man, the record weren't cheap. He had imports. Imports, yeah. I remember buying uh, Schizophrenia from Sepultura there, which happened to be a bootleg years after. <laughs> of but anyway, so so it was the only shop. Other other than that, there was this 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 uh, shop called uh, uh, Rock en Stock, which was in Montreal. And then I remember ordering uh, Bloodfire Dead from Battery there. So it was something you get your box from Rock and Stock in the mail. So it was like, man, ordering vinyl from there. So I had Battery from there. I had Death Leprosy from that place. Or I would even hitchhike to Montreal and go to the actual store and, and, and buy my shit there, you know. Were, but, you, but, were you working in high school? Like were you working a part time job? Yeah, or? my mom had a, a little restaurant, like summer. Mm -hmm. summer uh, like burger stand like french fries and stuff okay, yeah yeah she had that for 20 something years here in richmond where i live now okay where i relocated after the montreal years and stuff kind of came back in the area but not the same city where i grew up but it's like 10 15 minutes away so did they help you buy your guitar or did you buy the guitar or? no 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 so the thing is uh summertime i would work at my mom's restaurant uh -huh. you know cooking same. and ice cream and, and also the thing is, is that I got to know all the community here when I was a young teenager. So when I moved back here 20, 15, uh, 15 years later, I kind of knew everybody. Oh, but everybody right, right, right. Older, yeah, yeah. You know? like so I was kind of part yeah. of, 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 of the community because of the restaurant thing, you know? That's nice. That's that kind of yeah. kind of like cheers. Everybody knows your name, right? Yeah. Exactly. So and it's like three thousand people here. Everybody knows everybody. You know, it's uh I wanna say hi to my buddy here, Rick. He's the guy that was at uh remember I was at, you probably don't remember, but I was with two people at uh, yeah, the right. show. One was my daughter, the long blonde haired one with the mask on. Rick okay. was the other guy that, that uh I was with and we you know we we were he was watching me headbang to to your set and he, he was like man dude he's like I, I can't believe you're 57 you were like a 20 you were like a 18 year old in there man now i wasn't in the pit i don't do that i can't do that but you see I, jeff that's what music's all about and yeah, me i'm man. 51 and i'm on stage and I, i'm having a great time like at fucking 18. listen we'll, we'll get to that but i gotta tell you one of the coolest moments of that show was just seeing how genuinely happy you were to be up there. Oh, man. And you were so grateful to that crowd. You were so grateful for, the, for that response and so happy to just bring that music to everybody. And you were like, man, you were like a kid in a candy store. I could just feel it. The whole day you were and so excited. You know? I even said it on stage. I mean, yeah. so fucking happy, you know? Yep. Why not say it? People, yeah. are, people are used to, to open their mouth to complain. But too happy, when you're happy, you don't have to say it. It's happy. That's right. You can but feel me, it. You can see it. It was so. Oh, man. And, and the funniest part of that whole thing was that when I saw you, you were talking to a guy, and I started to walk over, and I waited for that guy to leave. And you turned, and you looked at me, and I went, hey. And you went, hey. And I was like, in my mind, I'm going, how the fuck does he remember me from 2016? But no. you didn't. That's not how you knew me. You no, knew it's me. because with the Kevin interview, and I watched the, the Gorguts video that you yeah. did on all the records. So yes. that's, that, that's why. Uh, yeah, so it was funny. Then it clicked. I'm like, oh, he knows me from YouTube. And that was what was super cool. So, But anyways, we'll get to that because I do want to talk a little bit more about that. Let us let me ask you this. Um, so you play piano. You play guitar. If you're a guitarist, you can kind of mess around on the, the bass. I mean, it's pretty easy. Uh, not not to be a great bass player, but it's good. You can usually get, you can play the bass. You no, but the, I never played bass. No, oh, really? No, no, no. Wow. No. What about what about um, drums? Can you play drums? Well, a bit, but uh, I'm not. No. Yeah. 
I I have a hard time keeping a four four beat, man. My my feet and my hands don't like to do oh, the man. same thing. Dr drumming is such an impressive instrument. It really is. is. A great gonna, drummer perform. I mean, it's it's magic. Uh, we're gonna talk about that because you've had some fucking amazing drummers in your band. So, <laughs> um, how supportive are your parents now? You're getting to the end of high school. Did you have any bands in high school? No. I, I, I uh, like I was saying, I got I, I, I bought my first guitar in uh, grade uh, third year of high school. Let's say this way, it'll be easier to follow. Okay. Third year of high school. So, uh, and and again, it was because I heard Scribble de Gore, and when I heard that, I'm like, holy fucking, that's, that's what I wanted. That's where I'm going. I'm sorry? That's where I'm going. I heard what that's I where I'm doing. going. Yeah. And, and there's no uh, turning back. I mean, uh, why not? Yeah. And I, and I thought Chuck had a more, uh, uh, uh evil atm atmosphere in the sure. music and possessed because possessed still had that little not thrash i don't like to say this but they have they had those really evil moments but it was still in it's like you do a sculpture but it's not uh, all out already there's still rough rough pieces I, on it i love jeff i love jeff to death he's a great guy and he claims and he's probably right that chuck sure. says they were the first death metal band, but of I always course. look at Possessed as a thrash band with a death metal vocalist. That's how I always look at it. Jeff is the first one to have this this color, this tone. Yes. Yep. So to me, Chuck was like, dude, it's like Possessed, but there's like something more evil sounding. You know what I'm saying? Oh no, yeah, it's the zombie and, and, and no, the zombie ritual come to life. His voice was the zombie. And no disrespect to to Jeff. I mean, he was the, the, oh, the oh, I got you. Yeah, and and don't 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 get me wrong here. You know, I don't like. I mean, because listening to Seven Churches, like the Exorcist, listening to his voice, you're like it's not just listening to it. To me, with the headphones, it wasn't listening just to to a song. It's you're going somewhere to a place, to a place, a dark place. Exactly. So that's what I think real really attracted me with this music. So listening to Scream Bloody Gore, like Regurgitated Guts or Zombie Ritual, I was going to this place, but a couple level lower. Yeah. To, to the to the fort sub. Uh, caves there yeah, you so know what i'm you. saying yeah yep. and it was like wow so that's why to me i say that many many times in interview because of that place sonic place uh that uh, the death metal aesthetic can uh, create there's like four walls literally there you're somewhere it's not just a riff for a riff no it's somewhere. It's uh, it's the atmosphere. The exactly. Atmosphere so to me, that's why this. it's the sonic place that yes. you're actually in. You know. Yep. Completely. So that's why I, I I said that many many times in interview, and I'm so grateful that death metal was like. Of course, I like my master of puppet. I like my bounded by blood. Sure. No problem. This is awesome. Uh, destruction released from agony. Sure. Love this amazing record but this wow so I, again i said that in interviews many times i'm so grateful that i chose death metal because to me in extreme music and metal death metal is is one if not the type of metal which you can really create places with the riff and that's what i wanted to do with pleiades you're somewhere you're telling a story. It's yep. like it's to me. It's like classical music, but with distorted orchestration and uh, so. But that's a different topic. But but the best way to say it, you, you're you're somewhere. You're, you're you're opening a door and you're like, holy shit! What a yeah. What a place. This is yeah. Awesome. You're like, do I want to go in there or don't I? Oh yeah, yeah I want to go in there. I want to. But go in Scream there. Bloody Gore had that. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, so yeah. Well, let me ask you this. So you, um, you get a guitar. What was your first guitar in NAM? Do you remember? Again, I was playing on my dad's ovation and my dad had this little one speaker amp, and I got this little DOD red distortion. Dude, it sounded like shit. Uh-huh. And I remember my dad complaining. It's like he got he gets his ovation. He's like, Tabarnak, this is French swearing, you know. He's like, Tabarnak, won't you keep detuning my guitar? Because I was tuning it lower to get the death metal. Yeah sound there was you it, know this was an acoustic uh acoustic yeah yeah, yeah. it's an acoustic okay. ovation but it had yeah. a jack on it you know which you can plug it but but to yeah but to yeah it really looked like this this is my first guitar it's pretty beat the fuck up you can see it turn it's it this. around it's exactly it's the same thing my dad had something but it was all black on top there this is the thin body the first year of the thin bodies it came out in 89 i paid 900 bucks for this back then yeah yeah yeah. hey but this was this was the shit back then um the uh the what do they call this the pearlescent what do they call that thing um i forget the name of it somebody's gonna know nate will probably know but this thing just fell off it the glue finally came off but um you can see right here i got a nice big crack in the face of it because one day watching football it was laying on the bed my wife was work my ex-wife was working and my team was getting their ass kicked, and I thought I was hitting the back because you can <laughs> you can whack the back of these no problem, but it was laying upright and there was a cover on it, and I hit it, and right away I knew I was in trouble. So anyway, yeah, these are these are great guitars though, man. Yeah, but, dude, dude, so I remember you an electric. You said you got an electric. What was your electric then? But my electric was a, a not not a, it was called Vantage, V A N. Yes, I know those. Yeah. So, dude, I paid like Japanese, I think. Japanese, I paid like two, three hundred dollars, and it was uh, a bit like an iron bird, uh huh. You know, uh, uh, four uh, points there, yeah, four points, yep, yep, mm-hmm. beveled. And it was a uh, dude, and I was a big fan of uh, SUD and 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 uh, and uh, well, you know, uh, uh, anthrax, uh, among the living. Uh-huh. So, I kind of had to have the 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 army color there so it was it wasn't camouflage but it was a, like a all army green you know so oh that's the one <laughs> pretty ugly right <laughs> yeah yeah so that's the that's the first one i got you know you so. still have it no 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 long no, gone no. okay and what are you using for an amp at that point you're using your dad's amp yeah it was yeah but but uh, at the rehearsing play it took a while before i had a good amp it, 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 it but when i say a while it's a fucking long time it, it came even before it just before erosion but before that i always had like modified marshals or i wasn't too much of a gear geek i didn't right. know my shit or or my way around in gear which now i kind of really like i like to be on youtube and watch gear videos all the time you know so anyway uh, but it was really like uh, modified uh, marshals and uh, yeah stuff like that okay so you're you're um you get done high school you said you didn't really have a band in high school not really uh outside of high school then do you go to college or do you go to you went not right away you went no 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 no. went went, went to college after uh, no went to college in 95 but i but now we're in 88 and okay. the band is not together but that because i i stopped i i stopped school after uh, high school okay so check it out the thing i was telling you about this guy that i met that he had a band with his brother you know his name is frank so for the sake of the story uh, i'll be talking about frank here so frank finds these two guys in sherbrooke they're stefan and steve and they formed this trio and it's called uh, damaged they were playing thrash music and some creator like uh, waking up the gods and uh what else they weren't playing much metallica what, what else they would play chapel of ghouls they would play more thrash music more creator ish okay anyway. right anyway so german thrash german thrash that european thrash yeah exactly 
like extreme aggression songs or something like that. Anyway. Right. And they were a trio. And me just got my guitar, but but Frank was more into thrash music. He liked his destruction. He liked his Celtic Frost, but he wouldn't play these uh, in his band. And, and me, I was like, dude, can I join your band? I really want to play in a band. And he's like, well, you know, we're a trio, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, fuck off. I even at some point, I'm like the third wheel here. I'm the annoying guy, you know. I, I remember calling Stefan, the drummer. I said, Steph, I mean, I'm sure I can play your songs. I would really, really, really like to join. I know Frank. He's like, thanks, but no thanks. You know, we're... we're and I was kind of getting, yeah, he's he's the uh, fuck, he's uh, he's persistent, you know. I told him we're we're cool, three people, and yeah. but they they said no. But I would go to their show and blah blah blah, go to rehearsal, and uh, I was totally hyped up. So I found some guys, uh, uh, two Stefans, and we formed a band. We didn't have a name. We would play a few covers like Mandatory Suicide. So, but we didn't write any songs yet. But he wasn't, he wasn't as good as, as Stefan, the other, dr Frank's drummer. So Frank and Steve decide to go to Quebec City, summer 89, after high school. And Stefan, out of the blue, doesn't have a band anymore, the drummer. And he calls me. He calls the annoying guy. Hey, man, you really want to have a band now? I mean... <laughs> You're second, you wanna, you're sloppy you know, seconds, but come on in, right? Exactly. I mean, second choice, but yeah, we'll give it a shot. <laughs> and so this is the fan that plays on Erosion and uh, Consider Dead. Okay. Yeah. And and Steve, bass player that mm -hmm. left to Quebec City with Frank, he's the bass player that that I called to join the band later after Erosion, and we wrote Obscura and From Wisdom together. <laughs> Oh, how about that? So, okay. Exactly. So that's you can connect the dots now, you know. Well, who played we, with who and look, uh let's put the Gorgats together in a minute. I wanted to ask you a couple other quick things here. Um, so you kind of answered this. What musicians and artists really affected influenced you? Chuck was obviously a huge influence. Of course. Um, any any other big ones back then that like all those bands creator and Oh, I was big, big fan of a creator. I remember going to Montreal and seeing uh on the terrible certainty tour I, and i i i wasn't even uh, uh how can i say that your legal age is a uh, 21 for 21. Drinking. yeah how do you call that is it legal age legal, age. Was, legal age to drink yeah mm -hmm. exactly and me i wasn't uh, us it's 18 but i wasn't 18 yet and i was uh -huh. like you know cross my fingers i hope they're not gonna ask for ids and yeah, yeah, didn't yeah. ask for id because we didn't have those all all ages show yeah and dude, I remember going there, and I got to see Snake from Voivod that was there, and wow, you know, it was really. Uh, and dude, I'm like, terrible certainty. That's like '87 ish or something. Yes, yeah, 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 yep. Now, did you um, when you're you're going you're going to Montreal, so you're traveling over there. You're getting. I wasn't hiking there. Yeah, I hit hiked so much. I hit hiked for twenty years before having my first driving license oh my god luke that's so fucking scary man and that's in my 30s no wow. kidding dude funny thing they just released a book a comic uh -huh. book which is the biography of five quebec bands so you I have this fight i saw that it came out in like february right something like yeah. that yeah yeah so when i met the artist that was gonna draw the the gorgots uh story i said hey man I mean, we'll make your job easy. You have one drawing to do. Just draw me hitchhiking. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. You're, lu you're lucky you didn't end up on an episode of like, uh, you know, mysterious disappearances. No, no, or... but me, no, but it would be the other way around. It was mysterious disappearance, but for the driver, not for their hitchhiker. Oh, okay, you were you were the threat, I'm not the other way that. around. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so you get. Um, do you remember the first album that you actually bought with your own money, though? Oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Because I know mine. Mine was, I showed you the 45s. Mine was Kiss Alive. Oh. 
I remember, but these weren't uh, bands. Uh, it was soundtrack music. I was really into the Star Wars thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, I remember going on vacation with my parents on the summer, and I would I would mow lawns, and I would put my money aside, and I remember going to this shop and getting, getting uh, Empire Strikes Back. I really like John Williams, you know. And, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's a good question. What is the, the actual metal, first metal record that I bought? Maybe, maybe Seven Churches. Maybe. Okay. And cassette or album? Vinyl. Vinyl. Okay. Yeah. And do you prefer vinyl over CD or how, what do you prefer at this It point? depends. If I listen, uh, I, I mean, I have a, uh, uh, I mean, I have a big CD collection, but for some people, I have about a thousand CDs, you know, but for some people, it's nothing, a uh, thousand CDs. I have 4,000. Exactly. So, so, but yeah, I'm it, sick. It, but it's, 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 it's so sad, you know, that like the independent shops have closed and I would go to Montreal to buy all my classical music and that closed too. Yep. So it's very sad. I mean, we have. We have one vinyl guy that's been there forever, Stan Records downtown. And unfortunately, because of Discogs now, everything is jacked way out of price. I mean, the site, the prices are fucking obscene. They, you know, 10 years ago, you could go in and find, you you could find fucking metal CD or metal vinyl for three, four bucks a pop. Now you exactly. go in, everything's $25, $30. You're like, what exactly. the fuck? You know, it, it's wrong, but anyway, but, how about your but, first? Con how about your first concert and whatever it was? But 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 just just to listen okay. to answer your question, yeah yeah. If, if if I listen to classical music, I like CDs better for clarity and uh, and some of the work. I kind of like the old RCA recordings from the fifties or sixties. You know, mm -hmm. I kind of like this. Every now and then, but still on CD because most of my 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 classical music collection is 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 more uh, is all on CDs. I don't have okay. I don't have a big uh, vinyl collection. My vinyl collection was more importation. I would buy Peel Sessions in the early nineties. I had the Carcass one. Uh, you know, I would buy. I, I would I would order it directly from E Rake. You know, but we're talking early nineties here. Yeah, but, I have about. I don't know if you can see it here. Let me. My my room is a mess because I'm working on. Well, okay, see that right there? Yeah, that's about 300 CDs right there. Exactly. I'm working, I'm working on projects, but I have 32 boxes in different places because we had to move because of COVID. I take care of my 82 year old dad, and we don't have anywhere for me to put this crazy collection up. But you can see there on the ground, that's pretty much extent of my vinyl, and I got some vinyl box sets like Rush and Love yeah. Forever Changes and neurosis and stuff like that i'm not a big vinyl guy overall i like the format i like I, I think to me a record what a record is it's like a book to me it's not a kindle tablet a book is a book yes so to me a record like the let's say the actual support for the art is a fucking vinyl i mean a record it's it beautiful. is the only, pro the only two problems with it are one there's two problems with it one space you need a lot of space you need you, you have to have room for a big vinyl collection and the other major problem is you don't have the portability you can't just jump in the car exactly but again again but to me art for the sake of art and oh, what yeah. format you know i have i'm more like wow looking at the artwork you know and yes. it's it, and feeling it's like opening a book you know you walk in a in a, in a bookshop i in love the 70s and 80s bookshop. man it's like you just those gate folds were everything they were exactly. just like your whole world you escaped into but right? again but again i i speak like i have fucking twenty thousand vinyl like yeah, no, so but, do I, I. but i don't i don't no i word. did i had a lot and i sold all of it like an idiot man i oh i don't even want to talk about it but yeah let's get um so let's get into the so you're you're now you get with the two uh, there's um Sylvain and and Sylvain Sylvain is that his name Sylvain yeah Sylvain and then but but that but but before that we did the demo and it was Gary playing guitar okay so talk a little bit about all that how you come together with all so that. so Stefan give me a call say hey Frank and Steve just fucking left and uh, you know you want to get a band together. But I said, yeah, but I want to play more death metal. I said, yeah, sure. You know, I'm all about it. 
but he was a huge Voivod fan. You know, he's the one that really me uh, 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 for Voivod. I knew Killing Technology pretty good. It, it was my favorite one back in the days. But I remembered when we started playing together, he was spinning nothing face all the time, and I was like, nah. But I it love that. While, it took, don't, don't get me wrong. I love yeah. it now, but it, it took you. me a while. Yeah. I mean, it's like a book. You can read a book in your 20s and you're like, well, this is boring. You read it when you're 45 and you say it's masterpiece, you know? Yeah, it, I came it, into Voivod because of the Astronomy Dominate video on Yeah, YouTube. yeah, yeah. And I actually get this. Um, and this interview is about you, but I love talking about. Hold on one sec here. Oh, shit. Hold on, Luke. Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. Shit. Oh, stay there. My bad. My uh, laptop became disconnected and the battery's acting funny. You there? Sure. You there? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, boy, Bob, I hear the video for Astronomy Dominate, right? And strangely enough, no lie about this, about three weeks later, I, there's a club here in town where I live. Lancaster, Pennsylvania is close. I, I don't live in Lancaster now, but I live close. That's the biggest town. And... There's a club that used to be there. It closed down over COVID, but it was called uh, the Chameleon Club, right? A lot of bands would pass through there on the way to Philly or New York or, or Baltimore. Get this tour. Faith No More, before the real thing came out, like just before the real thing came out. Soundgarden, Loud Love, Loud yeah. Louder, or Loud Love. Voivod was headlining that of all crazy things with nothing face. So I go to the club and Snake and Piggy are walking around and they can't even, they can barely understand English at that point. They're like, you walk up to them and they're like, hey, they were, they were not, not, not speak English. You know, I, I can't do the French accent, but, um, and I meet Chris Cornell. I got, got to hang out with Cornell and Kim File and File poured a beer on me, but I actually got on stage. During, I was talking to Snake before he came out to talk to Bill Gould from Faith No More and they're talking and, he introduces me and I'm talking to Snake and I said, man, I love you guys. You guys are the best, you know, because you and I, we have that fanboy thing. We know what that's oh. like. Right? And I'm in love with Voivod at this point and I just can't, can't get enough of nothing face. During Astronomy Domine, I'm up front. Snake pulls me on stage and I got to sing the second verse of Astronomy Domine. <laughs> drunk out of my mind. I am drunk hammered. But no, so I get where you're coming from. That was such a weird weird album i went backwards then of course and hit dimension and killing i still think the first two are my least favorite of their yeah, albums because i like the i like the proggy stuff like you i really love uh you know outer limits i love angel rat angel rat's like oh so near and dear to me and, and it's everything... I mean, my favorite if i have to pick one favorite from the piggy era it's outer limit no no hesitation even over phobos that album rules eh. I, I don't know it well. Maybe okay. if I listen to it today, but but Outer Limit, I like every second uh, of amazing, that record. Amazing, amazing album. So, okay, so you, you you're getting the, this thing together with the guys, and, and yeah. You're, so, uh, how do you pick up the other two guys? Yeah. So uh, we were practicing at uh, our friend uh, Bob, and uh, Bob uh, was a big horror fan. He had a coffin in, in his bedroom, and he's, he was driving a hearse. And uh, you, so you get the picture. And um, he was playing in this band called Blaylock with Mark. With Mark, Mark, he's a very good friend of mine over 30-something years. He's the one building all my guitars. So that's when I Chico, met all the Is it Chicione or how do you Chico spell one. it? Chiquan. Chiquan. Okay, yeah. yeah. Beautiful yeah. guitars too. Yeah. We'll to yeah. So that's when I, I met Mark Chiquan. That's when I met Bob. And Bob, he was into our movie and all that stuff. And he said, Man, one day I'd like to do a project, you know, about gore and, and blood and all those uh, our thing. And I would call this band this project Gore Guts, you know. So I said, Oh, this is a great name. And we were kind of looking for a name and uh, we didn't find anything. And one day we Went to Bob and say, "Hey, Bob, we we can't find a good name, but your Gorgots thing. I mean, it's it's really a good name. Would you mind if we use it?" And he's like, "Ma, no, it's good. You know, I." I so he didn't want to be in the band. He gave it to you. No, he just gave the name. He said, "Bob, you can use it." You know. So uh, now, do you yeah. still do you still talk to Bob? Oh, Bob, I haven't seen Bob in a couple of years. One every year 
We Does he ever call you up and say, hey, what kind of uh, residuals can I get on the name? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, Bob's all good. That's he's awesome. All, he's, he's all nice. But the, no, the last time I saw Bob here in Richmond every year, we have this day that people do yard sales. Okay. And he kind of likes antiques and stuff. And one day I was in my workshop, the door opened, and he just popped in. You know, he said, oh, I heard you had your shop here. So nice. we had a chat. But I haven't seen him in uh, in a couple of years now. That's yeah. awesome, though. Yeah. So you, you, you poached the name. You got your name. Yeah. So we're jamming at Bob's Place. And uh, Gary was... Uh, was uh, uh, the brother of the, this artist girl that was uh, going out with one of the uh, 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 of Bob's uh, with Bob's brother? So she goes like, "Oh, my brother plays guitar. Maybe he can join you guys." So that's how we uh, we met. And then Eric was a friend of a friend. So uh, so, but it started with Stefan and myself. But but uh, uh, Gary joined. Eric joined. We started, uh, we learned a few covers. We were playing like uh, Chapel of Ghouls, uh, uh, Beneath the Remains, uh, Godly Beings from Obituary. Uh, and, and funny enough, uh, I'll, I'll like to say that in interviews now, uh, we were playing a fucking uh, 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 Mucky Pop cover. A what cover? Mucky Pop. Which is oh like my a- God, there's a name I haven't heard forever. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, the song was called You Stink But I Love You or something. <laughs> I never heard that, but I know that name. But I gotta say that that wasn't my pick, you know. So I get okay. I'll go with the team, you know. They they so went now, for the death metal. Do, pick. Did you guys do any shows before? Yeah, you- we did it. We, yeah, we did a we did a few shows, and we played those cover, but not for too long. And and we started to write our own s- stuff pretty quickly. So so we so get together the, in August. This is the demo stuff. This is the demo. Yeah, stuff? yeah, yeah. Okay. So we get together in August uh, eighty nine. Uh, August eighty nine. Uh, 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 June ninety. We record the demo. And me, I, I didn't talk about that, but before I met Stefan, and 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 form Gorgots and everything, I was doing a lot of tape trading. I was writing. I was writing with Patrick yep. from Mameli from Pestilence. I was writing to the guys from Autopsy, guys from Entomb. I was writing to Metallion, you know, Slayer Zine in, yep, in yep, Norway. Yep, yep. So uh, I was doing, a, I was writing with Bob from yeah, Immolation. Like connections. Exactly. Yeah. So I was already in the underground thing and I really liked that tape trading thing. And uh, actually, uh, uh, Albert gave me a book of the uh, Swedish uh, death metal scene history. That's a great book. And dude, that brings so much memories because they yeah. talk about Skuneb. I was writing with these guys back then. So it, these are all names that I've seen in the early fanzines, you know? So I'm, a, I'm very envious of you for one reason here. Uh, not, not the least of which is you're a fucking genius. But <laughs> the main reason I'm envious is that because I am almost seven years older than you, I kind of missed the tape trading thing because I was already at that point in the late 80s. I was in my second, third year of college, and I'm now, I hate to say it, man, I had one thought on my mind, and it was not death metal a lot of the time. And I think you can figure out what it was. It was usually the female persuasion. and Of it course. Was, and so, yeah, like, the, the hormones. Yes, the hormones. The, the hormones trading, not the tape trading. Sad, <laughs> and sadly, the other thing, too, was, Luke, I kind of hit the hair metal thing more than the death metal thing. Yeah. Death metal didn't come to me until the about 2001 when I heard Blackwater Park. I don't, I don't, I don't know about the other styles, but I, I think thrash metal with the Bay Area had their tape trading days. Oh, but yeah. With, but with Europe, it's it more death metal that totally, brought that together. Totally. Am I right with this? Yes, you're one hundred percent right. And that's where I fucked up because I knew about it, but I was like, "Yeah, that sounds sketchy. I don't want to talk to some dude." I fucked that up so bad. Now I look back and think, "What was I thinking?" Because those demos are cherished. I imagine. Do you still have some of those, the tapes and stuff? Nah, I I I, I can't. I do, I, there's one demo that I have around is the suffocation demo. 
that I bought when I saw them play live for the first time at the day of death in Buffalo. Wow. It was a death metal festival. I saw Cannibal there. It was the first show, the first mortician show, first incantation show. We drove a couple buddies with Bob, oh, cool. actually. We went yeah. there to Buffalo. Yeah. So I got to see uh, Emulation were playing. I got to meet Bob from uh, Rob from Emul. I don't know. I say Bob or Rob, whatever. Rob, from yeah, Emulation. Yeah. Vigna. Vigna, yeah. And but Bob, I was already pen palling with him. And I had their first demo, and he said, Yeah, we just record our, our second demo. And I'm like, hey. You need some artwork for your demo? He said, fine. So I drew their demo cover. Did their you really? second demo cover. Oh, I didn't so do the cool. logo. But did I, I know did. that? Do mo most people know that? Uh, so a few people know okay. about it. But it's a, fun to, it's a funny story to, to tell. Now we're both in the same scene. And, uh, sure. And, well, and we, we, we're still very good buddies, you know? Every oh, time yeah. you we, know, we see... Luke, you know this more than anyone, man. That The, the death metal... Extreme metal fraternity is such. Oh, camaraderie is 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 priceless. It's, it's so fucking tight. You can't you can't yeah. get you know just like the Bay Area thrash scene is. Those guys are, you know, I talk to Craig LeCicero a lot and and some of these guys and it's he's the a, nicest. Uh, he's so I, got, cool. I got to meet him if he came and when we did the Death to All, right? He came to rehearsal and dude, I met him with sacred reich in montreal back in the days but he wouldn't remember me at so all cool. was like yeah, he's such a cool guy so and, and, you, you get so when you record this demo uh, and then comes lividity is that on a four or an eight track i'm assuming it's an eight track right it's an eight track okay is it that was it a dad or was it straight no, up no just no, eight, no no eight, no no eight, it eight. was a, a test scout and was it test scout those quarter inch yeah eight track yeah yeah so, but that there, there's cool story with this. Okay, but tell me about that. You know about Oblivion? Actually, you just really. I I just saw that. Yes, I do know yeah. them. Yes, oh. Pierre Pierre Remillard. Pierre, I was total me. I was total fanboy. Fanboy of Oblivion. They were like the master class for a Quebec band to right. for execution. You know, you see, and they they wrote amazing song, dude. Yes. I've listened to Nemesis. Uh, maybe a month ago for a radio show, I had to do a little comment. So I said, oh, I'm going to revisit the album. Dude, it didn't take a fucking wrinkle. You know what I'm saying? It, 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 it's, it's amazing. It's yeah. so fucking amazing. So we would go to every Oblivion show, and, and they were so professional. They had those demos, you know, and everything. And me doing tape trading and with some Quebec people, I ended up. Which I wasn't supposed to, but I ended up having some pre prod from Oblivion, which were made on the four track. Some riffs or just, just like uh, sketches, song sketches, or I don't remember they were actual like full songs or something. So, but I, I knew through through the grapevine that it was Pierre that recorded those things. So. Mm -hmm. Me wanted to get like camaraderie and get closer in their circle. I went to to ask him during a show. They were playing in the area. I said, "Hey, Pierre," I said, uh, "You recorded? Are you? You're the one that recorded this four track about? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah." I said, "I, I got to hear this." I said, uh, "Would you be into uh, recording my band?" And right away I said, "Sure, no problem." And he had never done that for somebody else. No kidding, you're the first. He yeah. does it now a lot. I think he does. Yeah, it yeah, a lot. yeah. But we Gorgots are the first band he ever recorded beside Oblivion. That's so cool. And that kind of started his recording engineer yeah. thing. Everybody was calling. Studio. He has a I'm studio. Sorry? He has a studio now, right? Of course. That's yeah, where yeah. we recorded Colored Sands. Oh, that's right. Right, right, right. And yeah. we recorded Obscura and From Wisdom with him, but that was in a different studio in Montreal. Okay. So so we asked Pierre, Pierre, yeah, no problem. Very sure, very confident, no problem. So we went to this little music uh, local store, and he had this uh, Tascam 8-track. So we, we rented the machine there, and one day Pierre came by uh, at uh, Stefan's, uh, the drummer, Stefan's uh, father's place. That's where we were, we were practicing. And uh, in one weekend, we recorded the demo. And... 
uh, Bob, you know where we were, uh, we practiced after the, the Gorgots name guy. Right, right, Gorgots, right. Yeah, he had a demo out with his band, but it was all nice, all wrapped up cassettes, very professional. So they were the connection for us to get like this, you know, uh, product all more professional looking, so to speak. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, so you got this demo. Are, are you, do you start shopping it with the intention of trying to get signed or does it? Of course. Okay. So you're doing the old snail mail. Oh yeah, you, me, you, but I was already into the tape trading and okay, then right? people, and, and you know, I was doing interviews, but check it out. Even before doing the demo, when we had two songs, we did a rehearsal tape, but it sounded pretty rough, but but still pretty good. And I remember I sent that to Norway to Metallion at the okay, at, yeah. the, at Slayer Zine. Yeah. And Metallion is the very first person that sent me back a letter for uh, Gorgot's purpose. So it was like Gorgot's C O C slash care of right. Luke LeMay, blah blah blah. And I was oh, so excited getting yeah. his feedback from yeah. hey this, this guy from norway said our, our nice music kid. sounds killer and i yeah. was like man so pumped you know but this they, is the shit. They, it, to well, me it's like how old are you how old are you at this time i'm like uh 18. oh really okay yeah that's right so after young. high school yeah you're yeah, young yeah. But I was, like I said, I was already uh, writing with with uh, with uh, 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 Metallion at, at Slayer. Actually, I bought the entire uh, Slayer zine uh, anthology. You have all the fanzines. And I think somewhere you have a little word on Gorgots, but it's the very first guy that talked about us in the underground. Oh, and yeah. then it started, to, it started to snowball. I was getting more mail, and then we did the demo. And dude, I would spend all my evenings. I was working in a tomato uh, greenhouse during yeah. the day, yeah. and in the evening, I was working on music and doing mail. That's how I learned speaking English, doing all my correspondence. Oh, so you That's didn't actually way. know English before then? I mean, I could speak English, but not as good as now. Oh, well, well, okay, I got you. Exactly, not broken. as fluent, okay. and uh, yeah. So tell me how. And who, how how does Roadrunner get a hold of it? Did you send it to them? Check it out. So I, I was, so we were very good friends with Oblivion. So I would hitchhike and go to Montreal and hang out with the guys from Oblivion and blah, blah, blah. So one day I get there and uh, there was a uh, Bory Boy. You remember Boy, Boy, Boy? Boy? Corrigan, Corvev, yeah, the uh, blabbermouth guy. Corgan, Corgan, yeah, Corgan. He does the blabbermouth now. Yeah, but back in the days, he was riding in Metal Maniacs. Yep, and he was doing this firing squad page. He would review demos, and he was also a writer in Metal Forces in England, which I was buying. You had always those demolition. You had those demo reviews. In yes, 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 yeah. A couple pages. So B, I would buy this very rigorous. Uh, re religiously, you know, so I knew about Borivoy, and one day I get at the Oblivion's uh, uh, Martin, the guitar player's apartment, and Bory's there because he oh, was a good friend with Stéphane Belanger, which was like Oblivion's manager back in the days. Okay, so but they yeah, were very, very connected with all, yeah, the, but these yeah. guys were like ages involved in the underground way before I was. So they were sure. really inspirational sure. about doing uh, tape trading. And uh, so they were like, it was like a master class of how, how to get your way around in the underground, what you need to do and read fanzines and do flyers. And so it was like, uh, it was so inspiring to know those people as a youngster, you know, yeah, it was that very, um, you know, a lot of the young people that are watching here, probably some of the young people that are watching here. And again, I kind of am coming at this like I knew of this stuff, but I, I, I was in the hair metal and a little bit older. So I was like, kind of like, I don't want to say I was too old for it, but I had kind of jumped it a little bit. But, but your focus wasn't on that. That's what you regret, not to have your focus right. on that phenomenon going right. on. Right now I am in my 40s and 50s. That's where I'm at. But it's funny because... 
I don't think people understood how much DIY, the DIY ethics of all that was so crucial for all you guys. I mean, Kelly speaks so highly of Bory. You know, I mean, that he was critical for that. Of course. He's yeah. so important. Simple Chuck. truth. It's because of Bory. Yeah. He's the one that discovered them in, in yeah. fucking Brazil. Yeah. That's right. Because he he knew Chuck about before everybody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because yep. of of tape trading and uh and and check it out. We became very good friends uh, after that. But check it out. I have this story. So I get to meet Bori there, and I have this rehearsal tape in my uh, backpack. And dude, I'm total total fanboy about Bori. I'm so impressed, you know. And he's all yeah, all laid back and all cool, you know. And I said, man, uh, can I play this new song we have? And it was considered dead, but up to the third riff, it's not even finished. No and shit. I press play. And I'm like, check it out. And to, 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 you have this beginning. And, uh, and, and I think what grabbed him is my people told me that even as an older person, they always said that my enthusiasm was kind of contagious. You it know? is. It's so, so it kind of, it kind of opened doors for me you, to some people. I would be the fucking annoying guy, <laughs> but for the other one, it's like, man, he's fucking passionate about what he's doing. You and I are very so similar. I get that. I get that same criticism of me that I can be a little too full on and too intense sometimes. Yeah. But it's it's when you're passionate about something, man. You can't you can't hold it in. It, it, there's it, no I, there's no there's no it. moderate enthusiasm. Exactly. It's, it's either you are or you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. So you play him the so, so Bory's there, so I played it and, and he had made a review of, of, of our demo in two uh metal uh, uh metal maniacs. So and he was comparing, you know, to pestilence and morgoth and blah blah, which is fine because these were all my influence back then. Sure. So so he knew about my enthusiasm and he knew about my demo and blah blah blah. So you have this second wave of death metal, which kicks in. That's after Morbid Angel and Obituary. Yeah, the Florida stuff, right. Exactly. And then Roadrunner, they decide to do uh, RC record for the death metal kind of uh, signing. Because the, then they sign Immolation. Right. They sign Malevolent Creation. That was before us. Okay. They kind of started the thing. And out of the blue... Let's say on the fucking uh, Monday night, I get a I get a phone call from Bori at my parent. I, I was still living at my parents' place back then. Mm -hmm. So we're talking. We recorded the demo in June '90, and we're talking maybe like August. Wow. Two months later, it wasn't even winter, fall or winter yet. Let's say end of summer, but still summer. And Bori calls me and he said, uh, you, you, you got to be home on Thursday. I said, oh, yeah. But first, I was like super surprised that he calls me. You yeah, know? Like, why are you calling me? Yeah. He said, you got to be home on Thursday. He said, uh, somebody's going to call you uh, to offer you to talk to you about a record deal. And it was Monty Connor. Mm. And he said, you got to be home on Thursday. And me, I'm like, holy fucking shit. Yeah. Or he goes like, no, here's the number. You got to call this guy on Thursday. So I had the number, but come on. I'm 18 years old. You're terrified. 19. And no, but I'm like, I just can't fucking contain myself. No, it's oh, like, you're like, it's so, like yeah. you go, you mm -hmm. go to a fucking grade school birthday party and where's the piñata? You want to do everything. It's, it's, you just can't fucking wait too yeah, much sugar. Like, you probably didn't sleep for like three days waiting. Exactly. For can I open my present just a bit? <laughs> yeah. Kid on Christmas Eve, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And then I remember that this is funny now. I remember I'm like, dude, I just can't owe myself. It's Wednesday. I call Roadrunner. Uh, can I speak to Monty? Yeah, no problem. Hello? Hey, Monty, this is Luke. Hi, Luke. Uh, I'm kind of busy right now. We were supposed to talk tomorrow. So it's like, <laughs> relax. Yeah. Chill, bro. <laughs> so they offer you a recording contract then, huh? Yeah. So the next day, I got to, to speak with Monty. He said, I really like your demo. 
And because Bo Rivoy played the demo to Monty. Yeah. And uh, but Bo Rivoy was so important. Same thing. Malevolent creation. Uh, well, I think that's the story. Malevolent are in the studio with Scott recording their demo. Scott and Bori, they speak all the time. And Bori say to Monty, dude, you gotta check these guys out. I mean, that's how it that's, it was a word, it was a word of mouth. Thing. Word of mouth, yeah, you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. So just just to make little parentheses here, I, I was invited uh, uh last uh, September when school uh, started, first day of school. I was invited at the high school where I went to school uh, 30 years ago to do a conference for the, the youngster. Oh, wow. And I brought magazine. I brought Decibel, you know, uh, magazines from England. I brought my vinyls and, uh, and they played the YouTube videos, you know, on the, on the screen. That's awesome. And I, and I told them kids, uh, people think that if you're not from LA or New York City, your life is fucked and you can't do anything with your life and you're 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 damned to work in a fucking factory or whatever. I said, I'm from Danville, next town, three thousand people. I was pen palling, tape trading, no computers, passionate about doing something with no internet, yeah, no internet. And it works. Right? We can crush door open. So do something that you love. So, the, and I really like. Amen. I did that a couple of times to go meet youngsters, you know, yeah. and say, "Do what you want. Follow your dream, man." Follow exactly. Your dream, right? It yeah. worked. I can tell you, it's no bullshit. It fucking works. Well, okay. So they did. They offer you a multi like album deal yeah or? it was like uh, it was the like the 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 the, the, the usual like nine yard like five six records like first one for sure all the other ones are optional optional so, right exactly now what so, did, yeah what did they do you remember what kind of money they gave you to record because you went down you went down to morris sounds and what i yeah. wanted to ask you about that was was that your demand or did they say we're gonna put you down there no 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 check it out monty's like okay buddy uh there's this guy is gonna call you uh, his name is dan seagrave i know fucking dan seagrave oh, he's artist. gonna make your cover because I, I already had altars of madness and i was like dude yeah this You're is like, fucking, huh? pinch me somebody yeah. you know this is fucking dream come true yeah 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 and uh, by the way uh we booked morris sound for you guys and you're gonna be recording with scott burns i'm like what the fuck yeah, I was you got you gotta literally it. be losing your fucking mind. Of course. Yeah. And yeah. you know, I was listening to Leprosy, which was made there, and Scott worked on the record. Sure. I was a big fan of Obituary, which was made there. Uh, DSI, the uh, uh, the first DSI, I'm like, man, we were losing our shit. Yeah. How was the other guys? What were they? Were they like, I mean, you guys are very young guys, right? I mean, they're all oh, about yeah. your we're, age. We're 18, 19 about. Yeah. So they're all like. It's kind of like a fairy tale. This is really happening, right? You're getting on a plane. You're gonna fly to fucking. Tampa. No, 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 not even. Check it out. Check it out. We 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 packed the van with our instrument. You drove. Yeah, yeah. Check it out. We leave Sherbrooke, and borders are about uh, forty-five minutes from uh, from where we live. Uh huh. So we get there, and uh, the uh, the officer goes like. Uh, where are you guys? Uh, where are you guys going? We're going to Tampa, Florida. Why is that? To record an album. Hmm. You need working working visas for that. We're like, uh, what? And dude, now that I know my way around with fucking borders, I mean, all yeah. the paperwork wise. Yeah. Dude, we didn't need a fucking working visas to go record an album. You know what was his train of thought there? He goes like, you gonna go there? Record an album, which is going to go on the shelf at right. some point. Then it's going to generate some pennies Income. and you're going to get some money in your pocket somewhere. So you're you kind of working, but paid later. Okay. Got it. So he said, uh, you're not going. I'm like, what is this? A is this a customs guy or a border patrol? What? Who is this? U.S. U.S. Customs. Customs. Okay. Yeah. 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 You know, port of entry. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So what did you yeah. end up doing? What'd you have to do? So, so check it out. So what we do, 
went back to uh, to my place. We were practicing at my place, I think, back then. And we're like, oh, tab out, Mac. It's not going to work, blah, 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 blah. So we called Scott at Morristown and we're on conference call. And we're like, what are we going to do? He said, relax, guys. I mean... We just we just did the suffocation record like uh, a month ago or something, and we have we have drums, we have amps here. Don't don't bring gear, no yeah. problem. You yeah. don't you don't. We're all set. Okay, just just go. So what we did, we took a different board because there's many borders here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super tiny, like in the woods. Yeah. So we took this border that. Every Quebecer goes in the summer for fucking uh, beach, uh, like in uh, in Maine. You know, every okay. Quebecer goes to Maine. That's the closest place to the ocean. To yep. you know, little family vacation there. So it's like it's it's like common deal for them. Sure, sure. Quebecers going there. So, but dude, we're we're like fucking overkilling it. We put like a. A diving mask on on the driving on 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 the dash of the van. It's like too much, <laughs> too much uh, uh, evidence. Yeah, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like scuba diving things, you know. <laughs> 14, too much. Fourteen giant beach balls in the back. Yeah, it's yeah. like come on, relax, relax. <laughs> so anyway, so we get to the border. Where are you guys going? Oh, we're going to an uh, old uh, Orchard Beach in Maine, you know, uh, for a weekend. So, okay, fine, go. Woo -hoo -hoo! Boom. So, we drive straight to Tampa. Went to Clearwater for a week just to hang out. Dude, we get there the first day. I go to the beach to swim, come back. We got broken, got all my money stolen. <laughs> Where at your hotel? Yeah. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Man. First serious? day. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. but that was before the studio. So, but dude, we were so happy to be there, make the album. I mean, it's just like whatever. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, you're yeah. young, so that shit doesn't. I mean, it doesn't yeah. affect you the same way, right? Dude, I, I'm hitchhiking anyway. home. Yeah, I'm hitchhiking just... home. I get my way around. I yeah, mean, you can sleep anywhere on any floor. We we, we have tough metal. Get you a tough skin, you know? Yes, it does. So you get into Morrison, you meet Scott. That's got to be a pretty big moment. Oh right? man, it was so nice, but. Go, coming back to those uh, tape trading and pen uh, palling years, check it out. Just just to, to, to go back a little bit. Death do their tour for uh, spiritual healing. Yep. So we're talking 90, uh, no, uh, uh, 90, uh, 88, 88-ish. For spiritual? Yeah, it's like 88, 89, because I remember... Beginning of the band, I was listening to spiritual. Yeah, you can you check on the archives or something? Yeah, I think spiritual's later than that because 87 was I thought that was 90 or 91. Hang on. Maybe 90. I'm not good on that. I'm getting old, so I kind of forget. Uh but just for a ballpark ish. Yeah. <laughs> I put spiritual healing in it, brought up a uh, a meditation center close. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Hang on. Somebody in the chat probably knows too. Um, there we go. Where are you? 1990. That's what I thought. Yes, February in 1990. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in 1990, we go to see uh, Death Spiritual Healing in Montreal. And I get to meet uh, James Murphy at the end of the show. Hey man, great show, blah blah blah. Uh, can uh, you think uh, uh, we can write? Sure, he gives me he gives me uh, his address. I was like, yeah, so so happy, dude. I can write to one of the guy in death, you know, and they're yeah. my idols. And oh yeah. So when we got the demo, I got to send the demo to uh, James Murphy, and uh, we became uh, pen pals. So. Coming back to Morris Sound, we get there the first day. We get to meet Scott, and I had sent a letter to uh, to James, right, saying, "Hey, we're going to record with Scott at Morris Sound." Oh, fine, I'm gonna go and hang out. So the first day we get there, James is there to welcome us too. Say, "Hey, hi uh, guys, awesome. how's it going?" Yeah. So we ended up recording the album with James Murphy's guitar. So we lent. Oh, us you his used guitar. his guitar. Yeah, 
So that's why to thank him. That's why James do a guest solo. He's on the solo, that, yeah. Mm. Inoculated life. That's yeah. Why. Yeah. And then you had Chris Barnes. Now, did you know Barnes prior to? Yeah, because we had did we had did a few shows with Cannibal Corpse before when they came to Quebec, and we became when they were, buddies when they were still in Buffalo. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. so he did some vocals. Now, when you're down there, at Morrisat, is there anybody else around? Is like atheist there? Because you guys are all at yeah. That but check it out. Before. One day, I remember one day I'm hearing a voice in the lobby. So I said, oh, I know this voice. So I walk there and David Vincent is standing there. So I go there and say, hi, you know, introduce no myself. Shit. Yeah. It's like, hey, you know, and he's got his motorcycle outside, you know, and uh, all dressed up as a biker. And I'm Ooh. super impressed. And I was so more, big Morbid Angel fan, you know. Sure. And then he goes like, uh, hey, you want to go to McDonald's? Sure. There was McDonald's uh, right next to Morristown. So I went, I went there to... To hang out, you know. So, so these are all so nice memories, you know. Yeah, as, that. As, a, as a teenager, you know. So uh, that is so cool. So you guys do the considered dead, and it's very. Let's be honest, it's very Florida death metal influence. Totally. Right? Even though you had written a lot of the, that stuff before you even got there, it, you can hear the Morbid Angel. You can hear the yeah, but the, also the production. You know, mm -hmm. it's made of more sound. You you got like that 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 fingerprint there. But but when, but when I wrote uh, uh, Consider Dead, I was really influenced by the Swedish death metal, like Entomb, Left and Path, Oblivion. So if you re listen again to Oblivion, if you revisit Nemesis. Oh, you can hear it. And and then you listen to Consider Dead. I can totally pinpoint riffs to you. Ah, oh, that's Oblivion totally. Sure. Here. But it's all like a mashup of death, uh, Oblivion, uh, Entomb. And I was, I was, I really like Autopsy. I was listening to a lot of Autopsy. Uh, yeah, we're Spirit talking, uh, are we talking Severed there? Or, uh, probably is Severed, right? Not, yeah, Severe. Yeah, the I first don't, one. I don't, I don't, I'm trying to remember when um, Mental Funerals 92 or 91. Yeah, it's later. It's yeah, it's later. later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I, back in the days, I was pen palling with, uh, with Cutler, Eric Cutler from okay. Autopsy. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I remember doing a cartoon of them, and he said, "Man, it's so cool the cartoon. We put it in our uh, uh, apartment, our practice space, you know. So, so they cool. had the cartoon." <laughs> so how long did it take you to record that? Considered that entirely, one week. One, one week. week record and mixed everything. Yeah, when, seven days. When you're doing that, so you're using all their gear. You didn't have your own stuff. You said right? No, no. So there was a drum there. Uh, they had uh, Mesa Boogie we used. It was a Mark II, I believe, Mark III uh, that we used. Uh, and the drum, I can't remember, but they had the drum in-house, you know. Uh, there. Right, right. But you know what was so cool being at Morrison? When we were there, there was like this closet with uh, DAT players, DAT players. Yeah, the DAT players, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And dude, suffocation were there like a month before, so we got to listen to effigy. And I, and that had a great deal of an effect on you, from what I understand. Yeah, but but after for, for a next for the next yeah, yeah, hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, but let me, so let me... dude, so we were listening to effigy and we're like, holy shit. See, I know and, I and, 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 and uh, just hold on. And and Death Human was just recorded there too. So so we could listen to the record, those oh. records before they came out, you know. So it was so much fun. I'm scared. I'm going to keep here five hours because this is so fun. So I want to. Oh, it's okay. No move, okay, so I want to move a little bit quicker just for your sake. I don't want to keep you till midnight. Um, so <laughs> let me ask you this. Um, I'm, I'm just looking real quick. Uh, I just wanted to check one thing. Are you still? I guess you and James are. You still know each other and still talk. Spread. Yeah, actually, check it out. Uh, there's a uh, you know a uh, metal box. Yeah, the metal light box set. Yeah, no, yeah. The, the metal box. It's a thing you subscribe monthly. You get the yeah. box. Yeah, the and box. These are all metal like head, metal a metal head box set. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. So they just released uh, last month or two months ago uh, the Gorguts demo and the Disincarnate demo. Yes. And I looked in my archives and uh, and uh, we had a picture. Of when I, I met the James Murphy, so we put it in the layout. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. So we man. we just wrote to each other a couple of weeks ago for this release. So yeah, uh, that this that disincarnate is uh, 
it's kind of a one of a kind in a lot of ways because they didn't do much. They didn't do anything after that, right? No. But but I mean that was and James was kind of, yeah, he was one of those guitar players that was like in death metal. He was kind of like the Eddie Van Halen of death metal. Yeah, yeah. Is it after that he joined Testament to play on low and stuff? Yeah. Well, yeah, it was after, but I can't, I'm trying to remember who he went. I thought he went somewhere else before there, though. What is, what is the Testament record that there's uh, Lombardo on it? Well, Lombardo's on do, um, The Gathering. The Gathering? Yeah. Oh, it's on Gathering? Yeah. But there's another one, and, and Murphy plays on that one, too. There's Lombardo, Murphy, and I'm I thinking, think there's uh, DiGiorgio. Yeah, I'm not sure. Honestly, I can't. That period where they kind of went death metal is the one where I cut. There's Low, and um, what's the other one with the spiky... But gathering is the more the more death metal. I I think it's uh it's Oglin on drums on yeah it's anyway. it's death it's deathy, the gathering is deathy, but it's also pretty thrashy too. Like do yeah. DNR and all that kind of stuff like that's on there. That probably might be my favorite uh my favorite of theirs actually believe it or not. But um so did you when you're down there, you didn't meet Chuck yet, right? You had met him no. before or after that. I met Chuck the first time, I mean, very shortly on the spiritual healing show that I spoke to Murphy, but we took a picture and that was it. But Chuck, I got to meet him and and, and, and share a bit, but we didn't get to talk much. It was uh, uh, when we opened for them in Montreal in, 90, in June 95. Okay, that's the first time you met him. That was on the Symbolic. Symbolic, okay, all yeah, right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I met him before, but just, you know, hey, take a picture, bye. But uh, yeah. but but on the symbolic actually, tour, yeah, we got to share down. a bit in the afternoon and uh, yeah. yeah. Um, Cosmic Paul Bear, dude, I forgot your freaking name. I know it, I keep thinking it's Ryan, and I know that's wrong. Sorry. Um, he says James is on low in the gathering, and that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and Nate, we're gonna get. I'm trying to get. We're definitely gonna get to Steve Hurdle and Obscura. We got to get there. Um, sorry, we're just Luke and I are geeking out here. It's just a lot of geeking out. <laughs> Um, so Too many that, anecdotes. Yeah, a lot of them, man, and that's great. That's what I love about this, Andrew. That's it, uh, Andrew. I kept thinking it's Ryan. Um, so after that album comes out, after Considered Dead comes out, you go out on tour with uh, Cannibal and Atheist, right? Yes. And yeah. that was the name of that tour. I I couldn't find it. Some they called it something, the Blood and Guts tour or something. Yeah, something like that. I have the pass uh, upstairs in the studio still. Right. Uh, but that was uh, January or February of uh, 92. Right. How many was that just that was just US and how many dates did you do? Do you remember? Oh, we played like a whole month or something. Okay. Yeah. And you're pretty much playing every night, more or less. You're, you're yeah. in a different yeah. yeah. Like the usual, the usual. And you guys are all you're on a real tour bus at this point. You're on no, a, no, 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 oh, no, no, no. Cannibal you're and us were sharing a 15 passenger van. Oh, so you're doing the actual, the, the caravan van type thing. Yeah, but the thing is, is that before that, before having the 15 passenger, we uh -huh. had, an, uh, no, we had the 15 passenger and there was another van that was carrying uh, our trailer, but it was like a, a homemade trailer with plywood and whatever. Anyway, it always served us good. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that on the second, uh, third dates. We we the tour started in Toronto. We played Montreal second date, and on the third date, we got into New York City pretty early in the morning. We're on George Washington Bridge, and okay. we're hearing this ka clang ka clang ka clang ka clang thing in the back. The but door? the thing is that the fucking hitching ball uh, was was attached to the fucking uh, bumper. It wasn't attached to the the van's frame. Oh, so the shit. thing is. For, it was kicking in and out. Yeah. So the, the fucking bumper was kind of detaching from the van. <laughs> so we're like, tabarnak, we, 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 can't, we can't go further than that. Yeah, so we right. parked on the bridge. And uh, our buddy uh, went to one of those phones, you know, uh, SOS phones. Yes. And he calls the company, which happened to be in Jersey, where the van was rented. So he said, okay, cool. We're going to send you guys uh, another van. So you can hook up the trailer, and we're gonna leave with this the the, the fucked up one, right. and you guys can keep going and the box. So the other van came on the George Washington Bridge, and we're like fucking nine ten in the morning. A lot of traffic, fucking January, 
freezing balls. Yeah. Cold. And the other van comes. We 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 put the trailer on, but the 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 fucking hitching uh, 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 attach is right. too small. But the guy didn't check what was the gauge of it, so he leaves. We're in the van, dude. He he made uh, not even a fucking thousand feet. The trailer detached, kicked back, broke the chain, and the thong came and fucking wrecked the the the, the metal from the back door. <laughs> Then the trailer went in the traffic like this oh, and hit the, the, hit the concrete wall between the, the, the other contrary lane, you know? Oh. That's fucking terrifying, man. Yeah. <laughs> so when we say metal gets you a tough skin, that don't, don't scan a days. Don't, don't yeah. scan a days, you know? I wonder what the insurance rider policy was like on that thing, man. Holy shit. Hey, so did they, get, did they got you squared away, though, then, eventually? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we ended up leaving the bridge. But dude, we made the news that day. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the for the thing detaching. Yeah. That's funny, man. Where did you yeah, play? Yeah. Do you remember what club you played? Oh no, it, it's too far. Uh, I okay. don't remember. So anyway, so what we did from there? So we got like those big cubes, the truck. So we put all the gear, and we and we we. And we kept the 15 passenger, but with no trailer on it. So anyway, so that's uh, one thing that happened on that tour. Where was Atheist? Were they? Did they have their own thing? Yeah, they had their own transportation, from from what I can remember. But they, we weren't traveling together. No. Um. So, the net. You've already after you get consider Dead's out. You're already writing for the next album, right? Yeah, because when I remember when we went on tour for uh, Considered in the states. I remember being in the hotel room and I was already playing riffs for, for a Path Beyond Premonition, which was like the fourth song that I wrote for Erosion. So, so because as, so, as soon as we came back from Mort Sound, I had the Erosion of Sanity uh, written. Right. And uh, wh what is the, the other song? Anyway, but my point is, is that what happened is that uh, as soon as Considered Dead came out, uh, Roadrunner, uh, send me uh, train tickets so I can go to Roadrunner office in New York City like, uh, today to do phone interviews for like fucking 10, 12 hours a day, you know, with people in, wow. in Germany, in Europe, you know, like metal forces and all those, those metal papers uh, sure. back, back in the, Doing all back the press, in the days. Right, all the press for the exactly. album. Exactly. So... Let's say we're, we're Saturday uh, or Friday during the day. I do interviews, blah, 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 blah. And then uh, I remember during the day, Bori, uh, Bori Voice uh, stopped by and we, we got to, to hang out a bit and say, stop by at the office to say hi. And then I asked Monty, I said, hey, Monty, can you give me phone numbers for, for the guys in the suffocation? I would really like to meet them. He said, yeah, no problem. So I think he gave me like a Cerrito. Doug Cerrito uh, number. Yep, yep. So I call Cerrito and I say, uh, I tell this story because it's a very important evening that really made the sound for erosion and you're yep. going to see why. Yep. So I call Cerrito. I say, hey, Luke from Gorgot's here. Hey, what's up, man? I mean, we really like uh, your band and we, and our, our album came out the same day. It was October uh, 6th or 7th. Uh, it came out the same day, both albums. So, uh, so anyway, did you about our shit? So I said, yeah, I would really like to hang out and meet you guys. I say, yeah, no problem. Where are you? I said, at a Roadrunner's office. And they they were in they they're still in Long Island. So nice. they drove by and they, they they came pick me up. Nice. Yeah. So there was Frank, there was Cerrito, and there was uh, uh, Terrence. So hey man, so we get we we got to introduce each other for the first time and. Uh, so I leave with them to go back to Long Island and we go straight at uh, Mike Smith's house because suffocation were practicing at Mike's house. Right. And uh, so go down in the basement. I'm like, holy shit, this is fucking cool. So they start playing. So I get to sing Infecting the Crips with them. No. Just to hang out. I didn't know the lyrics, but just, just to hang out. Just know, to growl. Just, right, right. Exactly. Exactly. And then they say, man, yeah, uh, we're going to play. We're going to play a couple songs for you. And dude, 
I remember they played fucking effigy, but it was the first time that I really got to see the actual performance of the riff. Because listening to the record, it's kind of muddy a bit. But when you see them play, I just, I, uh, uh, just my job for one second. So I saw Death to All back in uh, March. I got to see uh, yeah. Max put me on the guest list, and I got to see them. Yeah. I was, no lie, Luke, I was three feet away from Terrence when he was playing. And, man, just that right hand and those fucking riffs. And I have to be honest with you. I am Suffo. I'm an old, I am, how do I put this? Um, Suffo is one of the bands that I came to extremely, extremely late. I've heard you talk about this, how you came to this band or that band kind of late. Man, I was way out of off in left field with Suffo. But listening to them live and seeing Terrence play live, meeting Terrence, he's going to be coming on and as soon as they come back from Europe. Um, just the coolest fucking guy ever. I mean, he's like you, just a super cool guy. But man, they're, you know, I would have liked to have seen them with, um, you know, um, oh God, what's his name? The singer. Frank. Frank, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of that dude now. Frank, I didn't get to see him with them. But it was like I'm standing right there, and then they go off, and the god, the goat, the Giorgio comes out. Stevie D is right there, and I'm wearing a farewell to King shirt, and I go like this to him, and he goes. <laughs> so anyway, that, that that's my little thing there. But Terrence, what a guitar player! Terrence, you're hanging out with these guys. Yeah, and and even Cerrito, fucking six foot one, huge hands, and and dude, I mean. Terrence, there you gotta have you gotta have a fucking uh, how can I say that uh, a, a kick a, a sidekick to fucking follow him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I I remember I was on the fucking couch watching these guys play. Blew my fucking mind. Yeah, it just jaw on the floor, right? And I mean, I saw Death Live. I saw Marvin Angel on uh, Blessed Are the Sick. Blew my mind. But Suffo was something really new and really out of the box for the time and very special and even today i mean they have their fucking fingerprint you know what i'm saying it's yeah they have a very distinct sound and that new oh, yeah. york that that e they don't sound like most other uh, they definitely uh, don't sound like and the, this sound is fucking terence's hands yeah i think you're right i believe it's you're that, right you know the way he palm mute the 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 the, the he picks so fast, but it's 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 him. It's his it's his fingerprint. Yeah, you know, yep, as I a agree. composer, you know. I agree. Yeah. So, so to to make a story short, hang out with them, blah blah blah. Come back to Montreal, and we have a show at Fofun with Dead Horse. We play that that night, and I, and I, and I'm telling to the guys, I said, guys, I went to see Suffocation uh, rehearse. I mean got to step up my game here i mean so that's it, what affected you for erosion then that's why erosion sounds like this because I, I went into very fast picking very technical it's because of that particular evening i already had effigy i could listen to but watching them seeing it live seeing it live blew my mind yeah. blew my fucking mind and i really stepped up my game as as as, as a more Yes, yes, as a writer, uh, you know, for music, but more as a, as a guitar player. As a guitar player. No, I don't see myself. This these are my best year as a guitar player. Because me, if you ask me, uh, if I don't if I don't write a record, I don't play guitar for the sake of playing guitar. Uh, I much. see. I hear you. Mm -hmm. So, but me, I'm not in the same league as when you see guys like uh, Kev, when you see Terrence. When you see uh, 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 Max, Ruben, or Bobby, Max or Bobby or Max, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not even close because me, I'm not in the same spirit for the, I'm not in love with playing guitar. Me, hey, you're, not a, you're not a wanker. You're not a wanker. I get no, it. Me, I'm more attracted by composition and my tool to express it in metal would be guitar. The guitar. But, so my point is if I don't have any idea, to write new songs. I'm not going to sit down and just play guitar 
just because I love playing guitar. I mean, it's kind of a, not a burden to practice. It's kind of growing back on me since we did the Philly show oh, and yeah. getting ready for the show. But the years that I wrote Erosion were the best year for me as a guitar player. Okay, that's, that's well put. Let me, uh, I got a question here from a couple guys are asking questions. I don't want to, I don't want to avoid them. So question for Luke, have you ever heard of the band Depravity from Finland? If not, Check out the album Silence of the Centuries, 93. Okay. The you know name it? rings a bell, but I don't know the record. Okay, so that's Depravity. I'll send this to you privately when we're done, then I'll send you okay. uh, the info. There's another one here. Um, ask Luke how you learned to growl. That's a good question. How'd you learn to growl? Yeah, it's a good question, too, because uh, it, it's really... It's really instinctive, you know. Uh, See, yeah. I cannot growl. I can sing and sang. But, I have a I have a Lane Staley like voice. Yeah, so I tried to do de do death metal, Luke, and I can't do it. I don't have the power. But the growl, metal. the growl didn't didn't came by overnight. It it took a while. But to be comfortable, let's say to play a show and have a conversation and not being fucking uh, throat wrecked, you know. Yeah. That's uh, the thing. There's a way I think I push more with my uh, my uh, how do you call that diaphragm? Yes, diaphragm and stomach uh, and, and throat would be the filter to give the color. But I, I'm not gonna push with throat. You know, yeah, you're not a throat voice. It's more no, 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 no. It's down exactly. here. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But it took a while. It's very weird to explain. But of course, it's like anything. It's like when you write music and you form a band. You start by playing songs from the artists that you like. We we exactly. we learn by imitation, sure, by mimic. So yeah. my 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 singing is the same way. I wanted to sing like Chuck. I wanted to sing like Tardy. I wanted to sing like David Vincent. These were my main influence. Even today, I mean Vincent. You listen to Vincent on Ultimas. It's fucking killer. But here's the thing, you definitely don't sound like Chuck. Okay. Chuck had that shrieky kind of that there was a, a very unique vibe to his. Yeah, voice. but he, he went more high pitch on the later record. But to me, me, I like his voice. Oh, Let's say spiritual, first leprosy. Yeah, yeah, the first two in particular. Okay. Um, Tardy has that, man, John Tardy just has that pain. He's in pain, literally. It's yeah. just. Nobody sounds like him at all. And another vocalist, uh, I like uh, uh, Ackerfeld, but in Bloodbath. Mm. You know, on Blessing the Purity, this EP, Ackerfeld's yep. vocals on this. You know what? Mind blowing. And you know, my to me, Ackerfeld's finest vocal performance was not on an Opeth album or on a Bloodbath album. It was on a Catatonia album. Brave Murder Day is what fucking... Huh? What record? Brave Murder Day? I don't know this one. What? It's one of the earliest one. Luke! You I know I know more the later, Catatonia. You do not know Ca Brave Murder Day? I know. You know, me, I started to listen more into the, uh, more uh, with Dead Ed Kings and a few records. Be but to me, Dead Ed uh, Kings and to now... Uh, uh, I mean, like the latest one, it's fucking mastery. It's, it's the amazing. latest one is fucking incredible. It's an incredible. But, Luke, you must listen to me here now. When we're done tomorrow, <laughs> I'm going to send you the link, okay? I need, I need a short list here. You must, must, must. And I think people will back me up on this. You must hear Ackerfeld. I didn't know Ackerfeld sang on a Catatonia. Yeah. Um, uh, Jonas, Jonas sings the... That's when Jonas went. He shredded his voice on uh, Dance of December. He couldn't do the death vocals anymore. So they brought in, you know, him and Michael are. Yeah, yeah, they're buddies. good buddies. Yeah. So they brought in Michael to do the death vocals. I am telling you right now, it is. It's a masterpiece, that album. It's a fucking masterpiece. But me, me on Opeth, the, my favorite uh, Michael uh, death metal voice is, uh, to me, even on the Opeth record, uh, Watershed, It's I think it's on my... I, I heard you say that, and it's interesting. It's it is, but it's interesting because... And the production, it's it's amazing production. Oh, it's it is. It's, uh, it's stunning. But for me, that's um, fascination. Um 
what's his name? Uh, yeah, 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 Jan's uh, Bogren. Bogren, Bogren, right, right. Okay. Um, I still, you know, for me, the de- the bridge into death metal was because of my relationship with Stephen Wilson that I developed in 99 and got very friendly with. He sent me one day, I was sending him Frontline Assembly. Do you know who that is, Frontline yeah, Assembly? Yeah. Okay, and Skinny Puppy. I was kind of turning yeah. him on. More, more the, techno, a Canadian techno, techno. industrial. Yeah. I got him turned on to that. And, you know, the vocals on there are very processed and deep and haunting and stuff. And here he says, you got to check out Blackwater Park. And I'm like, nah, man, that death metal shit, I cannot get it. This is 2001, Luke, okay? I'm like, I cannot get into the vocals, dude. The, the music's cool. But because I tried, I tried, I tried Domination. Or, um, Morbid so- Angel? Now, now, yeah, Morbid Angels Altars. I tried. Oh, um, oh no, you mean Opeth? You mean uh, no, 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 no. I'm talking about the, the Florida guys. I tried Obituary slowly. I tried. Um, what's uh, what's the first um, Deicide? Um, first Deicide album. Legion is second. Legion. What's the first? What's the first uh, fucking Deicide? Yeah, I'm sorry. What is it? Come on, I, can't. <laughs> I don't remember. Anyway, anyway the first DSI. Yeah, Glenn like, Benton's. Yeah. I, I can't do these fucking vocals, right? And he's like, but you listen to this frontline assembly stuff, and the vocals are all mean and evil processed on there, and you like that. And I'm like, oh, he's right. That's weird. He got me to reframe my thinking about yeah. it. And I started listening to oh DSI's self-title is DSI. Okay. Yeah, it's um, it's it's self-title. Yeah. So I started listening to Blackwater Park, and within two listens, I'm like, oh, shit. What was I missing here? Now, Opeth were quite a different band than a lot of the early Florida death metal. They had influence there, but they had that progressive thing going yeah, on. And that yeah. cra- And Michael's one of the greatest songwriters in the of ever, ever. I mean, it's that simple. And then you got a guy like Steve, who I have a lot of, you know, love for and a lot of admiration for what he's done and that was a perfect storm and then i started going back into all these bands and going yeah. oh so that's how i got into gorgots in like 2003 2004 but, but you know what there's nothing wrong to go backward in a discography you know i heard that saying once on the book uh, chronicle on radio uh, 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 the host would say hey to his uh, 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 to his guest he would say he would ask Hey, have you read this book? And the other person would say no. And then he goes like, "Man, you're so lucky. Why is that? Because you can still discover it, you know." So that's a way of seeing it. Sure. So, so it's not because you haven't heard it when it came out. There's something wrong with it. Hey, better late than never, right? Exactly. I mean, that's the so that's what sure. art is about to me, you know. It's so, like a film or, or whatever, you know. So, so the one thing when we leave this, you must we have to. After we get done, you're going to stay on, and I'm going to recollect my thoughts. You are going to listen to Brave Murder Day, and you are going to tell me what you think because I think you're going to be mind blown by it. But okay, so we're we're back. Okay, so you're you're now writing and affected by the suffocation. Yeah, and writing erosion, and you're writing erosion, and you get, you get to that point, and you start working on that, and the lineup stays the same for that yep. album, correct? Okay. Yeah. Um, and there's a. I love Considered Dead, but Erosion, something about that album, they're right away, you're like, whoa, this is this is a different vibe. You're, you're getting technical. There's a lot more really spidery, complex riffs that are going on in there. Well, it's more technical. Yeah. For sure. And you go back to, no, you don't go back to Morrison. You actually record in Montreal, right? Montreal. It's the so first time. So talk about that. It's, so uh, it's called Victor Studio. Um, uh, so, uh, I knew about this place because I, I think, I think, I think, uh, Shannon O'Connor at some point came to Montreal to record vocals there because I've seen documentary about the studio that they had this wonderful acoustic, you know, I get, it's like most of studio. They have studio A and studio B, but right. studio A, it's like the big guy yep. and the more expensive, but yep. they have like this room. It's a place where they used to build RCA gramophones. Okay. And artists would go there to record 
music for R C the label RCA Victor. Yes, whatever. yes, Victor, Victor, Victrola, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's why it's called Victor Studio. And then, uh, so so uh, one day I decided to go uh, uh, to go check the place, and uh, and it's in the budget. We can go uh, record there. And I asked Monty, I wanted to have Pierre to record Erosion. He said, yeah, but Pierre, he didn't do uh, many records yet. And, but, but dude, he engineered the Oblivion record and, and he had been the uh, nemesis and it sounded great, you know. But he said, no, uh, uh, Monty wanted more like a, a name to produce the record. So his first pick was a, was a guy, I think it, it was Steve Evett. We need to check that. Steve Evett, he did some of the Suicide Silence early records. But back in the days, I think he was the guy that did the Demolition Hammer record. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like their second one. And I really liked the production on that record. So it was Monty's first pick. And I don't remember why it was a scheduled thing, but it, it, didn't, it didn't work. And then uh, there was Colin Richardson in England. Yeah, started his name was Carcass, Carcass and yeah, yeah. I he, but I think back then he had worked with Napal. No, right. yeah, he did. Yes, he yeah. did. Yeah. So it was more like uh, uh, oh, what, 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 what Napalm record? Anyway, we're talking ninety-two ish, ninety-one, ninety-two. Yeah. So Collins mm -hmm. Richardson's in the picture, and he's got this sound, which which is fucking amazing for extreme music and different, more European. Because they wanted to get away from that Morrison aesthetic. Right. I mean, nothing wrong with it, but at, at some point, there's too much sugar in the coffee. You know, it's exactly. like everybody... yeah, too much, too many homogenized sounds. Exactly. Right, right. And, and it's coming. I mean, no, no bad word on, on Scott or, 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 or the, 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 Mor the Morris brothers. But I mean, uh, it, it becomes kind of a, a cookie cutter thing, you know? Right. Uh, let me ask you this real quick, though, before we jump into that. Do you remember your budgets for these albums? Oh, yeah, you have the question. I think, uh, considered, we had like nine-ish thousand dollars. Okay. And uh, Erosion was a, was a bit more. It, it was more than considered, but I can't remember exactly. Yet. Did they help you with tour support for either of those? Or Yeah, they helped us for, for the first U.S. tour a bit, you know, uh, to, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But that's all you did on Consider. You just did one tour, right? Yeah, we did, we didn't tour for Erosion. But no, I mean, no, it's not true. We we didn't tour the states. You went to Europe, right, with Blast? Exactly. Week? But but just to finish on the recording, so we we go to uh, to Victor Studio, and then uh, Monty uh, uh, bring this name of uh, his name is Steve Harris. But not the, the, the maiden not guy. Not Steve Harris, uh, yeah. So the Steve not Harris, Harris because Harris. he was an assistant to Colin Richardson, I believe, on a Fear Factory record or something. Because Colin Richardson did... Uh, uh, Soul uh, of a New Machine. New Machine and blah, blah, blah. And Steve Harris was kind of in the ballpark. Uh, so around. He, was an, he was an engineer primarily? Well, like an assistant or something. Yeah. yeah okay. So he said, oh, so he did good work with, with Richardson. So uh, he'll be your guy. So we flew in from England. So he's the one that engineered the uh, uh, erosion. Right. But we had two weeks in the studio. We took one week to record all the tracks and one week from mixing. But the thing is that, dude, we were like, middle of summer like august very nice weather and everything and then harris get the fucking worst flu ever and he's sneezing and sneezing oh, and he's feeling like shit but all capital letters you know the yeah. worst and he's always a tomb tomb and he's not there i mean i mean he's got work to do but dude he would be the only thing he was thinking be at the hotel and take a fucking nap you know yeah 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 <laughs> Yeah. So, so we ended up mixing the record, and then we sent this to Monty, and Monty's like, nah, I don't know. It didn't sound good. Really? No, the mix didn't sound right. But I mean, again, Steve was feeling like crap. Dude, dude, I mixed a bit here, some of my orchestral, and mixing are fucking big shoes to step in. You know, yeah, it's it very is, intimidating yep. to me and everything. So, 
I'm not saying sharp. he wasn't a good end. I'm yeah, sorry. You got to be sharp. You got to be sharp. Exactly. You got to be sharp. And I mean, it's not something you do when you get a fucking flu or you don't feel right, you know? So uh, Monty said, you know what? We're going to send the reels to uh, Richardson in England. And he remixed the Rosen. So the mix that right. we're listening today is Richardson's. Ah, uh, so good. So yeah. good. Uh, my buddy Jimmy here, man. This guy. I love this guy, Jimmy, uh, from Future Ruins. He's a huge fan. I was actually going to have him come in, but I knew you and I would be geeking out too much for him to get a word in. So, um, Jimmy, I love you, buddy. Uh, Luke, say hi to Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Jimmy. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, this album is, you know, I love considered. Well, you saw. You saw. Jimmy was one of the guys that I did the uh, the deep dive with. He was one of the other guys. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, so um, he he's a longtime fan, and both of us really love this album. Okay, I mean it's there's something about this album that really was a step up in all facets. Okay, yeah. not that not that I don't like Consider because I really do, um, but it's a great album. So um, you did you write primarily most of that album yourself, or did yeah 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 okay. even considered. We did. I mean, we were doing all the arrangements together, but mainly I was the main composer. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um. So the '90s come in now. We're in the early '90s, and we know what happens next. We know the yeah. Town Gardens and the Alice in Chains. Exactly. Those bands, oh. I fuck, both bands I love unabashedly. Love those bands. Yeah. Pearl Jam, Nirvana, all that stuff. I'm not as big a fan of those bands. But they come in and it changes the complexion of metal. It kills hair metal, and it kind of, sort of, kind of, not kills, but it it suffocates, <laughs> to use a term, the death metal and extreme metal thing because it was not the thing to do. Totally. I mean, I mean, uh, what, what, uh, like death metal? Can we say that wasn't like flavor of the month anymore or something? Right. Right. So, and so, so, what happened? So what happens to you? Yeah, so uh, even uh, and even erosion was kind of delayed because Roadrunner kind of wanted to restructure it or they, they had something. And so uh, erosion, let's say, was supposed to come out uh, in the fall, but was delayed to like January or uh, February or something. But in the meantime, Stefan, the drummer, and Sylvain wasn't uh they they not they, they kind of needed a break from the band their heart wasn't much into it anymore for a while and uh, and also uh, after we came back from the studio uh, uh, we decided that uh, you know uh, we we parted ways uh, with Eric the bass player mm -hmm. and I wanted to have Steve Cloutier which was bass player with Provencher when they first had the Damage Band. You remember the band that I really wanted to join with Frank at the very beginning that I yes. told you about? Yes, yes. He was the bass player with Frank. Okay. So I said to Stefan, and they were kind of high school friends, I said, Cloutier is very is more technical, so I would really like to have him in the band. So Cloutier was still in Quebec City. So he left Quebec City and moved to Sherbrooke, and he joined and learned uh, erosion. And so we had jams with uh, Sylvain, Cloutier, right. Steve, and uh, and Provencher and Stéphane on drums. And dude, and and we signed, we sounded, uh, we 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 had a better sound with with Cloutier for the erosion stuff. So. Mm -hmm. The thing is, Cloutier just got in the band. He learns the shit. And not long after, in the Everybody same week, in the quits. same week, Stefan and Sylvain, they decide to fucking quit the band. So it's just you, you're left with you and the bass player. Yeah. And Cloutier <laughs> goes like, what the fuck, man? I just fucking moved here, learned the stuff. I uh, said, I know, man. And I was like uh, speechless. I didn't know. So, so it was like the first time we had like big personal, uh, like issues, uh, mem members leaving. Issues, yeah, issues. Lineup issues, so to speak. Well, so now is this before you went to Europe or after? Yeah, but check it oh, out. So how so do you he, go about pulling in? You leave the band? Yeah, you pull in the new guys then. And that yeah, is you leave the band January-ish, February. And yeah, let's say February. 
And then I get this letter in the mail, not even a phone call. I get this letter that, uh, hey, dude, uh, we have a tour for you in Europe. And you're like, God, I'm not, we're not going to miss this. But I'm only left with the, with, with the bass player. <laughs> so Big Steve, Hurdle, and myself, we're very good buddies. And we're hanging out all the time, listening to music. And, and Steve had his band Purulence with 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 uh with the another drummer which is the first drummer that i played with before joining with stefan so we were all this little, little circle of friends little circle of friends everybody played with every, every we all knew everybody right. and, uh, anyway right and i said to big steve i said uh dude you want to join we're going to europe and then when it's a month and when you come back you just go back to your band he said fine and then we had this younger, this youngster drummer, which was very good, that did audition. Dude, he could play the song, no problem, but he was so nervous to go to Europe and perform and do a tour. So he, he learned like three songs and he said, guys, I can't do it uh, emotionally. I'm too stressed out. And yeah. I'm not gonna... I said, dude, you're great. Relax. You know? No, no, no. So he decided not to, not to do it. But it's fucking one to midnight now. It's what was his name? Now. What was his name? Keith? So what's that? What was his name? The young. His girl? name was uh, Gislain uh, Fecto. Okay. But he had another band in the area. Anyway. He just felt more comfortable staying. Exactly. Here. He wasn't ready for the the tour. The big, the big tour, yeah. So, but the thing is so weird. There's no internet, no Facebook, no no nothing. Exactly. Out of the blue, I get this phone call from this drummer from quebec city me i never hang out in quebec city i don't know the music scene and i don't know the bands in quebec but cloutier lived there for many for a couple years so we knew more about the musicians there but quebec was more of a hardcore thrash crossover metal scene kind of okay sort of so there was this band called sadistic vision and uh, mcdonald the drummer that played on uh, that on on from wisdom but we wrote obscura together right he was playing in sadistic vision and and we get this phone call from this guy and he goes like hey i heard you need a drummer uh i can take the bus uh tomorrow or in two days and i'm gonna meet with you guys in sherbrooke and i, I can do it i said dude you better hurry up because me in the meantime i had contacted uh lee from monstrosity Lee Harrison mm -hmm. that played in Terrorizer on guitar, you know, and he, and I was big fan of monstrosity and Lee was really a very fast drummer oh, yeah, and, yeah. Lee, yeah. and Lee had agreed to do the erosion tour. So he started to listen to the music and I, uh, I was, uh, I think I already bought this plane ticket from Florida to fly to Quebec. <laughs> and then before Lee, let's say, let's say we're fucking, we're fucking Tuesday. And Lee should take a fly on Thursday. So we're Tuesday, and I get this call from McDonald. I said, dude, you, you, bet, you better come over. I have this guy from Florida coming up to play. Say, yeah, yeah no worry. I'm going to try. I'll be there tomorrow, Wednesday. First thing, no problem. Dude, well, so I go to the bus station. No fucking Steve McDonald. What, what the fuck? And with no, no phone, no nothing. Yeah, I'm right, just no waiting. Phone. And I was like uh, 15 minutes, 10 minutes walking from my place. And we were jamming in my apartment there. And I'm like, Tabarnak, I show up there. He's not there. I don't know what the fuck. And then he calls me during the day. He said, oh, I'm sorry. I kind of woke up late and I had to go to the pawn shop with my VCR. I didn't have any money. <laughs> Total punkish. Wow. You know, he said, I'm sorry, I'm kind of broke. I got to bring the VCR to the pawn shop to get a couple bucks to, to get a bus ticket. I said, dude, you better get your ass here. He said, yeah, I'll be there by the end of afternoon. So I get there by 4 o'clock. I said, I got to hear you because I got to cancel the fucking plane ticket for yeah, me. Yeah, right, right, right. You yeah. got to him off. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> so I remember, man, I go meet him at the at the bus station. He's got a symbol in a blanket. Total punkish you can get more yeah. punkish you know total Very diy punkish. right right exactly so we get we get we get to my place i had a drum kit rental that i had in the room and big steve's with me cloutier wasn't there i don't know why anyway and so big steve's with me mcdonald steps in 
So no warm up, no nothing. He gets on the kit. I said, play something. And dude, he plays fucking Fall from Grace, the opening song on Blessed Are the Sick. Yeah. So yeah. Big Steve and I are like, what the fuck? I never seen a, a, a drummer in my in my jamming room played like Sandoval. Le, those, yeah, like those feet, grindcore feet. blast beats, you know? Yeah, feet to feet, and, right? Yeah, and he was a one footer. Oh, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. He he went to two feet later, but he was a one footer. I'm like, ah, bah, that blowing my mind. And then, so Big Steve and I, we go in the kitchen. We look at each other. We say, what do we do? And he get he goes like, dude, this man can fucking play. I said, so that's all. That's all I wanted to hear. I just needed to to, to hear. Yeah, yeah. Just just get me over the edge. Exactly. So I called Lee. I said, dude, we have our man here. Thanks. You know, sorry, sorry yeah. but whatever. No hard feelings. Whatever. So McDonald stayed on my apartment, and me, I was uh, I was uh, at my girlfriend's place in those uh, days. You know. So I would go at the app. So what we did, Cloutier knew all the songs. So what we did in the morning, I would go at Big Steve's apartment. Let's say I would show him uh, Orphans of Sickness, all the mm -hmm. riffs, you know, and then Big Steve would learn all the riffs, no tabs, no nothing, just one-on-one -on -one, uh, showing, you know. So Big Steve learns all the riffs, fine. In the afternoon, I go to my place. I show all the song. I get all the song together, structure and beat to with uh, McDonald. I say their name because they're all Steves, you know. Yeah, no, it's, it's like the, the pack of Steves. Exactly. So, hey, what's, what's this, your band's name? Oh, this is Steve. My other yeah, Steve. Steve my yeah, other there was this Steve. joke. I was going to change my name to Steve at some point. You know? Steve, Steve, and Steve. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so in the afternoon, I'll get the song together with McDonald's, and in the evening. We would jam as a four piece. Right. So we were getting one song a day. And now, this is the erosion stuff, right? Yeah. They were fucking nailing it. And then you go over, you go over uh, seas then and do this tour? Yeah. But the thing is, they learn one song a day and That's we crazy. get to, and we get to play the set like two days, not more, two, three days. And then we fly to Europe. Right. To play the show but check it out we had like many transfer to do to get to uh frankfurt right we're in boston waiting in line and mcdonald goes dude like what i forgot my bass drum pedals what? <laughs> so you get the guy you know gotta sell my vcr for yeah for he's a little, little bit haphazard right oh man so and we were paid like 300 bucks to do the whole tour so the the the, the tour pay went to buy fucking bass drum pedals when we got to church so you guys made no money you just uh you got to play yeah yeah which that's death metal that's a death metal thing right you know and i mean this is so great memories you know yeah yeah and, and dude i remember when we finished the first show where i was like yes we fucking nailed it and we played so well we played very and we had we we sounded very good together even after a short time right right together so we how, do the how many tour. shows did you do do you remember? i'm sorry how many shows did you do uh, on that european tour uh, it was a uh, 15. no more than that it was a oh. month thing it was oh, always it was a, okay. 25. okay a long tour then okay got it 28. Right. It was nice, dude. Got to meet the guys from Both Roar. They came oh. at the show in Birmingham. Nice. Got to meet the guys from Atrocity in Germany. I was a big fan of uh, Hallucination and uh, and Longing for Death from Atrocity. So I was so hyped up to meet them, you know? How, how well attended were the shows? Were they... Oh, uh, nobody. Like nobody. Uh, five people, ten people, oh, you know? Geez. Miserable. Yeah. But... But you know, I'm, I'm, but you're in Europe. You're playing music and man, you get to see things you might never you get, get to see. You get it was the first experience that you get to see the world yeah. with your craft. I mean, yeah. that's what matters at the end yep. of the day. You know, one hundred percent, one hundred percent, exactly. So, so when we, you come back, though, what? But you so get we drunk, came back from right? the tour. 
and we agreed that uh, we mutually agreed that uh, McDonald would stay in the band for sure. Right. So we started to work on some stuff because me, I had like a one, two songs done. It was really erosion style, you know, um, uh, that was written uh, before we went for that tour. So we we worked on that. Big Steve went back to Purulence because it was his project, you know, his band. Right. And I remember one day because Purulence were jamming upstairs my apartment. Oh, okay. And so one day uh sebastian the guitar player came uh, walked in uh, my uh, my kitchen and we were, we were having a beer you know it was daytime whatever and i go like what's up man and he was totally shit faced i said what the fuck and he was so very bummed you know I said what the fuck I said yeah man there's bad news I said what the fuck he said big steve uh big steve's gonna leave and uh, come play with you guys okay so he's the one that told us that the big steve would leave his own band yeah that's interesting yeah and because you didn't, uh, any, you didn't have any uh inkling that this might happen or no not at all i mean big steve and i were very good buddies we'd right. hang out all the time and smoke and listen to music and 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 talk you know and we were very very good friends right 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 and uh and and uh and i think uh and he told me you know he had a good experience touring and he, he was kind of bummed to go back in his old uh old shoes you know uh, i mean nothing wrong with the guys they were very good you know right. the boys that he was playing with but uh he I just wants his... he wanted something new yeah but me i didn't pull his leg and say hey man come on play with us and i never i never did that no i got you i got you no no was that, so it was a bit of a surprise to you then yeah i was like uh, i was surprised and i i, I was kind of bummed for his boys yeah. but i was very happy to play with my buddy too you know yeah so so, so you guys start to write obscura material exactly so we started to write obscura so but the thing is is that big steve and i and even cloutier cloutier he liked death metal but at home he wouldn't listen to death metal this much right. he would he was more a tool guy sound garden guy yeah 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 uh, he really liked uh, uh, typo negative guy. Uh, yes. Uh, Hurdle was more a uh, dead can dance guy. He would be, uh, he would be, he, he opened me to a lot of, he, he's the one that played me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember this DVD. Just, just did a special on them not, uh, yeah. a couple weeks ago. So Big Steve was dead can dance guy. He was neurosis guy. And he mm. was, he liked his morbid angel he liked his voivod me i would that's the year that i really started to get into shostakovich and more russian classical music okay and then in 93 that's when i started to play violin so my mind was totally into the band but i really switched to classical music that's when i wanted to start playing violin right right so i remember doing the first tour in europe i even brought my first violin and i in the afternoon i would be in the back room and very bad starting that's, you know that's so fucking metal to be doing yeah violin. dude dude I, I tell you you need good neighbors when you start learning violin yeah I bet. <laughs> it's, it's worse than a fucking annoying dog you know yes yes all. yes crying baby what's that noise um so you're 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 turning the cool thing about what you're saying here though is the four of you guys have very diverse tastes you're getting exactly. into all kind of stuff and that whole amalgam of all those things starts to affect what exactly. you want to do with your direction. Yeah. So, so what we did, we, uh, we, so I decided to, to, to get rid of the two songs that I worked on and we did like a, a kind of a verbal, uh, manifest, you know what a manifest is? It's no, sure, like, sure. But, yeah, like a, like a, this is what we're going to do. Exactly. So we did a manifest that, and these are the years that the uh, tomb of mutilated, you have suffocation, you have deicide. So you have the death metal thing. It's really implanted well. Sure. You know? but, so we decided that uh, if anybody that comes to rehearsal and have this million buck fucking riff, that sounds like, wow. But if it has fast picking like erosion or suffocation uh, it's not going to be in the song 
No Slayer beat anymore, like suffocation uh, or erosion. Yeah. Yeah. No. So it's it's whatever you want, but not those things. No more Slayer beat. No more fast picking. No more power chords. Done. No power chords. So if you listen to Obscura, there's octaves every here and there. Yeah. But there's no perfect fifth. There's no yeah, power chords. There's no fifths. You're right. There is. Yeah, there's yeah, no... Yeah. There's no Slayer beat. When I say Slayer beat, it's thrash beat. None of that. That's yeah, what that, emotion is all about. Yes, it's that. And uh, considered dead. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I had one question for you that's real important. Do you want to take a real break? Take a bathroom break quick, or are you good? No, I'm good. Oh, you're good. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you're working on this under this manifesto, and you are manifest, and you guys are creating. Did you know when you're creating this stuff that it's just very different from everything else? No, but the thing is that the manifest was important in the sense that artistically, if, check it out, if you want to reinvent yourself, but you don't paint yourself in the corner, let's say you want to build something different, but you're not allowed to use the tools that you use all year long. You're going to scratch your head and go like, what the fuck am I going to do now? But you got to be creative. You got to, ah, I found this new door that I can open here that I, yeah. I didn't know that I have, you yeah. know. But if you don't force yourself, my, I, and I've said that a million times in an interview, but that was a very important thing artistically for ourselves and my, myself to do. I'm telling from my experience, you know, the thing is that, my comfort zone as a death metal thinker, writer, player was to play fast picking, blast beats, this and that, all good, perfect. Right. I can write 20 records like this, no problem. You're right. But the thing is, is that before you have so a new character musically arriving in the music and say, hey, this is new, it might take. 10 songs, five songs before you find that little new thing. But if you do a personal manifest to say, you know what? I'm done with my comfort zone. I got to create a new comfort zone, which I don't know where the fuck I'm going to go. Yeah, no you're, idea. You're challenging yourself to do exactly. something different. Yeah. Because like I said, if Big Steve would come to the, the, the jam room and have this million buck riff, and it, but it has fast picking, we're not going to take it, but dude, it sounds fucking killer, but I'm sorry. Yeah. We can't take it, you well, know? Okay, so that's an important thing. You bring up Big Steve's name in regards to that. He had a lot to do with writing a lot of the Gorguts material. Of course. Right? And, and so there was a dynamic there that you saw that was important to... It's the first, it's, it's the first record that I had two strong songwriters with me. Okay. I'm not saying the other guys before. It's, it, it was a different, yeah. uh, a, a different uh, uh, synergy. But Big Steve was the main writer in his band, and Cloutier was writing a lot of material in his band as well. So it's the first time that I had two strong-headed composers along right. with me. You're right. So how, now we can debate on ideas. We do arrangement differently, you know? And I have to say that... That's kind of unique because if you look at a lot of the death metal bands around to this, you know, the, the, the big names, there's generally one or two guys that are doing a predominant amount of the writing. And it's just because they're stronger songwriters than everyone else, right? More, right. Some are more natural to do arrangements. Right. To, you but know, you've always been open. You've always seemingly been very open you know allowing what? Allowing other people to put creative input. You do that with Colin. You do that that with Kevin too. So exactly. But like when we wrote Obscura to me, just look at the credit. You don't see my name this often in the record. No, it's not. You're right. It's not. But the thing is that because of the manifest that we did. But I, I want to tell more about the pro the writing process. You're gonna yeah, see do why. It. Do it. So what we did is like, okay, so we agreed on the aesthetic. We don't know yet what it's going to be, but we know we know for sure what we can't do, but we don't know yet what we're going to do. Right. Know? So the, the deal was, okay, we take a week off 
to write riffs, every uh, each one uh, at our own place. And then next month, because at that time we were jamming five days a week, every oh, day. Oh, really? Okay, all right. Every day. Every afternoon. And even we had dinner together and jam in the evening as well. So we got very tight as a band, very... Yeah. Very, uh, that, that's locked, the way to go. Locked in. You're locked in. In sports, you want to be good in hockey, you got to fucking practice. Exactly. There's no magic. Uh, yep. Let me interject. So, let me interject one thing, though. Is this going on before you're dropped or during or after or what? When we came back from the European tour, I had a letter in, in the mailbox saying that we were dropped. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. I didn't say it when we, uh, anyway. Yeah. So you're now working so, on this material. Without even a record contract, but you yeah. you believe firmly in what you're doing, and you're oh yeah yeah right. Okay. So so we're taking a week off, everybody. So Cloutier is writing riff home. Big Steve's writing riffs home. I'm writing riffs on my place. So next Monday we get together. Hey, what do you got, dude? I had a good. I had, so you had a good week. Oh yeah. So Big Steve would play. Holy shit, dude. He had those riffs, you know. I mean, just, just listen to the songs. Yeah. Cloutier is the same. You know, you listen to uh, The Art of Somber Ecstasy. This is Cloutier. You yeah. listen to uh, Subtle Body. There's many Cloutier riffs in there. These okay. are great songs. Oh, yeah. You know? oh, yeah. So, so, but check it out. So, everybody would play their riff. And right away, and so, and, and then, first thing first, we didn't start putting the riff together. So what we would do, we would we would write a, a drum beat on each riffs first, independently. So we can just loop the riff on its own with a drum beat for 20 minutes if we want. Right, right. We can right. do that, but so it was a living thing on its own, you know, like a little, you know what I'm saying? Each riffs. So and then from there we say okay so we start writing and then right away we kind of pretty much knew what riff would make the song and we kept like two three uh three four riffs okay mm -hmm. and then all the riffs that didn't make the song but with what which was which could be fucking good riff we wouldn't even keep them and we start with a clean slate every time so we didn't have like a riff bank or something you know so every time, take a week off, everybody write some riff. Next Monday, come back. What do you got? But what's interesting is that, you know what? We, we were talking uh, like watching Terrence play. That's mm -hmm. an experience. Right. He's amazing, you know, when he plays. Yes. But the thing is, when we were uh, playing riffs to each other, at some point, what can how can I say that uh, uh, the right way is that let's say let's say you you wrote this new riff and you're a you're a very technical great guitar player and you play the riff and I'm like holy fucking shit but after ten minutes when I listen to it I mean it's great but I was blown away more by the technicality of it more than what more than the, the actual magic of the right. music right so what we decided to do. Is that we weren't allowed to look let's say big steve's got three four riffs so we didn't look at him when he played the riff and just listen wow and then, and then you're like how the fuck did you do that yeah plays the riff again can't figure out how he fucking played the thing and then you look at it and you're like oh come on it's super like minimalistic but it sounds like a wow you're huge, somewhere huge. yeah so this way we wouldn't take uh, uh we would take a compositional decision about how the riff is performed because we we didn't want to to have an opinion uh being uh blinded by oh wow it's super yeah. you understand what i'm saying because yeah are i mean different if, things. if i'm hearing you correctly it's kind of like the first time i heard eruption i'm like how can that be someone playing a guitar? You're you're like that's not possible. It's not, you know what I mean. It was so game changing at yeah. the time, and then you actually see it. And don't get me wrong, it's still one of the greatest guitars. It's super impressive. Time. 
But here's the thing. No, it's impressive. But here's the thing. If I'm hearing you right, it you hear it on the radio, or but then you see it, and it takes a little bit of the magic out of it in terms of you. Your vision of it when you're hearing it is different than when you're looking. You think at it's it. bigger than life, but yeah. once you see it perform, it's like, oh, okay. Oh. Oh, that's how he does it. Exactly. That kind of thing. But me, it's like a magic was, trick. It's like a magic yeah, trick. Yeah, exactly. But me, I was saying it more the other way around. Like, holy shit, this is amazing how you play that. But once you play it, the riff is like, nah, I don't know if I like it as much as when I heard it for the first time. <laughs> yeah, you right. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah. so totally by good. closing our eyes and not watching uh, about not knowing the trick and just yes. listen because at the end of the day, you're going to put your fucking headphone. You're not going to watch the record. Yeah, you're you're going to listen, until you go see you're gonna rock, listen right? to the record. <laughs> I got you. I got so you. we wanted to, 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 to prioritize this sense instead of this one, just to focus everything on here. Right. And that had a huge impact on taking decisions on what riff we keep and what, because it was music for the sake of music, you know. Now no matter is, if there, there's no like fucking fireworks in the riff or bells and whistles, and uh, you know what I'm saying? Oh no, I totally get it. Um, you know, obscure is a it's a dense record. It's dense. There's there's so many. Even though it's not layered, because I know it's not super layered. It's, it's unison. It's right, but it's it's dense in terms of. I'll be I'll be totally honest with you, Luke. When I first heard Obscure, I was like, and this is probably oh six oh seven, I think. So you know, it's pretty far removed, six or seven years, eight years since it came out. And I, I, all I was hearing was, "You got to hear Obscure. It's just so fucking out there." And that's true. Number one. Number two. I'm gonna be totally honest with you. I did not fucking get it at all. Yeah. First, but you know what? I heard it. But Obscura, dude, it lasts a fucking hour. But Obscura is an exhausting record. It's exhausting, but in a weird way. Here's what I found with Obscura, the truth, truth, total truth. I get about halfway through and I'm kind of like, my brain is overwhelmed with what's going on as a guitar player because I'm a guitar player, right? And I hear what's going on, and I'm like, I can't fully get my mind around what the hell is going on in here. But what I found as, what, with it was that I had to go back to it and keep – it's almost like I was mining for ore, right? I'm looking yeah. for gold. Yeah. And I kept going back in and trying to find the vein. And eventually, as you go in, you find that vein, and then you go, oh, here it is. Yeah. That said – I can only do Obscura every once in a while because it's that much of a mind fuck. You know what I mean? But but a lot of people told me, even Kev told me that. First time he listened to Obscura, he listened to the half of it and then take a break and then tomorrow the rest or whatever. You know? Exactly. That's and I and find fine. It's I fine. find I do that every time because it is a it's such a dense record and you get about 35. I get to clouded. And that's usually where I gotta go. I got to take a break. I can't, I can't do it all. And I'd have to go back and see what I said, but I'm pretty sure it's the same way. But I will tell you the first couple of times I listened to it, I was like, I don't know if I can ever listen to this again. <laughs> Truthfully. Yeah. But, but it's a like it or hate it record, you know? But No, I don't agree with that. And here's why. I think what happened with it is that it's so, it's such an enigma in metal that you almost have to go back to it and invest the time in it to get what's going on. And even then you may still not get what's going on. So like Marty says here, my buddy Marty from heavy metal, he says, obscure is a mind bending experience. Seeing you play that stuff live back then was equally amazing. All the tapping and volume swells, holy shit, brutal and beautiful piece of art. And I think that's right. It's, it's a piece of art. It's kind of like looking at, um, a Van Gogh, you know, the scream where it's like, it's, it's unsettling. It's yeah. unsettling inside. You're like, I don't, I don't know what to feel of this. It's kind of freaky, scary. But, but, but that's what art is about too. You know, it's there to create comfort. It's there to create discomfort also. 
and uh, it, 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 it to shake you, you know, which is fine. You know, we, we could be in a museum. You'll be in tears in front of a, of a painting and I'll be like, meh. So it's a uh, it's different thing for for different people as well. So it took five years for you to actually get in the studio and release this. Right. So, yeah, but the thing is, the, the thing is that we came back from the tour in uh, in uh, March at the end of March 93 for erosion. Right. Then Big Steve goes back in April to jam with Pure Lens. And let's say beginning of May, we're together. First song we wrote together was Rapturous Grief. That's the more like Morbid Angel-esque song. Right. And it took like three weeks to write. It took a long time to get together so we can, how can I say that? So we can uh, uh, put together a toolbox to write songs together. We never worked together. Right, 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 right. So, but, so that's the, the, the first song we wrote, and that's the one that took the most time. But after that, every song then took more than two or three days to write. We got together on Monday, play the riffs, choose which one we like. Next day, we write drum beats. Let's say on Wednesday, we start working on structure. First thing you know, on Thursday, song is finished. And dude, we haven't touched a corner this much from when we wrote them to when we recorded them. Now, are, so you, that, are you demoing these as you're going? Yeah, we demoed you them. You, okay, you can, right. We can hear these demos on the, on the internet. Okay. But the, the thing is that we wrote 10 songs. So at the end of 93... November 93, we had 10 songs written. We were jamming all, all week. That's all we did. Right. So not end, end of 93, beginning of 94, the album is done. Then 94 begins. I send demos. Nobody writes back. It's the grunge thing. And dude, you're sending demos, badly produced demos of fucking obscure songs. Yeah, 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 yeah. What what were you recording them on again? On an eight track, or were you? Yeah, the same kind of eight track that we did our first demo. Yeah, you're not at digital yet at this point. No, 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 right. no, no, no. So you get no response on this. No response. Blah blah blah. And you're so let, all... me ask, let me ask you this. And you've talked openly about this, and you can go into it whether you want to go into it in any way, shape, or form. You talked about substances, I believe. And were you guys smoking a lot of weed when you're writing this? Or are you using All the time. A... What's that? All the time. All the time. Okay. We were fucking baked as fuck all the time. But the thing is that we liked smoking our weed so much back then that even sometimes we were like, we're all broke and all that. And then we're like, let's say, hey, man, you got something to smoke? No. You? No. I said, man, my list is fucking because the, the dealer would mark would, would front dope to us, you know. Yeah. And I said, man, I hold him a hundred and fifty bucks already. It's like, ah, I mean, you want to go see him? No, not really. And sometimes when we didn't have any weed, uh, okay, see you tomorrow. So so we would just waste our time for an hour and a half, and then everybody just walk back home and but we'll so, tomorrow. So if I hear you though, I mean the weed was pretty stimulating for the uh, creativity. I mean, we like jamming baked so much. Even, dude, very often, <laughs> we didn't have, we were so poor. We didn't have any tuners, you know. I remember we would smoke weed with knives on the stove all the time, you know. And then we're like fucking baked. Okay, let's go jam. And then we're, oh, man, we should have tuned before smoking. We said that often. We're like, doo and you can't you can't hear the uh yeah i cannot luke I oh, can't man. i'm one of those guys that can't play when i'm high or drunk i just can't play at all um it's just one of those things i i it's interesting to talk to people that can because some people can really focus for me it's you know it's all over oh, man but i mean like today man i haven't smoked a joint in like 25 years about i mean i yeah. couldn't I, i'm sure i couldn't play a, I, I, I couldn't play uh, smoking anymore. Like, uh, But that's all you guys were using, pretty much just weed? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so you get – everything's done by the end of 94. 
You're getting no responses from many nope. labels. So no have- response. So we decide, what about we write some more music? Fine. And really spontaneously, Cloutier came with these riffs, and that was a nostalgia. So we wrote Nostalgia, and uh, right after, we wrote Obscura. So Obscura was the last song we wrote. So oh, that's why Obs- yeah. So that's why Obscura is like a resume of all that 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 trip, you know, that we did to to you know, if you listen to Art uh, to uh, Rapturous Grief, yeah, and listen, which was song one. And listen to Obscura, which was song 12. Now we develop a new language with all the restriction that we impose to ourselves. You know yeah, what I'm and saying? You, and you can hear on Obscura, you can s- sort of see what's going to happen with wisdom, from wisdom. You've got to... Yeah, but my way. point is, is that when you listen to Obscura, you can tell that we were able to create a new comfort zone to express ourselves as right. much as erosion was my previous comfort zone as a compositional language so to speak right you know what i'm saying yeah you've transitioned to a different level yeah but that did came uh, overnight it took like 12 songs to get there but yeah. if you listen to let's say uh, uh uh earthly love which is like a midpoint compositional you know we wrote right. this one maybe like in the middle of the process of the 12 okay. songs. So it's a, the, it's a continuum. It's a continuum. Yeah, and, but the thing is that we 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 were we found our zone, you know. But that's interesting. But if we would have never made that manifest, maybe it would have taken years to find like a weird sound, and we would have never get close to obscura. So you know what well, I'm saying? Is- so, how does things come about then that you actually get to record it and Olympic signs you and how did that all come about? We back in those days we didn't do much, you know. We played local shows and it, like once a year we always get this phone call to go play shows in uh, in Detroit, you know, in Michigan for uh, this woman. She was called Cindy. Her name was Metal Mom. She would put uh, she was just doing the Michigan Metal Fest back then, and she. She really liked us. And so we would drive to Michigan once a year and play there. And Chicago was one of the only city that would give a phone call and say, hey, uh, we have a show for you. So one very usual, like Sunday night, we play at that small club in Chicago called the, the Thirsty Whales. So we play there, good attendance. And uh, we're in the dressing room at the end of the show. And there's this guy, Marty, Marty Payne. That comes to us he said hey i really like your band and uh, i'd like to sign you guys and right away sending newton that's it and right away we said uh we said yes dude we, dude we waited five years yeah right yeah anything right yeah because uh, yeah because because the songs were done in 94 and the album came out in 98 98 right and 95 we moved the band in 95, we moved the band to Montreal. Montreal, right. Okay. And me, I was really into classical music. And I want to say something since I yeah. talk about classical music. You know this parallel that I heard many, many times, like in articles and reviews? Oh, Obscura sounds so weird, you know, because Luke is classically trained and he played violin. And this is so no untrue. And it's kind of sad and unrespectful for my, my, my bandmates. Yeah. Because... Obscura was fucking written and finished even when I entered conservatory. Before that, yeah. Before that. And people did this amalgam, which is, I mean, that's they didn't know better because these are the, the ints that they had. Right. But Obscura doesn't sound modern and weird because I studied classical music. Not at all. Because the classical music that I write has nothing to do with Obscura. Not at all. So it, I, I always thought that's why it's important for me to say it when I do interviews because it's to give justice to Big Steve and Cloutier for their composition skills. Yeah, yeah. Because they were very innovative, even more than myself. And me, I became really, we really inspired each other. I was other. just going to say, you guys inspired each other. Of course. To, to reach and then it becomes a fountain, a glass that always pour out, you know, yeah. because everybody, and you want to impress your buddies. You want to challenge your friends. Well, you know? talk real briefly about um, 
you brought up the conservatory. What what was going on there that you made that decision? Yeah, so the thing is that Mia, I already started playing violin and I right. was taking private lessons with teachers in Sherbrooke. And then I switched to viola because I kind of liked this better and I didn't lose all my tech my bowing technique from uh, violin uh, learning. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you yeah, know yeah. what viola yeah, yeah, yeah. is? It's like a violin, but uh, yeah. uh, bigger. Right. Yep. So then we moved to Montreal in 95. And I get a private teacher there for maybe two months during the summer. And then uh, uh, during the summer, I take this bag, bike ride. And then I find this school, which I was ordering music theory books from. And I find this school in Montreal. So I went there to ask if I can study there. They said, no, we're full for the year. I said, no, I really want to, I really want. And I was, again, I was too enthusiastic, you know. Hey, I really want to do it. No, sir, we're, 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 we're full. We have no more room for an extra student. I said, please. I said, I already wrote a string quartet on my own. I'm really passionate about it. She goes like, hey, she kind of got rid of me. She called this, the, the, the next floor, hey, I have this guy in my office. You want to make him? Uh, you you want you want him to? Can can you make it? Well, can you give him an exam? You know, can 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 he can he make a music test in one of your class? You know, just so uh, she kind of get out. Yeah, she thought maybe <laughs> that she could brush you off. Yeah, 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 yeah. He'll make an exam, and we'll we'll be done with him. Right, so right. I got like eighty something percent. So so they were kind of stuck with me. They had to. Hey, admit Marty me. says Sandy Newton medal. Yeah, on. Sandy Newton. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly. Yeah. Um. So you go to the conservatory. How long were you there? No, but that 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 was a different school. So I oh, went okay. to study. I went to study viola there for one year. Okay. But at the mid, uh, at the, after the the the, the fall the the, the fall uh, uh, session trimester, I said I went to to see the director. I said, you know what, I, my my heart is more into composition than you know. Learn. I mean, I, I I was getting pretty good at viola. I started to play some chamber music with other people and blah right. blah blah. And uh, I said, uh, my, my, my mind is more, I, I really want to learn composition, you know, with all the, the, the uh, counterpoint, harmony. I want to study. Uh, I want to learn uh, orchestration, uh, everything, you know, the whole composition nine yards. Sure, sure. But then they, they weren't teaching that. Uh, so how, they, old, how old are you now, Luke? Are you I'm, your, uh, this is 95. Born 71, so About I must be 25, 24. 20, oh, yeah, exactly. So that's when I went back to school at this school after high school. Right. So now did you, uh, did you finish, so they said, you know, I'm sorry. Did you finish your degree there? Did you get a degree? No, 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 no. But the okay. thing is, check it out. So they said, you know what? Don't go. You know, we, we like you here. You're doing good. But we don't we don't have a composition here. But what we're gonna do? Don't 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 tell that to anyone. <laughs> they had this because they were they were joined. They were next to uh, a, a a religious monastery monastery, mm -hmm. and there were nuns there, and they were all like piano teacher dude in their eighties or something. Right. And one of the nuns, uh, she was a composer, and and, wow. and she she played violin. Nicest woman that I met in my life, so influential for me. And uh, what they did, because they didn't have that in their program. They said, we're going to give you music analysis uh, credit, but you're going to have writing composition classes with uh, uh, with none. Uh, she was called uh, Marguerite, Sir Jacques. Okay. So, dude, she taught me, she teach me two, two voices counterpoint. Counterpoint, she, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she teach me uh, four voices harmony, like choral, choir writing. Mm -hmm. And dude, I was binge, 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 binge writing all the time, all the time. So when I decided to leave the school and quit playing viola, I played viola a bit, but not much after. So I went to do the exam to music conservatory in composition. I got admitted there and... I was uh, I was in last year of 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 of, uh, of uh, writing technique because because right. the nun taught me so good that I didn't I didn't have to do like three years of 
of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, four voices counterpoint and yeah. everything. So it was. So you uh, actually tested out of it in a way. Exactly, because you need to do tests for writing. You do right. tests for sight reading. You do tests for choir. You do, of course, you're there for composition, but you got to sing in choir. You got to sing. You got to do many things. You know. Wow. Wow. So uh, yeah, but dude, so did, how, did, long did, you, how long did you do all that total? Three years. Three years. So and, first year. So and and the band was kind of quiet. And my mind say, was you weren't, you weren't doing a lot with them. You weren't no, because we didn't have a deal. We didn't have yeah. a record deal yet. We were practicing. We were still practicing obscura and not writing much. So conservatory first year, I wrote the string trio. Not the one that you can hear on YouTube. That's another one that okay. wasn't recorded. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so I wrote this second year. I I wrote a flute concerto with chamber orchestra. And uh, and the third year, I wrote a violin sonata, which was the Canadian piece for a master's exam for one of the violinists, which was doing master's exam in wow. violin. And they had to perform a Canadian piece at their exam. But the thing is that the repertoire was kind of narrow. So you, they ended up playing from one student to another the same pieces since repertoire was kind of narrow. I said, hey. Uh, I can write a piece for you, so that's what I did. So it was, it was. So she performed the my piece at her exam in Quebec City. Well, let me so, ask you this: Are you during this period of time? Are you working odd jobs? Are you working, or how you how you? Spend? No, I'm full time school, full time okay. school, and jamming every now and then. But so I'm, I'm not involved. You're living with your girlfriend, or I'm sorry. Are you living by yourself or with your girlfriend? Or I'm living or? by. I'm living with Cloutier. Okay. For four years. And during those years, then we go play to Chicago. We meet Marty at Olympic. And, and during the summer of my second year of conservatory, we record Obscura. And and you did that where? At that same studio, Victor? At, yeah, we went at Studio Victor because I found a loft in yeah. the same neighborhood. Because Studio Victor was the only neighborhood that I knew well in Montreal. Right. Because we did erosion there couple years before you know well, let me ask you this was the move to montreal what was the what was the reason for that for all was it to try to make the band connect somewhere or what no no the thing is is that the uh, mcdonald and cloutier they had lived in montreal before and they were more city big city people and they were right. kind of bored of living in sherbrooke which was more like a small college town right. it's university town and then, but they, they were kind of bored of living there. But Big Steve and I were from the area, right? So, so we got some kind of big argument, you know. The way the day that the that McDonald and Coutier brought that to the rehearsing room, they say, Hey guys, you know what? Uh, we're two people here that really want to move to Montreal. And Big Steve and I, we didn't like Montreal much. We're like, What the fuck? We yeah. like it here, yeah. And then we're like, hey, they did the move. They came here for a couple of years. So yeah, we should go there. We should go there. And right. you know what? At the end of the day, I don't regret it because I met so many influential people for the classical music scene for me. Right. Even a guy which is a conductor, which we still very good friends today. He got to conduct some of my work. Well, as an aside, Luke, then... Do you actually have material that you've recorded that are on recordings that are classical? Yes. I'm not talking about the one that's on Colored Sands. I'm talking about other extraneous. No, no, no. But on the internet, you can listen to a performance on YouTube about a second string trio Okay. that I wrote uh, like uh, maybe three, four years ago. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, I checked that out a while ago. But Yeah, because I, I was invited for a uh, composer's forum at uh, Bishop's University, which is in the uh, English community university in Sherbrooke. And uh, Shikwan that builds my guitar is very good friend with the composer that teaches the, at that university. Okay. So we got to meet each other and became good. We, we, we have good conversation and right, we, right. we appreciate. And I got some private lesson with mcdonald he's a mcdonald as well uh andrew mcdonald very very famous canadian composer so right now what i think i've understood about canada and that area of canada is 
everybody's name Steve and everybody's name McDonald is their last. <laughs> so, yeah, right. <laughs> all right, so let's let's move on because I don't want to keep you here eighteen okay. hours. Okay, I'm um, having a good time. No worries. Let's look at um, when you do get signed and you do get this album recorded. It comes out on um, Olympic. Is that the label? I think Olympic, right? Okay. Yeah. And this is the guy that saw you in Detroit and want, right? Wanted to sign. He saw you? us in Chicago. Oh, Chicago. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. So you get, I guess I'm assuming you get enough to at least get the, the thing recorded. And that's 98. We're still talking tape yet, right? Yeah. We're, we're two inch uh, tape. Two inch tape. Okay. Um, that album comes out in 98 and kind of turns the extreme metal on its axis. I mean, it just, it, like you said, it's very polarizing. Either you love it or you hate it, or you're like me and you kind of hated it, but now you love it. <laughs> I think that's the best way to put it. Right. So what happens as far as touring promotion, what, what follows? Then Marty is good. He's good friend with uh, with another guy, which I don't remember his name, but he's got a little booking agency in Chicago. And he uh, he set up a, the, the first tour for Obscura, which was with uh, Oppressor, uh, a Cryptopsy, a Nile, and uh, and us. So we did the tour. Uh, we did the tour uh, for Obscura. That was the first tour. Then a couple months later, we do another tour. There's Cryptopsy again, Divine Empire, which is uh, Jason from uh, Malevolent Creation. Derek Roddy that played in Hate Eternal after that, and uh, GP another guitar player. So yeah, there was that. Um, a B C D saw Gorguts with the three Steves with Vader and Divine Empire back in '99. Yeah, that's another tour that we did. Uh, so you did a you did a fair amount of touring with Obscura then. Yeah, we and did like was three it? tours. But we didn't go to Europe for. The I was going to say it was all though in the states and Canada, right? Yeah. Did you yeah. ever go? Did you ever get down to South America? We we went to South America for the first time in two thousand sixteen. Okay, 15? so it was with the current in incarnation. Yeah, 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 yeah. With colored sands. Right, right, right. Okay, so. Um, I just want to read one note here. I'm sorry, I'm old, so I got a jack. No worries. My memory. Um, what happened with Steve McDonald and the recording of of Obscura as far as because you didn't? Yeah, but the, the, the thing is, I check it out. Yeah, I, I was living with Cloutier. Uh, we're roommate, and uh, Big Steve and McDonald's were living together in some other part of the city, eastern part of the city, and one day. Big Steve's uh, come uh, back from work, and uh, he sees that uh, McDonald just left. No notice, nothing. He went back to Quebec City. Done. Bye. Wow. Like just this. Just flaked out like that. Yeah. And we're like, what the fuck? And uh, for some reason, we didn't get to speak to each other. We couldn't get a hold of him. He just left. And me, I'm in school, so I said, you know what? My mind wasn't much into the band. We weren't right. doing anything. Right. So I put the we put the ad look at Gorguts looking for a drummer. Then we found the Pat Roberts. He was playing in some uh, simple true tribute band, you know, good drummer. And uh, so we decided to take him in the band. So we took many months. He learned all the Obscura album. And uh, as soon as he learned it, then we had this contract, and uh, we went to record it with Pat. I, you know, maybe it's just me, but I think the drumming on Obscure is so <laughs> it's so obtuse. It's so, and I don't pay a lot of attention to drummers unless, quite frankly, it's Neil Peart. I mean, or Mike Portnoy, or one of those guys, right? I mean, I love drummers, but I don't love drummers. Does that make any sense? Yeah. So. Uh, but your current drummer is fucking duh. We're gonna get to him. Yeah, Patrice. Um, yeah, yeah, he's fucking insanely good. Uh, but the drumming on here by Patrick Roberts, right? That was his name. Is it's so bizarre? How 
like how did he how'd you even find him and how did he acclimate to the material but he learned he learned i mean uh, i i was pretty much the one in the uh, rehearsing room with him one-on-one -on -one, uh teaching him the songs and we had all the pre-production that we did with mcdonald's that we could listen to oh, as right. a landmark you know right as a blueprint yeah right you know? right right but so you had the demos to reference yeah but but with with a step back you know uh pat robert good guy and everything but he wasn't really made for this this type of uh okay it was uh it was a bit too much uh, i mean he plays all the song but it's not it doesn't sound like uh comfortable it, it sounds really uh uh I, I'm trying because I, I don't want to be impolite or clinical. Anything. Clinical. I'm sorry. Clinical. No, to me it's like it's it's not comfortable. I mean, recording session wasn't wasn't too pleasant, you know. For oh, this okay. Play. He right. didn't have a great time, you know. So it was very laborious. Yeah. Very not as he expected. He I pulled it you. off. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. You know, and it kind of brings kind of more tension in the music at some point. Yeah, that's because a good way if of you want to if you want to hear how the obscura song sounded when we wrote them, go watch the video that we play with McDonald at Whiskey A Go Go. Okay, on YouTube, out in LA. Yes. What do so, you what What year is that? Ninety eight. Ninety eight. That's okay. the tour we did because because Patrick uh, Roberts did a few shows with us. And then we got in touch with uh, McDonald. And then when we got the offer for the tour, we decided to, to get uh, McDonald back in the band. So that's um, why Mc McDonald plays on the Nile tour. And yeah, the I was going to ask you, uh, Roberts, how many? Sh did, he did a few shows? Like, what do you mean? A he did a few or? shows, but uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't comfortable enough. Didn't, didn't feel right. Didn't feel no. right. Yeah, Tim says forced forced drumming that may be a good way to put it yeah because you know no hard feelings but you know i don't want to you know uh, so if mcdonald can come back we wrote the music together it's more uh right makes more sense you know for everybody okay so um and pierre uh you should say pierre remillard does the uh producing the engineering engineering on all this and you're co-producing it i assume right yeah yeah Okay. Is Steve involved too there? Is he pretty involved? Big Steve? Oh, we were all involved. You're all, you're all kind of, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when it comes to the mixing, you know, this is more like Pierre's uh, thing, you know. That's his thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you trusted him to. to oh, yeah, yeah. Like because that. the music is very raw. It's not like on Pleiades, you know, you have like this little swell here and this. It's right. more orchestrated, so to speak. It's different. Let me ask you this. What kind of gear, do you remember what gear you were using to record that? Obscura? Yeah. I think we had Big Steve's uh, 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 dual rectifier for guitar sound. Okay. And for bass sound, I believe Coutier was using like a Trace Elliott as cabinet. But the, the bass head, I don't know if he had the MPEG SVT then. I think so. Not sure. And you're using what guitar? Are you? Uh, Steve used an SG, right? Big Steve. Uh, no, Big Steve uh, was using um, a Charvel with maple neck. A very old Charvel. It's the only guitar he always had. Okay. What are you and playing? The, are you playing Ibanez? Mia, Mia was playing a, a maple guitar that the Shiquan built. Oh, you were playing an actual Shiquan then at that yeah. point. Okay. Um, and uh, I imagine your you know, effects chain stuff, that's all studio yeah, but there's not much. That's true. There's you guys never, you never really did have a big array of effects. No, so no. I, I got I got more into that realm when I wrote uh, uh, more on colored sands. Right. And but play at ease is like because if you play play at ease dust without the effect, there's something missing. Because there's a lot of choruses delays, which. I mean, a delay with a specific tempo, so it right. becomes like a character within the composition at some point, you know. Okay, so we get we get to um, kind of get back to uh, let's see. 
I'm just I just want to remind myself of a couple notes here real quick. Yeah, I mean, you know, Obscure has – what do you think about when you read or you hear or you have an artist come to you and they say, Luke, man, Obscura was so influential in what I – what I've done with my band or my recording. So, you know, someone like say Ulcerate or uh, any of those type bands that, you know, have come after, they clearly have nods towards Obscura. What, what do you, give me your perspective on that then and now. I mean, I take it as a compliment, you know, Uh, what else? Uh, But did you, did you seriously at that point in time go, man, did you guys all look around each other and go, holy fuck, we just created something so <laughs> different and weird, man. Like, did but, you know it? But that was, I mean, uh, I don't I don't know if we knew it. Uh, uh, how can I say that? But a rule of thumb for me and for us back then, but for me, as always, I need to write music that surprises myself. Okay, yeah. You know, I like to I like to write the music that if I would listen to that, it's like, oh, I yeah. didn't see this one coming. Yeah, you know, it's a rule of thumb, and it's uh, me. I'm really focused. I don't like when song all the song starts the same way. Yep. It's like I say that often in interviews. If you read a book and all the chapters starts the same way, you're gonna get confused in the storyline at some point. Or you're just same gonna thing put when you listen to a record. Yep. So you need so some, you need some to constantly stimulate you to drag yeah, you but, in. Yeah, but it's like a it's like a storyline. It's like mm-hmm. a, so these are a rule of thumb, very important. But to listen to answer to your question, we were we were uh, uh, we were. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just searching my words here. I have the That's idea, fine. but I just can't say it in English. That's right. fine. We knew that we achieved the goal to surprise ourselves with the new ingredient in the riffing and everything. But we, we didn't expect uh, the impact that it had because, dude, we, we were sending demos and nobody was fucking not even writing back. Right. So we're like, at the end of the day, we got our intellectual fix, artistic fix doing this. But uh, it's like a bottle in the ocean. Maybe some. Yeah, you, but you weren't getting any. You weren't getting any feedback at the time. No, but even yeah. when it came out, we didn't get much good reviews. Jeff right. Jeff, Jeff Wagner gave a good review in in uh, in Metal uh, Maniacs. Yeah, I remember yeah. That. Jeff's uh, Jeff's great man. Yeah, he's, but he's uh, a frog head, you know. Yeah. So frog he, nerd, yeah, big time man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just wrote the book on uh, Destination. On where, well, no. Well, yeah, but he did the one on uh, Fate's Warning. It just yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, I don't know if you know, but Kev and I did a uh, Fate's Warning deep dive a couple weeks. Oh, ago. I didn't know that, but I yeah. know Kev is a uh, Fate's Warning. Uh, oh man, Kev and I nerded out for four and a half hours on hey, Fate's Warning. I, I go, I go like when when I saw the book came out, the first person that I thought about was Kev. Yeah. And yeah. then when we started jamming together again, I said, "Hey, Kev." I wanted to uh, make a gift to you, you know, with, you know, this Fate's Warning book. And then he goes in the bookshelf and he already had it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jeff Jeff wrote a note to him, you know. (laughs) Um, So, and actually we're going to do, and I I am going to talk to you about this afterwards, but we're going to do a deep dive on death. We're going to do the same thing. And Kevin's coming on for that. So um, if you're available, I'd love you to stop in, but that's up to you. But long story short here, Let's get back to uh, this stuff. So, the band does a fair bit of touring for Obscura. They create you create this kind of new language for yourself in the band, right? And then the band kind of disbands again. It goes yeah. into a, a period of hiatus or disarray. And talk about that, and then how we get to From Wisdom, and on From Wisdom. You bring in Chewy and fucking Chewy. Wow, what a guitar player. Not that Pirtle, that's not to denigrate Pirtle at all. Two very different players, I think. Different. Totally yeah. different. Yeah. But talk about that transitional period to From Wisdom yeah. and get into From Wisdom. Yeah, the thing, uh, you know, we do the tours that we did for Obscura. And one day, uh, Big Steve uh, uh, comes to my place. And he said, hey, guys, uh, I want to talk to you. We're all there. And he said, uh, I'm done with the band. Okay, why is that? Because me, I was still in, very involved in school. 
Yeah. And uh, Big Steve was kind of missing the time that we were writing all the time, which I totally, which is totally sure. legit. Sure. You know, we weren't active enough like we used to. And, you know, our life were changing. Uh, Cloutier wanted to go back to school as well. And, uh, you know, different places. So Big Steve decided to uh, to leave. So uh, he left the band. And uh, not long after, I get this phone call uh, to go play Milwaukee Metal Fest. So I call Pierre. What year is this? 99, 2000? Uh, 99-ish. 99. About. Yeah. So I called Pierre Rémiard and I say, hey, uh, um, um, uh, I need someone to go play to Milwaukee. I said, hey, would you come to play with us just to do one gig? I said, dude, I don't have any time with the studio and everything, blah, blah, blah. But he said, there's this guy you should really uh, hear. And uh, it's uh, Mongrain, Dan Mongrain, Chewy. Yep. I said, oh, I don't know him. He said, dude, he plays in this Ben Martyr. I mean, Ugh. and and Pierre had worked. I think he had worked on Hopeless Hope a bit. He knew about him. But uh, Pierre worked on uh, on uh, Warp Zone after. Warp Zone. because Yeah, because uh, uh, they crashed at my place when they went to record at Victor. I was like 10 minutes walking from, from Victor where I was. Okay, right, right. Yeah. So, uh, so he said, yeah, you really got to check this guy out. So at the end of the day, what we did, we went to play Milwaukee as a as a as a three piece, and well, it worked well. Right, that's right. Wow, yeah. holy shit! So, so we played Milwaukee as a three piece, and there's another U.S. tour that we did. I think it's the Vader one that we did. Is it Vader? Yeah. Later, we toured as a three piece with DSI. No, it was with DSI. Yeah. Yeah. We played as a three piece on that tour, so we had experienced that two times. Anyway. So he tells me about uh, Chewy. I, I get his phone number. We go play Milwaukee, come back. I call Chewy before. I say, hey, dude, we have this show. But when we come back, I'd like to get together. You know, come to my place. We'll jam an evening and you make your mind if you want to join the band. I heard you're very good and everything. Fine. So Milwaukee goes by, come back, call Chewy, comes to my place one evening. We start jamming. And you know what? He learned like fucking easily four Obscura song in one evening. Yeah, he's... And dude, he's insane. After, I, I, he learned, let's say he's got three, he's got fucking three songs in the can. And he's like, he, he's tabbing everything down. He just sight reading and he plays the fucking shit. Like, instant. Yep. Yeah, and I remember one of the song. <laughs> I was playing an obscure song, and he was stabbing the riff, just watching at what I was playing. Yeah, yeah. He was sight reading my guitar playing. Sight reading your guitar neck, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's he's uh actually Dan was my very first interview last March, and just such a great, great, great human being. Just he's phenomenal. Great, yeah. So you guys. So do you guys go out and do some shows then before? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, so so he joined the band, and he learned uh, all the stuff like uh, stuff from erosion and blah blah blah. And uh, first show we played together was on the South Shore in uh, Montreal. One Friday evening, we went to play a show with Oblivion. It was great, you know, and uh, they're good buddies. Everybody knew everyone. Sure. Pierre knew knew Chewy. Every everybody know everybody. So it was just great, and uh, and then he left uh, Three Rivers and uh, moved to Montreal to live with me, and uh, we wrote uh, from Wisdom. But he wasn't living with me right now. Uh, we wrote from Wisdom every now and then because he was working on Warp Zone and he was recording Warp Zone. Yeah, right, right. But uh, dude, uh, me, I ha already had wrote uh, Inverted, the opening song on From Wisdom that was written. We had like three songs in the can. When Chewy joined the band, and then from there it went uh, very quick. To, to and I really, record. really, really love that album. That album is just um, and the lead. But playing. it's the one that no one, no, uh, we never talk about this record. It's like the one that fell in the crack or something. You it's know? so good. The lead playing on it is 
Thank you. Amazing. Uh, I, I, I'm very proud of this record. Inverted. That riff on Inverted. Just, come on, man. I mean, it's it's a fucking mind bender when that, that song comes in. You know what I mean? And and Steve's performance on it is amazing. Everybody's performance on it is hey, incredible. McDonald, I remember uh, a Chewy was playing the shit track for McDonald in the studio. And McDonald is like, man, I hate fucking playing with headphones. Then you you guys mind if I don't use the headphones? I'm like, no, we'll see. Dude, he tracked the whole record with no no shit track. He just played the drum on his own. He no didn't click. hear what no Chewy click was at all. No. Wow. But the thing is that he didn't have he, he couldn't hear Chewy playing. So he just played. And dude, we fucking and you listen to the record, it's on the money. It's insane. Yeah, it's yeah. so insane. How much how much touring did you do then following that? I'm sorry? How much touring were you able to do following that we album? We did one tour with Dan. It was the the the, the Dying Fetus tour with uh, who else? Anyway, so there was one U.S. tour that we did with Dan. And after uh, Dan left and he focused more on, on Martyr and everything, and when Dan uh, left the band, me, I decided to leave Montreal. And I, I was doing a lot of dope at that time, too. I was really unhappy. Yeah, I wasn't studying anymore. Was working in a factory, you know, and I was really, uh, really bummed and uh, bored and not, not well, not well mentally, right. very unhappy, and uh, whatever. So, so you I guys, just, you go back home, you go back. So I decided to, and then I meet my girlfriend, which I that's like 21 years ago. Wow, nice. and uh, time flies, man. Eh? Yeah, yeah, because sure yeah, uh, from wisdom was 2001, yes. Luke, I think I know the answer. You don't have ch children, right? No. Okay. So no, no, no. You, you just said time flies. The the my son that was with me at the show down in Metro is turning twenty eight this year, <laughs> and I and I started kind of late. I didn't. I was twenty eight when I had my first kid, and it's bizarre. Both my children are in their late twenties now, and it's like you just like. How the fuck did that happen? Like you blink <laughs> and suddenly 25 years is gone. And I mean, yeah, it really is it. true. But yeah. um, so you're for mental health wise, you've got to get out of Montreal oh, and yeah, yeah, start yeah, yeah. over. And you kind of put the band on ice, like really on ice. Yeah. But the thing is, is that McDonald went back to uh, Quebec City doing a lot of drugs as well. Uh, Dan went back to his life in Three Rivers. Uh, Cloutier was in Montreal. So I, I tried to jam with Cloutier again, but it was kind of tough just to get together for a day to play two, three riffs, you know. Right. So we were in different places, you know. And uh, then one day I get the phone call from uh, uh, McDonald's dad. He had called me a, a while before that. He said, hey, you've seen Steve around? I said, no, what's up? He goes like he's, he's, he's going through a tough time lately. And he said, we, 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 we're ready to help him. But uh, so he was going back into the drugs, uh, heavy drugs again. I said, no, I haven't seen him lately. I haven't heard about him. He said, okay. So it goes like this. So time goes by, and that's when I, I decided to. I was done with music, right? And I, I and I wanted to start uh, woodworking. So I sold uh, my my guitar cabinet. I, I had my guitar, but I didn't have much gear, and I was really done, you know. And I and I was happy with everything we did, you know. I never thought I would make another record at all, right? Right. And uh, one day. Uh, I get the phone call from McDonald's dad, and he said he found him. He hung himself at the house, you know, and everything. And then we, uh, so, and even, that, so that's when I saw Big Steve for the first time. Uh, so we went to the funeral in Quebec City. Very, very sad time. I was going to say, that had to be really heavy, man. Oh. Uh, was, was there any indication that Steve McDonald was a, a depression risk for that, a risk? No, but but dude, he, he was doing uh, a lot of heavy drugs, you know. Oh. Uh, uh, 
I mean, it, it, we're not talking smoking doobies here. Yeah, I got you. I got you. you know? um, and yeah, I think he had a lot of depression issues, right? Oh, but I mean, it, it comes along. It goes along with it. Yeah. It's, it's like drinking like fuck, you know? How you old know? was he? He was... Uh, 30s? I'm sorry? 30s? I turned I turn 30 in, in 2001. So maybe 31 or something. That's tragic. And then you also... So you see Steve Pirtle for the first time there, and then you guys kind of reconnect, and is that how you get involved in Negativa then? No, 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 because Big Steve was still living in Mon uh, in Montreal. He had, no, not true. He had came back here at his dad's place because he had health issues for his back, very bad back problems. And uh we kind of reconnect and I was visiting him. Dude, it was like 10 minutes away from here, you know? And again, it was the area where we grew up as well, you know? So it was nice. So we, we see each other just to listen to music and, uh, yeah, just to hang out, watch movie, just hang out and, 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 and talk and, uh, whatever. And he wasn't jamming much anymore, neither. Then me, I'm, I'm very into the woodworking. And I'm getting my name around. I'm getting me when I started. I started my business carving uh, wooden signs. Mm -hmm. You know, let's say you have a little cafe and you want sure, a nice sure. sign. We'll have that sign hanging out there. Exactly, yeah. like New England, those small mm -hmm. town signs. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. You know, and then I, I ended up carving the whole fucking city. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good place to be, right? Yeah, yeah. Nice problem. You know. So, uh, so I mean, I was focusing on this, and, st and and slowly I started building furniture, kitchen cabinets, and all kind of uh, anything. And then Big Steve goes back to Montreal, and then he had this negativa project going, and then he found Etienne to drum, and he said, "Man, we should jam together again." I said, "Man, I'm fucking done, dude. I haven't played in three, four years, you know." Uh, yeah, right, right. This is I'm, uh, I'm fucking like mess. you literally hadn't picked a guitar up. No, done. Wow. And uh, and I still had like a seven string that I bought, but I haven't played much with it. You know, it was a, a, a Ibanez uh, S, the first series they made. I was gonna say, I thought I saw you with a, a, an Ibanez at one point. Record, yeah. Recorded colored sand with this guy. That's it. Okay, right, right. Yeah. So this and I played ne I played Negativa with this guy as well. What year are we talking now? The, the so we're the talking two thousand five six ish. Okay. And then I started, and dude, I don't drive yet. So I started hitchhiking to Montreal every now and then, every week, to go practice with Big Steve and Etienne and Miguel for Negativa. And then we made the EP that came out, that we recorded at Pierre's studio. So it was right. family again, you know? Right, right. So, uh, so we did that. And then I kept going there. And then we started working on the LP, on the full length. And we wrote like eight songs. And we had the 20 minute song on that record. You know? Yeah. But one evening, you know, Big Steve and I, after rehearsal, we would always go uh, downtown for a little snack and hang out and then go back home. And one Friday night, Big Steve goes like, hey, man, uh, there's something I really uh, need to, to talk to you about. I said, hey, what's wrong? Uh, anything wrong? He said, no, 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 no. But I really got to talk. So he broke like the whole, like the drama thing. Okay, you know? yeah, yeah. I really yeah. got to talk to you about something. Dramatic. Exactly. What's up? And he goes like, he said, dude, you really, you really got to do another Gorgots record. I said, man, I'm done. I haven't jammed these songs in years and I. You say, yeah, you really got to do it because the, the 20 anniversary is around the corner and this and that. And I'm like, eh, I don't know. He said, you should think about it, you know. So we're like 2000, uh, 2008 Eight. or something. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I said, I'll think about it. He said, man, I'm on social media and you should see people are still talking about the record. Because yeah. me, I never had Facebook. I never, I wasn't following. Uh, yeah, you're not really, you weren't really locked in on what was the new stuff no, that was going on. Yeah. No, I, I, even today, I never had a Facebook page. You know? I know, I know. I'm busy enough with, 
I know me. If I start writing emails, I mean, you'll I'm be gonna, all, all over the place. I'm gonna spread. I'm gonna get spread so thin and do a million things. Everything unfinished, you know. And I know myself, so it's, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's anyway. Yeah, I know, dude. I know you because you and me are very similar. I can tell. Very so it similar. doesn't mean I don't like people or anything. Sure. But, and they're great tools. Don't get me wrong. No. We have a we have a Facebook for the band, but I, I don't take care of it's, it. It's you know? it's very distracting. It's very exactly. distracting, and it can exactly. take it can kind of suck your soul up. And I've exactly. kind of been doing that a lot lately yeah. because you know my situation. I have a medical situation. It's pretty grim. Yeah, and I, it's the way that I've been able to maintain and cultivate a lot of cool friendships. But I don't have to work either, so that's a big difference. Um, yeah. You know, if I did, it would really be distracting. But so Steve yeah. basically kicks you in the ass a little bit. Exactly. So Me, I'm too get... busy with I'm too busy with a million things. You know. Uh, so anyway, so but I, I never felt the need like oh I gotta hold oh I gotta have this favor. No, it's like uh, no, I don't feel the need to. Uh, right. So anyway, so Big Steve was saying, man, I'm so, I'm on social media, so you should you should get the 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 pulse there. You know. So I said, you know what? That's a good idea. I think I'm gonna give it a shot. You know. Uh, so he said, I'd like to play with you. I said, man, no hard feelings, but we already do Negativa together. He said, yeah, okay, but uh, okay. He said, it's fine. But he's, he goes like, you really got to hear, there's this guitar player that you really got to hear. He, he, would, he would be amazing to play with you. And then we go to his place and we go on YouTube and he shows me a dysrhythmia video. And it was Kev. And I mean, it was Dysrhythmia Live, but they were playing uh, like a Bypass the Solenoid, or it's an old Dysrhythmia song. Yeah, right, right, right. Mm -hmm. And I go like, holy shit, this is great. Is um is Colin in the band with him at that time? Yeah. That's right, okay. And I, and I already wanted to have Colin in the band because I had met Colin because he, he had came to Montreal when we did the CD release for Negativa. And the next day, he was going to a martyr show. To see nice. Martyr perform in Montreal, so uh, yeah, and and, and 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 Colin was a big Martyr fan, so he knew Patrice's drumming, and so it was everything kind of everything was lining up. Everything was lining it, up exactly. Yeah. But me, I was a very big fan of a Dimmak, which is the the guitar player from Ripping Corpse. You know, Rutan that I plays have, in oh, Eric Rutan, Eric Rutan, Eric Rutan. His very first band back in the days in early 90s, 80s was mm -hmm. uh, Ripping Corpse. Yeah, I actually don't know them. I'm, so that right. Jersey, that New Jersey sound. Is yeah, that's Ripping right. He Corpse. was from Jersey. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But we're talking back in the tape trading days. And they yep. made, they had made, they had made uh, 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 LP back in the days. But it, it, it it's no luck that he ended up in Morbid Angel because. A tray from Morbid was big fan of Ripping Corpse. They were like uh -huh. very important band in the underground. So, so you connect the dots. The other guy in Ripping Corpse was Sean Kelly, amazing guitar player. And he had this I gotta, project. I gotta check he, this out. I do not yeah, know. And he had this project that he made, which sounds really Ripping Corpse because he was a very important writer in Ripping Corpse. And actually, he did one of the Hate Eternal record with Rutan. He did uh, 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 the the Fort record that Webster plays based on it. I'm sorry, I just forget the title. Yeah, anyway. I, I'm not real super familiar with Hate anyway, Eternal. I know Hate Eternal and I know but, Rutan, but but, I don't but where I want to go with all this, it's just mm -hmm. so you can connect the dots. Who plays with who? Right. So Sean Kelly had this this project called Dim Mac, and he made a record called Knives of Ice. And yes. John Longstreet from Origin played, played drum on this. Yeah, and I I like this record so much. I said I want this guy to play drums on the Gorgots record. So that's why I wrote to Kev, I wrote to Colin, and I wrote to Longstreet. I said, "Hi guys, Luke from Gorgots here on MySpace." You know, my and, space. Uh, my yeah. space. Oh my and God, I yeah. said, I said, uh, I, I, I'm planning to do a, a new Gorgas record. I have like two songs, one songs or two songs. I said, I want to write three songs. I'm going to send you guys the three songs. You guys write whatever you feel on it. I have good ideas for drums. And 
and um, and uh, when we get together, we'll see if it clicks as people. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and how it goes, and uh, we'll start from there. So that's what we did. So I wrote uh, um, Ember's voice, potion of wisdom, and uh, enemies of compassion. So these are three colored sand songs. So we got together and man, we did a demo in one weekend. Wow. But but no, the thing no. is, but first, no. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. First thing first, I went to Albany, Saratoga Springs mm -hmm. to jam one on one with John. Right. With Longstrap. And we got drums pretty much on like a song and a half. I went back and we finished all the drummings. Then uh, a month or two after we got together everybody for the first time in the same room and mm -hmm. that same weekend we recorded a demo for colored sands you know what though that doesn't shock me because of the the level of creative creative forces you have there because you know kev is kev's amazing man i mean he oh, has yeah. so many dynamics to his playing and colin obviously i mean that just i don't know if there's a more in in demand producer around in the the metal realm the underground metal realms and um longstrath but longstrath doesn't actually once he does the drums on colored sands but in the end he's not actually in the touring band you bring in patrice from no but but we did we did the first colored sand tour with john oh you did yes oh i didn't know that okay and we were playing the whole record well let me ask you this real quick let's back up one second you're writing this material, and are you still tied in with seasons through from wisdom, or you have no contract, right? No, but the thing is that when I started that, me uh, Olympic record was bought by Century Media. Oh, so I contacted Century Media to ask them because I had a contract with them, but it right. never happened. The band broke up, but then. Over 10 years go by. I know. And then I contact Century Media and I ask, hey, guys, uh, I'm planning on doing a record. Are you guys interested still? And they goes like uh, the guy I'm writing to. He said, uh, we have a meeting tomorrow. We'll get back to you in a day or two and let you know what's up. Two days later, writes back, man, this is great. We're totally pumped. We're in. So Century Media is like, we're doing this. Awesome. Yeah. But the thing is, is that the contract that I have, I signed that when Gorguts was done, McDonald just committed suicide, and Olympic record was kind of what got sold. Right. But I told to Marty, Marty was like, dude, you got to sign a contract. This and I said, dude, I'm done. I'm fucking done. He said, yeah, but business wise, you're kind of tied with me. So you kind of, they're buying your contract. So you got to. So they own you. Yeah. Yeah, so I said, man, you know what? Don't expect any music from me. I'm done. So what I did, I wrote, I signed a contract so we get this business done. Yeah. And I wrote a letter that I was done with music. I'm, I'm done. I just signed this contract for business purposes, label, buying, transaction, whatever. So that they can buy the rights to you, yeah. Whatever, yeah. Right, right. But me, I couldn't care less. I was done. Right. But that was 10 years earlier. Right. <laughs> But not 10 years earlier, but many years earlier. Yeah, but now, and now you're changing your mind. Yeah, but now I changed my mind, so I contacted them, and I said, uh, what do you think? You know, when I signed this piece of paper, it was just for label transaction. I didn't negotiate anything, but now I'm pretty happy with the music. Can we sit down and just cut the little corners here and there and just – just tweak a little something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. No problem. So we write all colored sands. We're ready to record. My lawyer said, hey, I'm going to get in touch with uh, with Century. You know, we just need to talk. Uh, I mean, at the worst, if it takes a month, we're Christmas time. We'll get that together. So in New Year's, you can get in the studio and start the, and record the album. Mm -hmm. You know how long it took? For the the contract uh two years was it two fucking years yeah two years wow oh, 
God. Oh, we're not well. And then the, 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 there's this person. I'm I'm not gonna call any names here. I got but you. this person from Europe step in. You know the 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 bulldog in the ring. No, no, no. You sign this. That's gonna weigh. That's the only way it's gonna go. I said, hey, I'm not giving my music for fucking pennies. I'm done with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, I'm gonna go in my fucking workshop, and I'm happy with this with my table saw and fuck it. So they were trying. They were trying to squeeze you for next to nothing. Hey man, I was so, and I had my share of fucking music business bullshit. You know. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, like we said many times in the interview, you get with a tough skin, but at the end of the day, you do it because you love it. But you know what you work, and you know the quality of your work, and you don't want to give your stuff for nothing. Uh, It's too much work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'll do. I'll do something else which makes me happy with my time. Yeah, a lot of people a lot of people get into this thing and they think that's the panacea and then they realize that it, it, it's so fucking stressful that it, it tears apart the creative part of it. So so during that time, that two years, at some point it was like, fuck this. I mean, they, uh, that person was telling at the label was saying, this is a take it or leave it thing. Otherwise, I'm going to fucking shelve. You guys and and uh, I'm done and I'm like what the fuck? Very uh, badly intentional, unconstructive. What the fuck? So I said, you know what? I'm gonna wait. <laughs> and at the end of the day, that person kind of didn't find that too funny, you know, because she she wasn't uh, that person wasn't running the show anymore. Ah. I had like a tougher skin than than than, than they expected, you know. Uh-huh, you I waited said, you know what? You I got plenty of my plate to work home. I mean, the music it will be ready when it's ready. Done. I said sorry. I said to Colin and Kevin and John. I said sorry, guys. This is business bullshit here. I mean, uh, do your things. Uh, I'll let you know. Uh, if when when anything happens. I'll let you know when when the cake is fucking ready. You know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. And it took two fucking years. Wow. And at the end of the day, I'm so happy that I got the tough skin there because they said, you know what? Uh, we talked, we think about it, and uh, we decided to let you go. And I said, finally, thank you. They let you out of your contract. Exactly. But I kind of owe my, uh, I didn't want to give the songs for nothing. Right. You know, because I just signed a piece of paper which was like a contract template so it was like a release you were trying to get a release yeah so you got really you got but i I learned a lot too in that experience i bet you know but then seasons comes along right and then i contacted season because they were all already distributing uh, from wisdom and you know they're like french cousins you know and right away i dude i sent an email and uh Half hour later, not even, hey, can we talk? So we got on Skype, and it it was instant. uh, And they're doing great for the band. So 13 years after Wisdom, Colored Sand came out. But there was a lot of bullshit and business uh, bullshit. uh, I I got to say, Luke, when when Wisdom came out and you guys kind of disappeared, now that's in the very early days of the Internet, so you're more connected to what, artists are doing and what's happening and you can kind of you have a finger on the pulse right but yeah. you didn't have that in the early days you had magazines there was lags in time and that, that's it, that's my school you know yeah and mine as well but but now we're in that period and i have to say that i never ever thought there was going to be another gorgot album. i just didn't think it was going to happen me, me neither <laughs> <laughs> and then colored sands come out and man I ordered that thing instantaneously, and when I, I oh, could yeah. not wait to get that record. And when I got it, I was blown the fuck away. Blown oh, thank away. you. And, thank you. you know, I will say it's my favorite record of yours. I love oh, yeah. the other stuff, too, but it's my favorite record oh, for a lot you. of different reasons. I mean, you can – everybody can go watch the deep dive. I'll, that's linked in the thing. No, but, I'm very proud of that record. Yeah, you should be. You should be. Um Talk a little bit about, but that but that record literally was recorded what two years before, or when did did you record it after you got the seasons? Then pulled you into is that when you actually officially recorded it? 
I mean, when when we got when we got out of that mess, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. With Century Media. Yeah. So, but you had fully fleshed out demos by that time, right? Oh yeah, yeah. We had uh, all the music was done. The only thing that wasn't finished was my lyrics because it was a lot of concept. It's a conceptual record. There was a lot of reading involved. To so it was a lot of work in in the lyrics. But I'm very proud of these lyrics. You know. Yeah, about I, I think most people know, but give us a thumbnail sketch of the the concept behind Colored Sands. It's about uh, uh, the idea came to me. Uh, I'll be very quick on this. Uh, one day, my girlfriend, uh, we talk, and she goes like, "Oh, I went to visit this friend, and uh, she, this friend had a little daughter, and she offered me a coloring uh, page from a coloring book as a gift." You know, right? I'm a very young kid, you know. Sure, sure. And and uh, she tells me, "Oh, that young kid just colored a, a mandala in a book and gave me that." And I go like, a "What? A mandala?" And I kind of heard that word before, but I. You would have back then. You would have asked me to pinpoint what, explain what a mandala is. I I couldn't do it. Of course, I wouldn't have either. Yeah. Yeah. So I did some research, and I saw, wow, that that is fucking beautiful, and it's a, what the fuck, you know, doing, doing uh, this with, with with colored sands, you know, that's sure. where the title's from. Right, right, right. And that really hit my curiosity, and I started uh, buying books on Tibet. And, and because at first I wanted to make the whole record about the ritual of making one mandala, you know, but it was too ambitious at some point. But then when I started reading about Dalai Lama by, by, uh, by, uh, uh, because you read about Tibet, of course you read about Dalai, Dalai course, Lama yes, and right. then the Chinese invasion of 1950. And then, Oh, there's more substance. I mean, don't get me wrong. Mandala is amazing. But it can get sterile maybe after five songs to talk about this, you know? Yeah, right, so it right. Because right. maybe better to bring Mandala back to one song, <coughs> the title track. And and uh, so that's where the idea came to split the album in two. To have four songs about the beauty and the philosophy and the people of that country. Then you have Invasion of Tibet with the uh, the string orchestra piece, which kind of get the distortion out of your ear, you know. And then when it starts with Enemies of Compassion, it's all about the invasion, the the, the sadness that brings to their the, these people life, uh, why they are leaving, uh, the public emo public immolation to protest about this occupation. Yes, yes, yes. So there was a so the album there's there's a there's there's a nice side of the coin and there's a sad sign of the coin. Yeah, there's an arc, there's a story arc in there. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So so that's how it's if I briefly that's that's how it came about. And after that is is done, you you bring it when did you bring Patrice in? Did he come in after long strap that to go exactly back to John was to busy with origin right. and then we had an offer to play heavy Montreal, but it uh, John couldn't be in the picture but i really wanted to do the show and uh, so and it's a no-brainer i mean patrice was already a friend of mine because of chewy and everybody right 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 and uh dude he lives like an hour 15 from here yeah so i got i gotta say man he is i know how good longstrap is but man he is Patrice is fucking good, man. Yeah. Holy but shit. John, what's interesting about John, so on Colored Sand, we, we're we hearing a, a, a side of his playing which we never heard in any record that he did before. Because if you hear John in Ocean of Wisdom, it's not even close to an Origin or Hate Eternal song. Yeah, that's, that's a great point to make there. I'm not... I'm not gonna lie, I'm not the biggest origin fan. They're almost too technical for me in a lot of ways. There's almost too much going on. But but yeah, his drumming on this is really uh um, he can fucking play and there's a lot of dynamic. Dynamic. And, uh, that was the word I was gonna use, dynamic. Yeah, yeah. So it shows a very nice I, I I I'm very happy that he got to perform on the record because it shows a, a very uh, it's like he had a few cards in his sleeve that people didn't know he had, you know? Yeah. Don't get yeah. me wrong. It, 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 it's a different aesthetic 
totally from what he does in in origin so you do a fair bit uh, quite a bit of touring for that i believe right for we did uh yeah we did one tour with john and then after we got the we got the the the, the decibel tour with carcass right the decimal thing right right yeah and, and then we went to europe uh two three times we we did many festivals weren't you out with carcass on a package too in or europe am I, am I dreaming the the american one the uh, i'm thinking um it was decibel oh that was the decibel thing okay all right yeah yeah it was like five bands right was revocation on there no no it was uh it, it was uh noisem grand core band yeah us Black Dahlia Murder. That's and Black Car Dahlia. And Carcass. Carcass, yeah. And I missed that. I remember that coming out, and I forget what was going on, but I, I couldn't get to the Philly show on that one. So I had to wait another three years. I had to wait till Pleiades Dust came out. And funny story about that, Luke. So my son and I go out to dinner at this, like, microbrew place one day, and I'm wearing a an obscure shirt, Okay which you don't see many of them around in my town. I'm just being honest with you, right? But I'm I'm pretty stoked, right? And, and we go into this place, and I forget where I got it. I got it online. I, it's official, so I'm, I'm hopefully you got some money out of it. But long story short, I go in, and we're sitting there, and this kid comes up to wait on us, right? And he goes, he goes, he looks around, he's looking around, you know, and he goes, dude fuck yeah man like he's a waiter right he's like fuck yeah gore guts i'm like bro and he's a young kid he's probably 20 21 he goes are you going to the show and i'm like what are you, what show what are you talking about and he's like they're playing baltimore like the day after tomorrow this is like a i think it was a this was like a thursday night and i think you were playing saturday in baltimore i'm like what so i look at my kid and i'm like uh we gotta go home and get those tickets right now so we did that. We come down to the show, you know, and again, I told you at the beginning here, that's the first time I heard of exist called my buddy while, while exist was playing. I'm like, bro, listen to this, put the phone up. And he's like, I can't hear shit, dude. What, what, what are you? I'm like, this fucking band rules. It sounds like it's like a proggier version of fucking death. I'm like, these guys are awesome. And then, then when you guys came out, you just fucking slaughtered everybody. I remember, talking to Patrice after, and I talked to Kev real quick, and Pleiades Dust. One long sequence of music. It's kind of a, I know it was influenced by these guys and your love for the incident, and I hate to say that's my least favorite Porcupine Tree album, yeah. other than the very, very early ones. I'm a, I'm a signify sky moves sideways all the way up to Dead Wing, and then I kind of fall off, but... Um, Talk to me real quick about Pleiades Dust and like, you know, again, you had, you're not, and please don't take this the wrong way. You're not the most prolific guy. And it's, you're, you're like that by design. That's almost what you do. It's not, you're not ever in this thing where. I mean, okay, I don't, I don't, I, I don't release an album every two years or. Uh, yeah, that there's no, favorite? there's no timetable for you. You're not no. under the pressure of album release tour, album release tour, you no. know, that kind of thing. No. And you do it when the muse creates the music. And was Pleiades Dust primarily just you, or did the other guys? I know the guys contribute, but did you write the bulk of that, or, yeah. or what? Okay. Yeah. So, so talk I, about I, that. I wrote, yeah. So so the idea was there for a while. Uh, we had a I had a different idea for the structure at first. At first, I wanted to have me, Kev. And call in to each write 10 minutes of music. Because I wanted to do like that really epic Peaks and Valleys song. Sure. Anyway. Like and then I kind of changed my... Like a song cycle? I'm sorry? Like a song cycle? Not a song cycle, but like one song. Because me, I'm a big fan of uh, like the Polish composer, like Penderecki. He had these symphonies, which were all about 30-ish minutes. One big movement. It's all one movement. And then I got to see uh, the incident live. One, right. it, I mean, you can clearly see chapters, but it's all connected, you know. Uh, again, I'm a big fan of uh, I from Meshuga, mm -hmm. and then the Death Spell Omega EPs, about 20 something minute songs. And I always wanted to do like a, a long song. Uh, Jack Lemon is from Voivod. 
Oh, what a great song. Exactly. So these were more, these were my inspiration. Let me ask you one question. Was that the, the first time you saw Porcupine Tree or? Uh, with the incident? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Have yes. you seen them since? Did you see them when they reformed? No, no, I, I didn't get to see uh, the show when they came back to Montreal. I, didn't, I, I had tickets for, uh, <laughs> my buddy and I had tickets for Philly and my, my health issues really started to hammer me in September and I decided not to go, but Richard Barbieri, uh, the keyboard player, he called me after the show, which was really oh, cool. And we talked nice. for a while and it was funny because we were kind of sitting in the nosebleeds and Richard bumped us up to the eighth row center. <laughs> And I didn't go. It's like ah. So, but yeah, I, I, it's but, um. But I got I got to see Wilson solo a couple of times, and he he, he would uh, he he would give me guest list, you know, when he comes to Montreal. And, oh, uh, nice, nice. So you've met them then? Yes. Okay. But cool. the thing is that because when 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 uh, when I wrote Colored Sands, I wanted uh, I wanted Wilson to produce the record. I did not know that. Yes. So and what, and you talk to him or what? Yes. Yeah, so I, I got in touch on the internet with him. First thing I knew, like a day or two after, hey, what's up? Uh, thanks for writing. Uh, he goes like, uh, I know your band. I said, wow. Oh, yeah. I didn't know I was on his, on his radar at all. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, he comes to Montreal for the incident. So mm -hmm. we're in touch by then. And then I sent him all the pre-prods that we did for Colored Sands. All the what? I, I sent him all the pre the demos that we did. Oh, the for demos. Colored. Okay, okay, gotcha. The, the pre-productions. Yeah. So 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 I sent him that. And then he writes back to me, he goes like, Wow, uh, you, you got a you got a record here, you know, da na 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 na, but I'm busy. And he all he, he 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 only had his first solo record back then, you know. Instrumentes, yeah. yeah. Instrumentes came out in 09, I believe. 08. Yeah. yeah. So and then he, he for the first time he comes to Montreal, they come to Montreal for the incident. Um, uh, we get in touch, and he goes like, uh, "I'd like to meet. We can. I'd like to meet you." He said, "Yeah, fine, no problem." Come meet me in Montreal uh, that time, that whatever. Right. So I get to meet him. So we, we go in the lounge and we speak for uh, maybe half hour or something. And we, we meet. And what do you like? And, you know, get to know each other a bit. Sure, and, uh, sure. and then we talk about the record. He said, I don't know yet. But he was he was open to the idea, you know. Right, right. So, yeah. And then uh, what happened? He wrote me a while after. He said, I, I'm very sorry, but I... I he wants to, I want to focus more on my solo career and start touring. And uh, that's yeah. why, you know, he kind of passed on that. But we kept in touch since then, you know, like cool. once or twice a year, yeah, I yeah. can drop a line and say, like, when I wrote my string trio, I would send him some chamber music. That's and, cool. Uh, yeah. And then when he came back to Montreal, when I got Pleiades, I know he's a vinyl guy. So we got to see, we got to hang out uh, to speak after a show, and I gave him Pleiades on vinyl. So oh, then he write me the next day. He listened to it on the bus, you know. So it's uh, it's it's fun. Yeah, I'm very, I, I like his work so much. I feel very lucky just to be, to to. And but the thing is that the first time when I wrote to him, he thought no. When I met him the first time, he said, I said, how do you know my band? And he said one tour. I think it's on uh, in Absentia, uh, Opeth. We're on tour with Porcupine, uh -huh. and him and Michael were hanging out in a record shop one day. Yep. And Ackerfeld said, "Dude, if you want to hear something, I think he pointed out Obscura." Yeah. And uh, and Wilson bought Obscura that day. He didn't he didn't have anything to buy or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And Ackerfeld pointed out. <laughs> have you met Michael? Have you met? Michael? Oh yeah, yeah. I've met yeah. a couple times, and he, he write to me also when he comes to Montreal. Yeah, he's awesome, man. What he's so guy. nice. Very great, nice. Great guy. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. Last time I saw him, it's been a while, but when they did the, uh, they did a special show, I think in 2016 in New York, they did a three set of what well, was like, they, they played uh, Radio City and they did like a major production. It was like the longest set they'd ever played. They played stuff like By the Pain I See and others, stuff they hadn't done in years ever, right? And we went to a signing session hadn't seen mike in a long time i looked a little bit different and i was wearing a 
I was wearing a Killing Technology shirt, you know, the, the artwork. And I get up there, and Mike goes, hey, man, love that shirt. I'm like, cool. I said, you don't remember me, do you? He goes, you look really familiar, but I can't remember. Because I've been back in the green room many times at many open shows. But I had longer hair when I saw him the last time. And before that, I had much shorter hair. So I kind of reminded him that, uh, funny story, the song Blackest Eyes, you know, that drop D, da 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 right? That riff, uh, I was talking to Mike about it. He goes, yeah, fucking Wilson, he ripped that riff, ripped that riff <laughs> off of me. <laughs> so fucking funny, man. But, um, but so you get Play These Dust sorted out and – but okay, so who who did produce that? I'm sorry, I forget. Was it it's you? Colin. Colin. Well, Colin did that. That's right. Colin did it. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the thing, so 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 what I did, so so I had the clear picture for for the the music. So what I did, I wrote the first 20, 20 minutes, twenty minutes. Right. So send that to the boys. And the way we work, we, we work like this on Colored Sand and Pleiades. Is that I write all my guitars. And for the first time on Pleiades, I program all the drums. Oh, okay. It's, it's, instead of being in the room and say to Patrice, I want a blast beat here. Yeah. So you can hear it, but they do just, your own blast beat. He's got a guide. What are you exactly. using? Exactly. But the thing is that that's what I have in mind, you know. So what are you what using to do that? What are you using? Oh, uh, uh, me, I work in Studio One and uh, the drums. The drums were. Um, they, they weren't uh, a superior drummer. What did I use? I think it was uh, uh, from, uh, I, I'm sorry. Um, what, That's what okay. If you don't remember, I was just curious. No. Um, uh, you know, it, 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 uh, it, it's a series of library uh, with contact. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I work a lot with contact, especially for orchestrals. You know, and uh, right. anyway. So, so I program all. So it was my first experience programming drums. But I can write music already, so it was kind of a, not, not too bad, you know. So, but it gives a good blueprint for the boys to to write on, you know. Right. So, right. so, so, what they do? Me, my guitar riffs don't don't really change, and they dress it up with their own ideas. So that's where you get all this counterpoint. Right. You get the counter. Uh, exactly. You so you have you have my guitar here. You have Kev's guitar counterpoint and you have bass counterpoint there. Right. So Pleiades, we barely never play the same riff altogether. Never ever. But it but it breeds, you know, there's room in the music. You right. Know? That's why I say counterpoint, you know, it's really counterpointing. Let me ask you this. Um your tunings on each album, do you remember in that how much have they changed over the last uh, the the yeah. first the first two records it's standard C sharp C sharp okay and from obscura to now it's uh, C standard oh yeah that's right Kev told me C standard and you know the weird thing is it just sounds so fucking heavy live that I kept thinking this has got to be in like B flat or no. A sharp or something but it's not uh, it's yeah. C standard but me I play seven string but Kev doesn't. That's right. So me, I have a lower G. You have that low G. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But everything else is C standard. Yeah. Um. We're at four four hours. Can I get you for thirty more minutes for a bunch of bullshit and then get you out of here? Sure. Okay. No problem. We're four hours mis- already. I got I got miscellaneous stuff here, but before we do that, I have to ask the big question, and you know what the big question is. The big question is, what's going on now? Are we going to see an album? Are we oh, gonna for see- sure. Oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Talk oh, a little yeah. bit about what you're thinking and your, what your mind is uh, producing. But, but especially, you know, getting getting together again uh, for the Philly show, it really... I mean, I had the intention of making another record, but I, I didn't expect to, to play live, you know, like the Philly show that the... Right. So that really got me into my metal shoes, you know, for sure. For sure. Got the juices so, flowing, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So all my focus was on relearning the considered dead material. And there were there were some deep cuts from Obscura as well. Dude, some of most of these songs I haven't played in 25, 30 years. I know. I mean, Luke, 
Thanks to Albert, man. Thank you, Albert. Because oh, Albert, thank you, Albert, Albert. You're saying, of course. Albert, Albert drew you out. He pulled you out, out, and for all of us that were there, man, it was just. I'm being a little bit, you know, hyperbolic here, but you know, hyperbolic, like meaning excessive, I guess is the word. But for me, dude, it was like a fucking religious experience. I was like, man. I get to see them again, and it brought, oh, me, thank you. brought me so much joy to see how happy you were on the stage. Oh, man, and I, I told to the fan, you know, I mean, uh, I said it uh, after, the, the like, the third song. Uh, yeah, how happy. And, you know, I feel so lucky to have uh, Colin, Patrice, Kevin, because, dude, we, we, we skipped six years. We don't see each other at all. Right. And they're, they're there and available and they want to do it. And we're having fun. Yeah. And we're having, when we, we, we share a good laugh being in the same room together. That means gold. That's like gold. Yeah. I was going to say that that's so much more important than anybody can really understand But, because you got a lot of bands out there. They're way more popular, making way more money. They hate each other. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're on tours that are, they're riding in separate buses. I'm talking about guys like What? Motley Crue and, But you know what? Like when we did the tour for Pleiades and everything, we were we were tired after this. Sure. You know, and me, I don't want to wear out and say, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. And the guys, they have like a, a million projects each. Just right. go do your things. Me, I'm happy in my workshop. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I like the change as well. I like to take a break and come back and, uh, you know. Maybe it's not good because I gotta I gotta get back my chops and right. I mean, but you know. But you know that's the cool thing about you, Luke. There's no pretension. There's no ego. There's no I, I'm the rock star guy. There's no diva shit. And I'll tell you, anybody who goes to a Gorgot show, this guy right. I always forget which way to point. This guy right here is the guy that's gonna be showing you your shirt and taking pictures with you. Yeah. You're the most. Fan friendly guy, and a lot I of like guys to meet, in that work. I like But, to meet the people. Uh, you I like appreciate, to you appreciate, exactly. Oh, yeah, and it's that's, no why you, that's why you've given me four hours tonight, which is crazy. <laughs> um, talk a little bit about, um, let me just look at something here. Talk a little bit about the Montreal scene over the years because there's a lot of killer bands, Cataclysm, Cretopsy, Atremenus, Cathelus, Voivod. I mean. Talk a little bit about that scene and what it's meant to you. Uh, me, 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 the Montreal scene, I was closer to the scene in the early years of the band. But now, uh, of course, I have friends like in Vengeful, uh, Phobocosm. Uh, there's a few uh, uh, death metal, black metal band that I'm, I'm following. But I'm not as close to the scene as I used to be like in the 90s. So, unfortunately, I can't do a lot of mileage uh, for you uh, with this question, you know. Okay. But, but you know, I, I, I mean, the scene has always been strong, like the Spice Icon. Uh, I mean, there's great bands, for sure. For sure. And not just metal. I mean, that area is pretty well known for things like Constellation and Cranky, where you have, uh, you know, uh, uh, Godspeed. You have Le Bradford, those type of you know, these, I guess, post-metal, post-rock bands. Yeah, different different scenes there. Yeah. yeah. Did you like, did you like, or do you like Godspeed? I don't know Godspeed well. I know really? their name, and their, but I know that they, they have a very uh, uh, international uh, resonance. So to See, speak. that's one, or Set Fire to Flames. That's one I think you would really dig. Um, that's yeah, something, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with their work. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to hit you with some of their stuff, too. So, um Let me just look here real quick and see. Um, I did have one question. You, you brought up Despel Omega. Yeah. And I talked to um, – are you familiar with ISIS? Yes, I have a few of their record. Okay. I, I just did – I have a, o, 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 Oceanic. Is that right? Oceanic. Mm -hmm. Oceanic. I have this and the, the latest that they did. Yeah. Um, I talked to Aaron Turner, kind of the main – Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Band. And we talked about, you know – He's also a fan of Death Spell. But we talked about the difficulty because you, you're aware of like Miko Aspa, right? The guy that allegedly does the vocals. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, is he a Norwegian or something? I don't know if he's. I don't, 
I honestly don't know if he's Norwegian. I think he's Swedish and Swedish. He's got, yeah. he's got a lot of ties to um, kind of NSBM, the National. Oh, Soccer I don't. Uh, I don't. Uh, this is. A, is it like Nazi thing or? Yeah. 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 I'm not familiar much about me. I have. Uh, uh, I, I pen palled. Uh, I, I I I was corresponding for a while with the guitar player. He's Finnish. He's not Norwegian. He's Finnish. Oh, right. okay, okay. Yeah. But the guitar player is French. Finnish, yeah. Okay. So you know him? Yeah. Okay. I mean, they're a very interesting band musically. There's no question. They're one of those bands that kind of like kind of like Gorguts. They kind of defy categorization categorization a lot. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I will say that, unfortunately, I struggle with them because of Miko Aspa's ties. He's just, yeah. I forget the name of uh, Northern Silence. Is it Northern Silence is his label? Somebody will correct me in here real quick. Um, uh, you mean the Death Spell label? No, they're not on. Who are they on? Uh, but they, they released Paracletus on Seasons, but That's I right. think it maybe it was. Maybe it was a license or something, but the other records, it's uh, uh, something Morty, but it's the it's 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 the guitar players label. Okay, so Mika Miko has Northern Heritage. That's the name of it. And there are there's stuff like Go Lord. There's a lot of weird stuff on there. So I struggle. I just wonder what your thoughts were like on separating art from or the artist from the the political stuff. You know what I mean? Like. Because yeah, you're not a very, I, you're not a political guy. You're very, you know, your stuff may be political, but it's more historical political. You know yeah, I mean? but I, I kind of, I like like in Quebec, I follow politics every day. I like mm -hmm. to listen about politics and everything. But me, uh, to to answer your question, I think I think I can dissociate uh, art from the artist. Uh, let's say an example like Polanski years ago was accused for abusing, uh, like, uh, I don't know if it was an actress or someone, you know? Young girl, he, yeah. Yeah, but he's a filmmaker master. I can, I can, uh, I can, uh, I mean, that doesn't excuse what he's, what, what he did, you know, as a, so that's why, uh, you, uh, how can I say that? Let's say if I go see a, a, a painting exhibition in the museum or something and the artist is there and we get to talk together and he would be like a very religious person or whatever. And meat's not my cup of tea, but I can still appreciate. I can be in awe with some painting. I'm not going to uh, uh, refuse myself to contemplate something that I find beautiful because I don't agree with the ideas of the person as a person in every day's life, you know. But that doesn't excuse when you cross the lines and do something bad that hurts different people or, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, but I, I think I'm able to dis dissociate. Yeah. Okay. Um, favorite shows you played uh, over the years? What, you have, a, you have a, a, a specific memory of like a favorite show or two? First time we went to Europe with Colin, Kevin, and Patrice, uh, the Brutal Assault. Is Amazing. that the biggest? Is that the biggest festival you played? Like what? But what? What? It was one of the big that we played. Oh, there was play, a lot of. Fucking... Did you ever play uh, Hellfest or did you ever play Hellfest? Yeah, we played Hellfest. We never played Vacan. We played Summer Breeze, but I, I don't have good memories from Summer Breeze. I I had such a bad performance myself, so I wasn't enjoying myself much. Uh, what What's it like for you to get in front of a crowd of? 20,000 people versus a club where there's, you know, I like both me, uh, I, but you know what? Uh, maybe on tour, when you're on tour after a week, like in a small club, I'm very comfortable. I'll, I'll plug my stuff and start. Hey, what's up? There you go. It's like having a bunch of friends at the rehearsing place. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But like when we played in Philly the other day, it was a long time. I was really nervous, but I was say, I had, were you nervous? Oh yeah, yeah. Did you have the gym? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the thing is, is that once I'm nervous, not to be in front of the crowd. I'm nervous. I want to make sure that I have all the landmarks that I need to perform well. Right. Once I have all my anchor point, like good monitors. I hear kick well. The snare's good. I hear the boys good. I'm. 
I'm ready to rock. So you guys didn't, like you didn't use in ears, right? You no. use monitors. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is that once that's all confirmed, you know, I'm ready to go. And I really like to speak to the crowd. I'm not, I'm not the shy to be in the, Oh no, uh, uh -uh. no, 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 nah, you're great. You're like an amazing, I, I'm, I'm comfortable to be in front of an audience, you know? Yeah. 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 But me, I'm, more, I'm more, I'm more worried to have all the landmarks that I need so I can perform well to deliver the music. You know, it, it was kind of funny when I saw death to all, it reminded, you reminded me of the Giorgio because the Giorgio does, most of the talking at death to all gene yeah. does a little bit too max yeah. max usually doesn't talk at all um no. or bobby and giorgio is funny like you he's got a a real career you'll have like conversation with the crowd you know a career, a charismatic you're a charismatic guy so um what's your favorite what's your favorite city that you play do you have one hmm. oh, i i really like playing in new york city i like texas I like I like yeah. San Francisco. Uh, uh, I like California. Let's say San Francisco. It, it's always been very good for us. The West Coast always been very good overall. Where else? Um, it's good. Chicago's always been good for us. What about always. Europe? What about Europe? Did you play Budapest? Yes, yes, that What's was that good. Like? Yeah, I like Germany. I like, but Germany's tougher crowd. They're not it's very uh, noisy. But it doesn't mean because they don't interact much between songs that they, right. they're not having a good time. You know, right. it's, it's different energy, you know. But, uh, yeah, um, Eastern Europe, like Poland, very strong. Uh, we have a very strong uh, follow-up there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to talk to you a couple quick uh, quick hitters here because I'm going to get you out of here at the four-and-a-half-hour mark. And, and I just want to say, Luke, I – I can't thank you enough for this. It's just been, <laughs> been absolutely super cool. But it's good. It's it's very. Uh, we have a good conversation. That that matters to me. Oh man, it matters to me too. And that's when I started this. A lot of people were like, "Man, your interviews are really long." I'm like, imagine you're a fly on the wall, and it's your your your. What I wanted to do was yes, I've got a little cheat sheet over here, but it's just to spark my memory to give me a, a topical thing to get into but it's like two bros hanging out and having a couple beers exactly. along with drinking and we're yeah. talking about stuff and I, I, I can't thank you enough this has been so freaking cool but i do have a couple quickies here um dark ambient i heard you talk about camera height i was shocked to hear you talk about camera i'm like i thought i was the only one that knew about camera <laughs> but you know, I'm a huge Lustmord fan, and, and Brian, too. and Me get too. this, Brian's going to come on at the end of the month. Oh, yeah. I've got him coming, so I'll make sure you see that. Oh, you got to send me an email to make sure I don't miss this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's coming on. Um, do you know Daniel Mensch? He works. Uh, he, how about Andrew Lyles? Do you know Andrew Lyles? Okay. Got to hook you up with some weird-ass dark ambient. Me? What? what? Check it out. We're on tour for Color Sense. Mm -hmm. We played the Montreal show. Great night. Very heavy snow night. We 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 got to drive back to the states. Uh, there's uh, Colin and Kevin with me. Uh, for some reason, uh, John uh, left with uh, some friends to go to Albany. We're driving during the night. And Colin puts uh, Dark Places on Earth by Lost More. Mm. Dude, I go like, what the fuck is, is this? this? Yep. <laughs> and and dude, I, I I had the same feeling like when I heard Scream Bloody Gore the first time. It's a new experience. You know, Harris? So it, was, it was so long since I had an experience listening to music like, ugh. Yeah. It's like you found a gem, you know? You, you know Heresy, right? You know Heresy? Uh, Heresy, uh, the album? Yeah, Lustmore. Yeah, but there's so many. I, I, I mean, uh, me, my favorite one are uh, Power of Words. What is it? The Power of Word. Am I right with the title? 
That one doesn't ring a bell. No, maybe I'm not saying the title right. That's that's my mistake. Uh, I like the one. Uh, I like Stalker. Oh, Stalker's ah, I have it on LP, man. So good. It's beautiful. And you know the movie, right? The Tark Tar 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 Yes, uh, uh, Tarkovsky. Oh my God, what a fucking Tarkovsky movie! movie. Yeah, I like the, those uh, uh, like old sci-fi looking, you know, ambience. It's yep. like an early Blade Runner ish. It's like a fee. It's like a fever dream. Like you're yeah. not, you're not sure if any of it's real while you're watching it. And it's beautiful. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Um, and 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 yeah. So 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 stalker, dark places on Earth, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, where the uh, uh, beyond. Yeah, where the um, where the star hangs. Where yeah, where the uh, black stars hang. Yeah, yeah. These are pretty much my favorite. Yeah, so gotta, anyway, gotta, I got to get you some other stuff. Like, do you know uh, Nordvarger or Drock? Do you know no. um, Trom? No. How about Thomas Koner? No. Ah, oh, I got. I, oh, so you got to send me links to these things. Such sites do I have for you, sir? Biosphere. No. So I, I, I just want to say. So when when I heard "Dark Places on Earth," I I said to uh, Colin and the boys, and, and and Kev is big dark ambient fan. He had his days, you know. Uh, well, you had that in between the songs at the show, right? You had some kind of. Because I, I, since I like, I became dark ambient fan. Right. Since I heard Lost Morn, I asked Colin with his keyboard to do those kind. Yeah, of he styles. created some textures exactly. and yeah, yeah. So my point is, is that what I wanted to point out on Pleiades, on the two third of the album. Yep, the section. Yep. There's a dark ambient, ambient uh, 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 section. Uh, very lost, very lost Morty, very lost Morty. Yeah, but that's my tribute to. Uh, dark ambient music, but I think it sits very well within death metal music. Oh, I think it works perfectly. Dark ambient and metal are really kind of intertwined. There's yeah, you talked about it at the very beginning. It's it's music that takes your mind someplace else. It's yeah. a it's a new dimension that yeah. you can and really... when when I think when it's done with good taste, you can incorporate many influences and it's gonna work. You know what I'm saying? Death oh, metal absolutely. provides that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab something here real quick. Give me one second. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you. So, I'm doing this special on Lost Mort at some point in time, but this is uh, unf I don't know how you say it in Unforschetti's Gebite. I have no idea. I'll send what the links this? to you. This is Thomas Koner, uh, German dark ambient. But here's some. You know, there's this one. Other, I think that's the one you might be thinking of. I have, I have this one. No, yeah. but that, no, the the one, it, no, Heresy. no, it's not the one. Me, the the one I'm telling you. You have uh, the the singer from Tool that sings a song on this one. It's all with voices. What's uh, that? Maynard James Keenan. Uh, Puss yeah, I know. Yeah, he yeah. Does I, lock I, up with Pussifer. I didn't know he had that. I didn't yeah. know. Okay. Yeah, the album. It's the yeah the power of words or something like that. You got to look on the internet for this. Yeah, I got it's, carbon core and uh, here's uh, juggernaut. I got tons of lust mord. Yeah, so. but but the the, the lust mord I'm telling you about, you'll see it's a white cover. It's like an hexagonal or octagonal thing. Okay, I'll look. I'll look for that. I don't have everything by him. Do you it's, know this band? By, do you know this band by chance? I'm curious. Dark Suns, German band. No. You gotta get this swan song. This is fucking oh. incredible. So hey, I got do, a lot of do stuff you know do, do you know the Lost Mord record that he did with sounds from space from the NASA or something? Is that Zotrope? Zotrope? Oh, I can't remember the title. I have this one too on CD. Yeah, I kind of to be very honest with you, the last four or five Lost Mords I've kind of I missed out on because so that's why the one with power of words, whatever it, it's that might be it, the one that's more yeah. recent that I missed out and, on. And he, so. and he did a soundtrack for an American movie as well, which is a story of a priest. Dude, this soundtrack is fucking evil. Yeah, uh, well, he's a really nice guy from what I can tell, but and and he doesn't do a lot of interviews, but I've coaxed him. I've he's seen that I've interviewed. Uh, Steve Von Till, you know Steve Von Till from uh, Neurosis. Awesome, awesome guy. 
I actually, we're about, we've just beaten the Steve Von Till. Steve is four <laughs> hours and 16 minutes. Um, do you know Marissa Nadler? No. I got to get you into her too. Um, I got a million things I got to send your way. Just, just out of, you know, like, uh, here's another one. Last one, and then we'll, uh, I'll wrap up. Um, do you know Boards of Canada? I'm sorry? Do you know the trip-hop band Boards of Canada? It's a duo. No. No. Uh, do you like trip hop at all? Eh, but do you, like, sorta. do you like old? But you know what? I, I like I like electronic music. I love Nine Inch Nails. Well, this is electronic, but it's not. It's really nostalgic electronic. It sounds like it came from the seventies. It's um, I guess you could kind of say it's Tangerine Dreamy, but not exactly. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I I'm confused. It's my mistake. Trip up is like. Uh, 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 Portish Head or something. Yeah, like, well, maybe Aphex Twin. No, maybe. but me, I, I love Portish Head. I love this. Okay. I, so love. I like this trip up, you know, this vinyl sound. Yeah, you're going to love. Boards I love this. You're going to love Boards of Canada. Um, yeah, you got to send me links to those things. Dude, that I got, I, I'm, uh, after we get done here, I'm going to have a, a, about 8,000 links to send you. <laughs> um, I'm just going over my quick trip here. Um, Last thing, have you had a, a, I know you're a fanboy like me, and we've talked about that. You know, when you get into something, man, you're all in, right? And have you, have you met, you met a lot of artists, right? Have you met an artist or a, or a band or a whatever, you know, a, a guy that you just absolutely are in awe of in terms of like, Oh my God! I'm so nervous to meet this guy. This is so cool. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I met have one or two of those people. Yeah, I met uh, I met the uh, the com the Polish composer. He he, he died uh, maybe two three years ago. Uh, Christoph uh, Penderecki. Okay. You know Penderecki? I don't. I'm not a very you you need to school me on classical. Yeah. If you like on. if you like dark ambient music, Love this it. is this is orchestral music, but it's so dark oh i love it then evil oh, i love it evil sounding classical music i want it bring it yeah <laughs> so i got to meet him uh one, once uh, uh i met him two two times the first time it was a friend of mine he's a violinist right uh, he, and and he said hey me and my buddy Mar Mar marcus he, he's a polish uh, uh a violinist he said uh we're gonna be at the polish uh, embassy uh, in uh, in Montreal, and we're gonna perform a piece for uh, Penderecki himself. So if you want to come with us, so I was like, holy fucking, he's a. Uh, it's like if you meet uh, uh, Shostakovich or Beethoven, but he was like the 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 the, the, the biggest 20, 21st century composer. He just passed. Anyway, so and I got to meet him a second time. Because one of my friends at the conservatory, she was a violist and she was performing a piece for solo viola that Penderecki wrote. And he, she said, if you want to come with me, we're going to meet with Penderecki backstage. And when, uh, when, because he was performing his Requiem with Montreal Symphony Orchestra. Oh, okay. Right. right. And, and the, uh, the, uh, the cathedral was like uh, fucking uh, four blocks away from school. Oh. So we, we walked there and we, I, we, I, I and me, what I did, I did a, an arrangement of a, he wrote an opera called Paradise Lost after Milton. Yes, yes, uh, yes, yep, yep, yep. Mm, okay, yep. so he wrote an opera uh, 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 called Paradise Lost, and the prelude the, uh, to Paradise Lost, I did an orchestration, but for a chamber music ensemble, it was string, uh, string quartet and piano. Him, he wrote for full orchestra, but me, I shrinked it. So when I met him second time, I, I was so nervous. I brought the score of the the, the chamber arrangement that right. I gave, and he, right. he looked at the whole thing with me, and he was super nice. And I have a picture with him. We're shaking hands, and so that's in my studio, you know. So were you, it's, ner uh, were you nervous? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. No kidding. Oh yeah, that's so cool. That's so cool. I got a couple comments, and I'll get you out of here. Um, the uh, this guy says the Hiroshima piece is just haunting. You know that one? I'm sorry. 
uh, Cosmic Paul Bear says the Hiroshima piece. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's called oh, Trinity yeah. for the Victims of Hiroshima. Um, uh, you know, buddy, you know, uh, you know, uh, you like The Shining, the movie? Oh, love it, love it. Well, you know the scene when the elevator opens and you have all the blood coming out? Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. That's a piece of music from Penderecki called The Dream of Jacob. So okay. you get the end. So that's the type of music. Okay, that, yeah, well, that's perfect. Then I love that stuff. Um, let's see, real quick. We got Tim says, "Awesome interview, Jeff. Thanks for the history lesson on Gorgots, Luke. You are an awesome guest. <laughs> Excellent story. Yes, he is. I Thank concur. You. Um, man, I could keep going on and on and on. I did want to say, I did want to say one weird thing that I kind of noticed here. Um, my buddy here, Psychic Vacuum, is." my good buddy Eric uh, Berg and we did a a couple weeks ago we did a, a deep dive you know Luke my channel is focused on two things we do deep dives and we do these deep interviews right and um, I got to do something that blew my fucking mind two weeks ago Friday okay and what's crazy is do you know this guy right here I know the name, but I'm not familiar with his work. Frank Marino? Okay. So Frank is a Montrealer, okay? Um, 70s guitar player. I would call Frank the original Shredder, him and Uli Roth from the Scorpions. And I got to talk to Frank for two hours, mind blown. Now, Frank doesn't do the, uh, the video thing. He's still old school. He's with the phone, and we're doing the old phoner interviews. You remember those, right? From uh, the early days of Gorguts, I got to talk to him, and um, again, it just blew my freaking mind that I got to talk to him. But I am talking to another legend for four <laughs> hours, you, and it's been, it's been, I can't, I don't know, man. I it's been such a cool experience. I can't thank you enough. I want to thank Kevin again for kind of helping me. When I, you know, the funny thing is, I gave you my information. And I never, we talked about exchanging, and I never thought, oh, shit, I didn't get any of Luke's information. <laughs> so. Uh, at the show, you mean? Yeah, I forgot. And yeah. so finally, I'm like, hey, I know Luke's probably pretty busy, and I know I know this isn't one of those things that you chase guys down to do these, right? But I knew, I felt very confident we were going to do this. But I got to Kevin, I'm like, look, I hate to do this to you, but I think you better give me Luke's email so I can... <laughs> I can give him a little bit of a push. I got to get, I'm on a different timetable than a lot of other people. So, um, but yeah, man, this has been just an, an absolutely fucking mind blowing experience. Thank you. Like thank this. you very much. I want to thank you for the music. I want to thank you. Most of all, I want to thank you for being a good human being. Cause that's, oh, a, <laughs> cause that's something that you can just tell, you know, you can just tell like, when you saw me and you recognized me, you were so genuine. It was so cool. And I was like, how the, f again, how the fuck does he, oh, wait a minute. He knows me from the internet. He knows me from the Kevin interview. And so, you know, great. You guys are such great. I talked to Colin. I'm going to try to get him on here too. Um, but it's just, you guys are all really good guys and you're doing really good work. I, want, I, I hate to push you, Luke. I'm on a time schedule here. You got to get this album out. I want to hear this thing, man. We will. We will. Uh, we'll write. We'll write the new record for sure. For sure. All right, man. Well, did is there, is there any plans at all to do a couple more shows or before that or no? Oh yes, there there will be. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're gonna stay in touch. I hope. Yeah, my of number. Yeah, my. Oh email. yeah, yeah, yeah. We need we need to share our music more. A lot, a lot of yeah, stuff. Those there. artists that you told me about and everything, we'll we'll keep in touch for sure. Yeah, I got to go through all my shit because I got so many things to to share with you. It's you're gonna be like, stop emailing. <laughs> I try to do it all in one, but it might take a little while. But do you know um do you know Biosphere, Yen's uh, uh Yen's shit? I forget his name. He goes by Biosphere. No. Okay, that's another one. You're gonna fucking love it, man. It's immersive. You know what it is? You and I both love immersive music where you, you sink down into it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So now I'm going to point out, I'm going to point out a couple uh, Penderecki symphonies and concertos that you, you're really going to love. 
I'm, yeah. I'm psyched. I'm psyched. Hey, headphones, headphones, music. Awesome. Listen, I love you, man. Thank you so much for doing this. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks you're for such, having me. You're such an awesome guy. And um, I want to thank everybody that came in here. We had 20 people in here watching tonight, which is super cool. And I guarantee this is going to be a really well-performing video. You'll, if you check it out, you know, and Luke, do me a favor, watch some of the video, the interviews I've done, like with Steve Von Till. I think that that's one. Yeah, that you I like his work. Uh, yeah, his solo stuff is really good, man. The, yeah. the stuff, the ambient stuff he's done. He he he's another one that I listened to an interview uh, that that he made, and he was pointing out uh, artists and albums, and I made a short list of things. Oh, I really got to listen to it. Exactly. He's very exactly. knowledgeable. Uh, you know. Yes. He, uh, yeah. One last one I just thought of. William Basinski? No. The Disintegration Loops? You don't know the Disintegration Loops? No. Ah, Luke. Such sights I have to show you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you so Thank much you. for this. I so much appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, I'll be in touch in the next day or so. Oh, we'll, we'll keep in touch for sure. Yeah, shit ton of stuff's coming your way, man. Thank you. Oh, I had one last question. Just thought of. When you were at the show... Um, you ran out of uh, considered dead shirts. Yes. Are you are you getting restocked on? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm getting restocked of those. Yeah. And and how do you get a hold of that stuff? Oh, but they, it. Uh, uh, I'm gonna put a link on the on the Facebook. But uh, I'll keep since since you told me now, I'm I'm gonna keep that in mind. Uh, yeah, we, we'll be in touch for the music. So don't and don't hesitate to come my way and ask me uh, for this. But I'm gonna have more for sure. For sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Check out the Facebook link. Check out the website link is in there. Has has the guys like Kev or have they tried to urge you to do an Instagram or no? No. No. no, no, no. You don't want to no. get into that. Yeah. No. All right, man. Well, listen. I love you, Luke. Thanks so much, <laughs> sir. I'm Thank gonna you. Let you go. Okay. Take Stay care. around. Stay around for one minute while I end the broadcast. Okay. Thanks to everybody. Okay. We'll catch you guys later.